वी आर गोइंग लाइव इन फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ सो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू दिकॉन बेसिक स्पाइन कोर्स दिस इज गोन बी हैंड्स ऑन कैडावर कोर्स विच विल बी कंडक्टेड इन सेट जी एस मेडिकल कॉलेज एंड के एम हॉस्पिटल मुंबई दिस कोर्स विल कवर द बेसिक आस्पेक्ट ऑफ ऑल स्पाइन सर्जरी uh so as we all know there are two uh, versions of it first we are going to do a live session uh, the records basically these are the uh, didactic surgical technique focused uh, talks which are being given by all the expert panel all across the india so in which they describe the detailed technique how would they go with a particular surgical technique what are the technical nuances what are the complications that one can expect and i would like to encourage a lot of uh, delegates to ask the questions also we're going to have a discussion at the end of each of these talks once uh, we uh, finish these talks then uh, we are going to have a second session which will be actual hands on cadaveric uh, workshop which will be uh, conducted in the department of anatomy uh, at km hospital uh, so that day we won't be having lecture so we we expect all of the delegates to see these talks because this is going to be recorded by the asicon team as Well as our team, Dr. Bhushan Hadole, who is assistant professor, uh, working at KM Hospital, uh, he is going to be coordinator. So you can be in a contact with him if there is any talk which you are missing. Then he can always share that talk to you. All these talks which are recorded are going to be shared with you. Uh, the third thing is that uh, since there are not not going to be a, a didactic lectures on the twenty uh, first, the cadaver day, I would like you all to see go through these talks before you come to the cadaver day, so it becomes much easy. it's not that we going to directly go and start cadaver again i'm going to ask the expert faculty to show you technique on the cadavers and then we going to have ample time uh, for you to practice the same thing on the cadaver uh, uh, we have a good amount of cadavers and it's a state of art uh, cadaveric lab at km as well uh, so today the program outline will be that will be covering the basic aspects so there'll be uh, uh, first we'll be dealing with the how to pass pedicle and sacral screw then we'll also be discussing about how to do the uh, the inter uh, the trans pedicular approach or a trans facetal approach how to pass a thoracic screw then we're going to be also discussing about the discectomy and that then we'll also have a cervical spine session so this is going to be a uh, outline of the program at the end of each talk i have kept up time for a discussion where we're going to elicit the different points which could be or which could not have been covered in the talk and in the meantime you can also ask a uh, live questions to all of us so that we can also try to answer those questions as many as possible uh, so uh, this is going to be talk uh, if if there are any uh, concerns or if there are any uh, other issue which you would like to tell us uh, please let us know even on a comment box dr bhushan is going to be addressing all uh, with the prompt reply uh this uh, the uh, the uh, faculty uh, i would uh, encourage them to stay uh, as long as possible and to give more their inputs uh, so this is going to be open uh, i think most of the people uh, are here uh, are quite learned so we'll have a good uh, discussion uh, so don't uh, hesitate from asking the questions so uh, dr bhushan can you uh, carry on and can you introduce also the outline other things yes sir uh, so good uh... good morning and thank you for the opportunity sir so i'll start with the basic outline for today so today we'll be first starting with the lumbar spine uh, there would be a starting lecture by dr amit sharma sir who will be teaching us the technique of lumbar pedicle screw insertion then we'll move to sacral screw insertion by dr tushar sir uh, then we'll move to the other session of lumbar spine we'll le- learn how to do a micro discectomy by dr chahal sir then a lumbar interbody fusion after this uh, we'll be having dr the spine session and then followed by cervical spine session so today the first lecture uh, is by dr uh, amit sharma sir he is a consultant at cp and jaslo uh, hospital so so should i load uh, sir stop yes bhushan please go ahead i for the talk uh, yeah yes yes sir i'll just share yeah we'll start with dr amish sharma uh, he is the uh, alumni of km and he is currently consultant uh, spine surgeon at saif hospital and all know the lumbar pedicle screw is going to be work horse uh, uh, so this talk talk is very important for all of us to understand uh, how to pass a pedicle screw and at the end of uh, this particular talk we're going to have a discussion on the lumbar pedicle screw uh, we, 
we'll discuss in detail what are the various techniques and also uh, what are the diameters he prefers and he is there uh, uh, live also so we can ask him questions as well so bushan uh, are you ready if you can can you please stop now yes sir i'll just start the stop yeah yes. so you need to uh, play the sound bushan Now uh, you need to stop and uh, the sound is not playing motion. We have enough time. We have already started before, so don't worry. So. Uh, Take the sound because this talk's gonna be. Uh, you need to use, I think, the computer's uh, speaker. Uh, Tushar, if you want, I can present live. You know, or uh, that maybe. That I have be, the that yeah, would be uh, very nice if you can directly uh, present live. So you can uh, you can share the screen. screen. But uh, sure. Bhushan, you have to say something. Uh, you have a uh, you have the screen share option, right, Doctor Amit? Sir, uh, make sir uh, available for screen share. Yeah. Get him the availability yes. and also see the what is the logistic motion in the meantime. Why the talk is not? Yes, sir. Just uh, speak to the uh, Ortho TV guys. Yes, um, I hope. I... Yeah, your screen is visible, Doctor Amit. Okay. And your voice is audible. Yes, good. So, pedicle screws are the main armamentarium of uh, uh, lumbar fixation. Uh, and they have become, you know, like the, the, the backbone of the back surgery. So, they have become increasingly common. And there are various techniques described, like basically the entry points, which we need to know how to pass the pedicle screw. Uh, so, the before the pedicle screw came in the picture, the spinal fixation was not done with the pedicle screw. The, however, the spinal fixation dates back to 1943s when the simple bone screws were used for spinal fixation. It was until uh, late 1980s when the Cottrell and Dobose started uh, using the pedicle screw and uh, the dorsal plates uh, for uh, lumbar uh, fixation. Our own Dr. Vijay Lahir, you know, in India, when West was uh, restricted because of the medical legal issues and uh, they were not able to experiment, uh, Dr. Lahiri, which was our teacher in KM, were uh, doing a lot of cadaveric dissection and uh, uh, with the help of even 4.5 mm uh, DCPs, he was, uh, you know, like uh, fixing the spine. And when these big people come, came to India and they were kind of surprised to see his work. So... It was mid 80s to late 80s when the actual, the kind of system we are using, they started being used in the preliminary fashion. So the advantage of uh, pedicle screw is that they will traverse all the three columns of vertebrae. So uh, the fixation will be strongest. Now the pedicle screw, pedic the pedicle is the strongest part of the vertebral body, uh, the entire vertebra. So any screw going through that is the strongest point of fixation in a vertebra so the hole will be best and it will be able to keep the spine in position till the time fusion occurs um if you are doing a suppose you are passing subliminal wire but at the same time you have to decompression now if you have to do laminectomy for the decompression then you won't be able to pass the subliminal wire so in, so in these kind of situation you know pedicle screw uh, are uh, real life saver um so to pass any screw in any part of the body we need you know, like the following things uh, uh, to be aware. We need an entry point. We need the direction, especially in terms of the pedicle screw. We need to know what will be the medial lateral direction, what will be the supra-inferior direction. 
and uh, we need to know the diameter and we need to know the length so entry point for lumbar spine is um, you know like pedicle is a cylinder a white cylinder so there are multiple entry points have been described but you choose any of the entry point and ultimately you will end up in that big cantilever cylinder of the pedicle so the three main entry points which have been described in the literature are a point just lateral to the facet joint at the midpoint of the width of the transverse process as shown in this picture however the same point is like just in the vicinity which is uh, the second point which is like you know passing the uh, pedicles go through the mammillary body so mammillary body is small projection at the base of the transverse process now again it's in the vicinity and if you take this entry point then you have to go slightly up because mammillary body is slightly on the inferior side of the transverse process and the third point which has been described in the literature is that the confluence of the lateral border of the pars the transverse process and the facet joint so essentially they all kind of fall into the same place um in terms of the direction like uh, in our clinical experience we see that uh, t4 is most of the time horizontal if you go above up to t12 the direction is slightly uh, uh, cranially directed so about you know like l2 will be directed about by 5 to 7 degree l3 maybe 2 3 degree and l1 about sometime 10 to 15 degrees cranially directed similarly you go below l4 l5 is about 10 to 15 degree directed uh, downward but s1 i always take an intraoperative shoot to determine which direction the s1 screw should go because the slope varies from patient to patient so even in a free hand technique case for the s1 i'll be always taking one shoot after putting my starter to understand whether my starter is going in the right direction or not and accordingly adjust my um, uh, lanky props uh, direction similarly medial lateral direction will be uh, uh, at uh, at thoracic lumbar junction the medial lateral direction is more or less neutral but as you go above or below in thoracic spine somebody else will be talking but as you go below from l1 down to the s1 the medial direction will keep on increasing now for medial direction there is no way to check it intraoperatively like we don't have the axial cuts intraoperatively uh, so it's more by experience and by feel and then after passing every instrument we check with the sound that uh, uh, we are in within the confines of the bone so lanky probe is one of the main thing uh, which we are using nowadays uh, the lanky probe is you know like a, it's like also called gear shift because the front part is curved so initially when you pass the lanky probe so you will pass it directed laterally so in case there is an inadvertent uh, breach you will not be entering the canal it will be going laterally only so once you have um, uh, passed the lanky probe laterally and you have gone through the length of the pedicle then you remove it and you pass it medially and then you go further in, into the vertebral body on top of this if you prefer you can tap and um, then pass your pedicle screw i there is a lot of uh, you know like people will debate whether we should tap in terms of, in cases of um, osteoporotic bone or not but i usually like to tap because many times the pedicle width is not sufficient and uh, i would like to know uh, whether um, after tapping the pedicle do i have uh, that breach of the pedicle you know like i don't want to have that breach happening after uh, passing the pedicle screw many times that inferior medial margin of the pedicle will kind of you know disrupt it will just open up so to prevent that and to gradually dilate the pedicle i usually uh, uh, tap uh, and it's always 1 mm less than the final diameter of the screw now looking at the pedicle diameter as you go below the thoracic lumbar junction the diameter will keep on increasing so at thoracic like in l1 and l2 we are able to accommodate most of the time 6.5 mm screws in an adult population s1 many times we put 7.5 mm screw also because uh, that is the you know like uh, it's a cancellous uh, box of the bone so in that box we need a good hold and uh, there we would prefer to have a bicortical purchase so diameter most of the time is 6.5 mm unless it's a it's a pediatric age group patient or uh, you know like there is some bony anomaly now in terms of the length majority of the time around l1 l2 we are able to pass 40 to 40 mm uh, length of the screw in the sacrum what i have seen that uh, most of the time my screws are 5 mm less in length compared to the l4 screw 
and same is true for the L5 screw also. Like uh, if I'm passing a 45 mm screw in the L4, then I'm little, you know, like uh, cautious that my L5 screw should not be. So I'll be passing that uh, my lanky probe to 45 just to check whether bone is still there. But again, uh, L5 also what I've seen that, you know, like many times is five millimeter less than the L4 screw. So my steps. So after the exposure, now ex before exposure, we also check the level with the needle, you know, like before we make the incision to, so that our uh, incision is at the correct level. But after the exposure, um, I use this Ellis forceps to hold the base of the transfer process. And this Ellis forceps is always perpendicular to the floor. So with uh, against this Ellis forceps, I'll compare all the pedicles, like in which direction they are going in terms of the supra inferior angulation. So here you can see that this particular uh, bone which I'm holding is L5. So it's about little, you know, like five degree, uh, five degree downward. So when I'm passing the screw, I don't have to take um, multiple CM shoots. So this is second shoot after the first initial needle shoot to uh, lo uh, localize my skin incision. When it is done, then all the screws will be in. But for the second screw, again, I'll be taking a shoot like this, you know, because the sexual angulation can vary from patient to patient. So it's a clinical picture, making the entry point at the base of the uh, transfer process, just lateral to the facet joint, putting the starter, putting our uh, lanky probe, feeling it that I'm within the confines of the pedicle, then uh, passing the tap, and then ultimately passing the screw. So as I said, for the sacrum, uh, cycle screw, I'll be checking the angle. So now here we can see that I'm going little cranially. So I like to maybe direct it when I'm passing my lanky probe remove, after removing the starter, maybe about two, three degree downward compared to this angulation, which we are seeing. So you can see that when I'm passing the cycle screw, how far down I have to direct my hand. So that's one side and same, same, same technique we'll use on the opposite side. So, uh, and we'll take a confirmatory shoot. Now, we always take a confirmatory shoot at the end of passing all the screws because if there is any issue, you need to rectify it now rather than bringing the patient back from the ward again to, um, you know, like change some screw. And APX is also recommended to take at the end of it. Now in the deformity cases, the direction will be different because of the rotation of the vertebrae and the anatomy also will be distorted. So you have to be careful. And in the kyphosis cases, your super inferior direction will be change significantly. So you need to be careful about that as well. So like we can see in this uh, case, the normal vertebra on the left side is showing good pedicle, but the abnormal vertebra on the right side is having a very distorted pedicle on the uh, on one side. So you may or may not be able to pass a pedicle screw there, or you might have to use an in out in technique. So you, you have to just be cognizant of these kind of issues. Uh, Sometimes like in this case, uh, we mark the entry point before passing the pedicle screw. And uh, so that we are not violating whatever pedicle is available to us uh, and uh, kind of, you know, get the maximum hold. And this entry point can be made with the bar also. So you, with the bar, you make all the entry point in one go. And after that, you pass the pedicle screw. Now, in instrumentation is not the spine surgery. That's one part of it. Don't forget the fusion because otherwise your instrument will either get loose or it will break if you have not achieved the fusion because the fusion will give you the long-term success. And we need to avoid these kind of mishap where the particle screws are going in any direction and damaging the vital tissues around it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit, uh, for a detailed uh, talk on the lumbar pedicle screw. And uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, start with my sacral screw and then uh, thereafter we'll keep a time of discussion where we would like to discuss the lumbar and sacral screw together. So I want to stay back and we'll uh, have a discussion uh, after my talk. In the meantime, Bhushan, if there are any uh, presentations or any questions, please uh, 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 note them down so that we can ask Dr. Amit uh, as well as we can discuss them uh, threadbare. Sure. So is my slide visible? Yes, sir. it's visible. Sir. We can see the slide. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Amit has uh, uh, briefly covered regarding the, uh, uh, the how the technical nuances are there for passing a, a lumbar screw as well as S1. But uh, again, as we all know, the sacral screw are the basic foundations 
especially when you are constructing a very large construct. If your sackle screw are not strong enough, the whole construct is going to be rip off from the inferior side. So it's very important to have a very strong hold uh, on the inferior portion of the uh, hold, uh, the spinal construct so that uh, you can uh, do. And this becomes very important when you have a large column uh, osteotomies, which are you are doing in a lumbosacral area or especially when you have a very high lumbosacral fractional curve. So what are the common indications for passing this screw? So whenever we have a long spinal fusions, which involve the sacrum, as we discussed, a lot of neuromuscular cases now because they have a difficulty in a wheelchair balance where we have to get a strong pelvic construct. The degenerative spinal deformity, which are increasing nowadays, and we need a, a, a sacro, uh, sacral foundations. Spondylolisthesis, which are high grade. Suppose you blow out your sacral screw and you don't have the screw. So what are the options that are there? And what are the bailout? options we want to discuss and the trauma of course the lumbosacral fracture region uh, in a high velocity trauma can get fracture and your sacral pedicle is fractured then how to go about this so uh, biomechanical considerations are very important for passing any instrument and as we all know and i want you to understand is there is something called as a pivot point which is situated at the posterior central part of the l5 s1 disc what is the importance of this for us as a spine surgeon is the importance is that whenever our implant is passing beyond this point, there is a considerable increase in the strength of your construct. For example, this S1 screw, if you can see, it's just passing beyond it. But uh, uh, the, the, the screw which are passing like this with the convergence quite uh, significantly have a more uh, a pull out strength or for example the elax screw so uh, basically whenever you cross across this particular point you get a more strength there are zones which are described and as the the uh, these are basically zones one two three the it's more of a theoretical but point is that as you go more on a more lateral side you get a more strength uh, especially in a iliac region and sacroiliac joint so zone one is nothing but the sacral body uh, which is what we pass in the s1 screw uh, and it also consists of the cephalite part of the sacral ala. So cephalite part of the sacral ala, it doesn't have a significant hold. So it is considered as zone one. The zone two is when you have a hold in the uh, inferior part of the sacral ala, S2 foramen, S2 body, that is called zone two. And both iliac wings are called as a zone three. So when you have a hold in those iliac wings, you have a better hold. So S2 ala iliac screw has a hold in all the segments. So it is more stronger. And always remember when you have a triangulation of the screws, when there is a significant triangulation, your pullout strength increases significantly. If you have parallel screw, they can be easily ripped off. But if you have a triangulation, that increases the strength of your construct significantly. So where are, what are the options that we have for a foundation? So we have S1 pedicular screw, we have a sacral screw, we have we had a Galveston rod, which are nowadays not used because they're technical demanding and they get loosened up because there's no strong purchase. The iliac screw and there is something called the trans iliac bar so this image which i was showing is the galveston which was used initially and there is something called the trasilial bar where the the bar goes through the iliac wings and across the s1 and there is s2 llx screw so we're going to see them one by one the galveston and trasilial bar is not so commonly preferred so uh, the positioning and tips for the exposure. So again, uh, you all know there's a significant importance being given to the sagittal balance of the spine. And it's very important to have a good PILL uh, uh, mismatch should not be there. So the, your pelvic incidence should match to the lumbar lordosis. So it's important to have a good lumbar lordosis, especially when you are fusing in this area. And how do we get a good lumbar lordosis to give a good positioning of the patient? There should be good padding of the chest and the iliac crest. The iliac crest should be horizontal to floor because you're going to reference your points based upon your iliac crest it's very important to a draping which should go lateral to the psis because suppose you have a uh, you have to have a bailout option in the form of iliac screw so it's important to uh, drape uh, because a lot of people keep only midline draping and it becomes very difficult then you have to open the drape to pass the psis screw because psis screw will require a separate incision in the facial sheet it's important to do a standard midline approach as we all do uh, the uh, the amount of exposure i see a lot of beginners exposing till the tip uh, uh, the the tip of the sacrum it's not required s2 lx screw is one of the downmost screw and the exposure that you require is up to only the s2 foramen ca cephalid margin so don't unnecessarily expose quite downward because that area does is directly underneath the bone and there is a very high chance of skin necrosis so it's important not to do overzealous exposure also at the same time not to do under exposure so this is the if this is the uh, the s2 foramen you should go just two or three centimeter below it and we're going to see that that iliac screw uh, again we're going to see it requires a separate incision and it is offset of the main foundation so it becomes uh, slightly cumbersome and that's the drawback 
So uh, starting with the S1 screw, this is going to be workhorse for you all whenever you are doing an alpha S1 fusion. And as we all know, there's a unicortical, bicortical and tricortical purchase. So unicortical means you are getting only purchase in the dorsal cortex. You are not penetrating your screw through the anterior cortex. That's a unicortical and it has a least strength. And we don't recommend that. Second is a bicortical screw uh, where you have a purchase in a dorsal uh, cortex and the anterior cortex. That's a bicortical screw. And there's a, something which is preferred, desired, ideal is the tricortical screw where you take a purchase in the dorsal, anterior and superior part of the end plate. What does that do? That increases your strength uh, by uh, almost uh, uh, twice, twice the bicortical screw. So the tricortical screw has a strength of uh, almost uh, twice the bicortical screw. Uh, we all know the entry is just at the base of S1 uh, superior facet. Again, there's a uh, the problem what happens in this particular area is because you're going to have an iliac wing next to the sacrum in this area. So it becomes very difficult uh, to retract. A lot of people try to retract, but they, they, uh, one has to understand that you are retracting essentially the iliac wings and not the muscle. So you're not going to get a wide exposure in this area. It's more of a tactile feel and a proper base of the S1 should be exposed. And then you should guide uh, with your lanky. As Dr. Amish Sharma rightly said, there's a lot of variation, your positioning and everything. So it's important to see a fluoroscopy, what is your trajectory before taking the final S1 screw insertion. So as you all understood, the, the, the entry point is just at the base of superior articular process. Now, second most important point is that you want to converge as much as possible. If you not converge, if you get a straight on, you're going to go in a sacral promontory or the outer part. It's not only dangerous, but you get a less working length. Your pullout strength also decreases. So try to converge. And here it's the importance of lengky. So I would request all of the delegates to have their own lengky uh, with themselves, which becomes very easy as you get familiar with your particular lengky. You can do a better uh, uh, cannulation. So you want the, the inner curve part of the lengky to go as middle as possible. And you should use that curve to your advantage to try to reach the midpoint. You also have to give the cephalate a 10 degree trajectory to get a good okay. and it's very important that you should take a fluoroscopy health. The usual length is 30, 35 to 40. In females, if it's a, lot, a smaller bone, you get to get to a 30. Another important point is sacral pedicle is very capacious and I don't want you all to use 5.5 or 4.5 screw in that area. You should use 6.5 screw. And the other problem with the 6.5 is the most of the implant distributors have a length which is starting from 30. So you have to have at least 30 millimeter length. And the way you are going to get a length is to get a more middle trajectory. So it's very important that you should try to uh, middleize as much as possible, not only to get a, uh, the good uh, working length, but also get a good purchase and good triangulation. So the sacral LR screw uh, 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 are the other trajectory. So after covering this, uh, the tricortical S1, uh, uh, that is pedicle screw, uh, we're going to discuss something called the LR screw. So the pedicle screw are having hold in the pedicle, whereas this LR screw is having hold in the LR. So the first screw which we discuss is the pedicle screw, which is taking the uh, purchase in the pedicle, and this is the LR screw. This LR screw is essentially, it should not be used in isolation because this is a unicortical screw. You are not taking purchase in the, uh, the anterior cortex. So it, it cannot be used in isolation. It has to be used as a supplemental to the S1 screw to increase your strength. And what is LR screw? Because it is taking in a purchase in the sacral LR, uh, we are calling it as a LR screw. The entry point is slightly inferior. So you can connect these two screws together and you can increase the strength of your foundation. Why we don't take an anterior cortex purchase? You all know there are now roots, uh, the interiliac vessels, lumbosacral tr trunk, uh, which is going across. And if you project your screw beyond, it can be extremely painful and dangerous uh, for the patient. So it's a supplemental fixation. As you discuss, it's just the entry point is cephalite to the S1 foramen between the S1 facet and the S1 foramen. Uh, it's it's uh, you have to angulate almost 30 degree uh, to the outward and a quadrant uh, almost to the 25 degree. The length what you get is uh, uh, around 30 to 35 uh, millimeter in the length. Now coming to the iliac screw. So this is the screw which we used very commonly in the previous day. Again, as I told you, you need to take a separate incision to pass this particular screw because they don't come in the uh, in your construct. They have they are slightly uh, off the uh, line of your construct, so they can be fully or partially threaded. You can pass more than two screw because PSIS is a larger area. Uh, there are special connectors uh, which you need to connect with this particular screw because it's offset. So you have to use an offset to connect, or you have to bend your rod in a such a way that it will engage the uh, the iliac screw, which becomes slightly cumbersome. The other problem is that it interferes with your grafting because you're going to take a graft from that area. 
the advantage is that if you already had a graph, then you can still pass this particular screw. So there's no problem with that. But uh, it interferes because you pass, the, you lose a majority of area from where you're going to take a graph out. Entry point is just slightly entry to the PSIS area. Uh, you have to have, there are two trajectories. One is uh, going towards the acetabulum, which is not so much commonly preferred. The other one is going towards the AIS. And you can use a fluoroscopy for this kind of approaches. And I'm going to show you what kind of shoot you should take. The lateral angulation is up to 25 degree because you need to go to the lateral directed. And also there's a caudal angulation which we need to give towards the AIS. The screw length is around like 70 to 80 millimeter. And what is the diameter which we prefer is 7.5 to 80 millimeter diameter should be preferred for passing these screws. Now the main workhorse that is uh, which was described by Dr. Kebesh in our 2010 was the uh, and again modified by sponsor and other groups that was the s2lr elax screw why it is called s2lr elax screw because it takes its origin uh, from the s2 area uh, it's called uh, lr elax screw because it goes through the sacral lr part because it crosses to the lr part then it crosses the si joint and then it goes into the ilium that's why that name is s2lr elax screw what are the advantage because this particular screw comes in your construct uh, 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 line you don't have to take a separate incision and, and use those uh, kind of a bulky cross connectors in this area. The whole foundation comes in a line. So, and it gives a very good robust mechanical strength. Uh, so that's the advantage. It doesn't interfere with your bone grafting technique. You can use a very longer screw. Uh, you can use also larger diameter screw. Uh, to use a diameter screw, uh, more diameter, the maximum diameter of the elect wing is in the area just above the greater sciatic notch, almost two to three center. So try to be in this area rather than in a higher area, then you may not be able to use like 8 mm or 7.5 mm screw in this area. So if you want to pass a larger diameter screw, stay closer to the greater sciatic notch, but at the same time, take care that you are at least two center above it, uh, not to injure the greater sciatic notch. You should use fluoroscopy, uh, uh, especially the beginning part so that you are more accurate because this uh, screw uh, do have a tendency to go in a greater sciatic notch or to have a lateral cortical perforation and how to use a fluoroscopy what view i'm going to discuss in the next slide and once you master it you can place this screw percutaneously as well so uh, again the entry point lies between the s1 and s2 foramen the mid part the lateral angulation is to be given this is the intraoperative image you can see that the uh, it becomes very easy for to pass this screw from uh, to the ipsilateral side from the contralateral side suppose you want to pass on the right side it becomes easy to pass this screw from the left side you can see uh, that there is a lateral angulation which is given also the uh, lateral angulation is almost 40 degree because we need to go uh, laterally towards the iliac wing also we need to give a caudal angulation so that we can go towards the ais and how do we do the how do we decide is that you just palpate the greater Trochanter. Now you can see the surgeon's both hand. He's palpating the GT at the same time and he's passing the screw. I want a wide draping like this. Suppose you don't get it, you then you may have to go on a PSI. So you may have to take a lateral incision. So you should have a wide draping like this to pass this screw. Second, and you use the GT as a landmark. The path of screw should, as I described, should be between the two center of the uh, greater sciatic notch. You take a teardrop view. Uh, the screw length is usually 80 to 100 mm and you can pass a very larger diameter screws. And this is the image which uh, where it shows that the, there's a uh, between the S1 and S2 foramen, how can you go about, uh, this is the S2 foramen and this is the S1, sorry, this is the S1 foramen and this is the S2, S2 foramen. So you pass between the mid point of the S1 and S2 foramen so that you get a good uh, uh, trajectory towards the sac sacroiliac screw. Now, the uh, what view should you use as an initial part you need to see the cm view like this so you what you can see is that the 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 corridor which is coming from psis to ais so how do you get it this is the patient this is the cephalid end this is the caudal end you give a lateral angulation we want a lateral angulation so that we can see we can superimpose the psis over a ais so that needs a lateral angulation also we need a cranial angulation because as you can see in this image uh, we we need to go and see from the uh, the angulation should be cranial. So both angulations are given. This is the interoperative image, how the fluoroscopy should be there. And this is what you should see and your uh, S2LX screw should pass in between these two tricortical window. So this is how your wire should go in this tricortical window. And this is the greater sciatic notch, which you should avoid. There are concerns with the s 2 lr joint because it's a recently innovated screw. We don't know what are the long-term outcome because it traverses and violates the sacroiliac joint. So SR joint violation is a common concern. 
the lateral cortical perforation is very common at the beginning of the practice so one should use a fluoroscopy to be more accurate with this particular screws now regarding the complication as you all know these are this area is uh, the, the bone lies under the sacrum lies uh, in a subcutaneous manner like a tibia and if you have very much implant prominence you have a chance of getting a skin dehiscence uh, and there's a very high chance of infection. So this is something which is very commonly seen, especially in a neuromuscular uh, scoliosis where the kids are very skinny. And if you use a large profile screw, if your tulip is larger, then you are bound to get either implant prominence or the wound dehiscence. So one has to be very careful with the amount of exposure one is doing, one amount of retraction one is doing, and one has to be gentle with this particular aspect. You should use a fluoroscopy, especially in an unusual anatomy, you have a sacralization, you have your variability in a syndromic cases. And when you are passing this estuolar screw, use a woodpecker technique. So what is the technique which is described? You use a 2.5 mm drill to go through the sacral part and come up to the SI joint, and then use a larger 3.2 drill bit. Why? Because not only the drill bit will prevent the inadvertent penetration of the cortex, but what it would do is that there's a very high chance if you use a thinner drill bit that it will break inside. So don't use a 2.5 mm drill bit in the iliac wing when you're going so long up to 8 mm, eight centimeter in the iliac wing. There's a very high chance of breakage while you're coming out. So it's important to use a larger uh, the drill bit and use a guide wire so that increases the, the accuracy of your uh, uh, the SLX screw uh, entry. So uh, a wound infection complication, as we can see, is very common. And if you don't be thorough with a lumbar fusion technique or if you don't use the interbody technique, uh, you can get a non implant failure. So I always say when you're doing alpha S1 construct, especially in the long area, you try to do an interbody fusion. That not only increases the chance of fusion, but also protects the mechanically the strength of your construct. If you just pass an isolated S1 screw and expect that your foundation is going to work, if your patient is going to active and he's going to bend forward, then he's going to rip off the screw in a time, uh, uh, in a uh, manner. So it's it's very important to understand the biomechanics in this area when anyone is instrumenting in this area. And these are the common complications uh, particular to this area. Few example, this is a 15 year old male, again, a syndromic curve, very large curve. You can't uh, stop at the S1 screw and expect that your whole foundation will be constructed. So you need to have a good S1 LR, S2 LR relax screw in this area, which will give you a good strong foundation on, on top of which you can construct your foundation. So these are the inlet view where you can see it's going through the uh, ala and into the ilium. It should be within two center of the sciatic notch to get a good uh, larger diameter. Again, lumbosacral cox at KEM, we get all kinds of cox. Uh, for example, this lady with a vertical sacrum, a significant destruction. You can see in the MRI, the L2 is directly sitting on S1 and S1 is also involved. Large gluteal abscess, we give AKT and then you have to do a lumbopelvic reconstruction. It becomes very important to have a very strong anchorage in the sacral area. And what we have done is we have passed the sacral S2 LLX screw on both sides. We have passed the S1 uh, pedicle screw. We have used the expandable cage. We have done a thorough grafting from the posterior side and we have reconstructed this case. And if you do that, your uh, outcome is going to be important. We publish this case because it's uh, one of the longest uh, uh, lumbopelvic reconstruction uh, ever reported in the literature. This got accepted in British Medical Journal. At the end of follow up, you do get a, a, a good bone formation. So, AKT along with your sound surgical principles can give you good, uh, good and uh, graceful results. Thank you for your patient listening. Now, uh, I, I think uh, it's uh, I would stop the share and uh, uh, if there are any uh, questions uh, for me and uh, uh, Dr. Amit Sharma, uh, we are welcome, Bhushan. Uh, are there any questions uh, there? I'll start with the first question to Dr. Amit uh, uh, regarding the tap. He said uh, he likes to use the tap. So I would like to know, uh, uh, does he use the tap often in this uh, cases all the time? Uh, what is his view with respect to tap? So Tushar, yes, I do use the tap uh, all the time. And the reason is, you know, like as I mentioned, um, many times what happened that, uh, that uh, the hole which we make with the lanky probe is not circular enough, you know. In fact, we had to kind of, you know, rotate it 30, 40 degree on each side to make enough width of hole to even to pass the sound. Otherwise, that sound also won't go. So at the end of my uh, initial preparation, I would want my hole to be straight so my screw can go, you know, like in in the direction it need to be. So, so passing the tap will ensure that my hole for the screw is straight, number one. Number two, many times as I told you, I've seen that uh, if I am inserting screw directly, the pedicle will expand suddenly and then it, it might, you know, the cortex, uh, cortex might uh, break. 
and if especially if it happens on the med inferior medial side then it can irritate the nerve root so to prevent that from happening i would even if the uh, pedicle needs to expand it need to expand gradually so for that reason i would like to kind of you know like tap it bit uh, and it's always 1 mm less so even in the uh, cancellous bone i do not think that uh, by passing the tap we are kind of you know um uh, compromising on the hold of the screw so yes yes yeah, so tap i think it's a very important point which you are highlighting regarding the tap i think one can have a tactile feel uh, of the uh, the pedicle i think vishal has also joined i would like to also ask uh, dr vishal kundani who is the main front runner for this all workshop With tremendous hard work uh, hats off to you vishal so what is uh, your view regarding uh, tapping vishal do you always tap the lumbar pedicle screw so yes generally uh, for a sclerotic pedicle particularly in young individuals i would always tap but for osteoporotic patients i generally use a curette which is like a conical instrument so uh, in 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 osteoporotic patients or in elderly patients uh, generally i don't feel a need to tap particularly now with the most advanced kind of instrumentation systems where there are self tapping screws so osteoporotic bones double thread screws uh, self tapping screws i would not tap but young patients less than 40 45 individuals sclerotic bones hard bones and i am using a round thread kind of tip then i would surely want to tap it nowadays we are seeing lot of osteoporotic females fatty females coming to us with a listhesis degenerative so uh, how uh, do you think the dual thread screw make a difference and uh, and, and do you commonly use a, a lumbar uh, especially in this kind of patient profile dual thread screw or do you go for a larger diameter screw like a 7.5 lumbar what is your view so very important and very interesting question so you know in this current growing age of osteoporotic patients with more and more patients of lumbar spine coming up after 50 55 60 where osteoporosis is prevalent i do everything that is available at the inventory i would surely want to use a 7.5 mm screw if possible if i can use it the diameter of the pedicle is really helpful if the patient have we, we have available dual threads i always always use a dual thread if it is possible to use because the cost is the only thing that prevents me whether they are useful or not i think if i analyze my own data of last 5 year versus the first 5 years i don't see a significant difference in terms of mechanical loosening of the screws ultimately it is the fight about the biology rather than the metallurgy but if you have a good metallurgy also available with dual thread large diameter screws if you can get it through it's a fairly a good way to you know increase the chances of biology winning the race and if the fusion doesn't happen no matter what kind of screw you use it is surely bound to get fail up so fusion is the most important aspect where you should pay more attention rather than just depending on screws itself and of course good screws larger screws double thread screws tapped screws is a addition to the biological environment for fusion that you create okay very wise word from the veteran surgeon so uh, I, i have another question for dr amit is the uh, the uh, if you uh, suppose blow out your pedicle lumbar pedicle what are your uh, uh, strategies dr amit uh, how do you salvage a lumbar pedicle screw which has uh, perforated so um, it depends on where the perforation is if it is anterior then maybe my screw length is more i would like to go like 5 mm length uh, less number one if it is inferior medial like the thing which i don't want um, so then i like to kind of you know like maybe sometimes change my entry point and redirect them in as i told that like most of the time we pass the lumbar screw in the free hand technique but if this is will be one scenario where i would like to be doubly sure and then next entry point because i don't want to violate it too much so next entry point will be under the cm guidance to check for the uh, direction of the screw um and then you know like last resort is that going to the next level so uh, means but that will be like adding another level to the fusion and losing one more motion segment so we would like to avoid that but um, it's about you know like um, understanding where the violation is happening and trying to go a very important point you are saying the understanding where the violation is happening and you don't want to violate the inferior part what dr amit is highlighting is the inferior pedicel bridge because if you have inferior pedicel bridge you are threaded portion irritating the nerve root the patient is going to be miserable and they and we also get a concern so it's very important and we what we been train is that when in doubt take it out use the fluoroscopy you can use under size screw as dr amit has highlighted i mean suppose if you are not able to then you can go on a next level yes i see lot of raise hands so one by one uh, dr vishal he he gets a prerogative now <laughs> so basically you know perforation of screw is very possible even after now 15 years of practice sometimes medial perforation or even a superior inferior perforation can still happen you know so it, it is definitely possible that perforation still do happen one thing to all delegates i would recommend is to please go and read 
when during the cadaveri workshop please try and attempt by cortical screws they are different than the usual convergent screws that we use in the body whereas in a medial perforation you can actually use a shorter length by cortical screw it has actually a better purchase less chances of perforation and less chances of uh, you know nerve injury however a shorter screw is used so try and use and read can come about these by cortical screws because they come very handy when you have a major medial perforation so that those are very very nice very strong hold by cortical screws that are in lumbar spine which very helpful okay thank you vishal dr umang you have a question uh good morning sir uh, sir two questions uh one to dr sharma uh, sir in uh, high grade spondylolisthesis uh, lytic cases you we i have usually seen that the anatomy is very distorted like uh, de defining your uh, landmarks in those cases is difficult so like what are your tips to pass screws in those uh, levels and uh, continuing to that question uh, to dr tushar sir uh, when do you uh, like uh, we've got l5 s1 uh, listhesis high grade when do you decide to put a s2 ai uh, or when do you just decide to go single level or you extend to l4 also like what is your uh, take on that okay and dr amit would you like to answer your first uh, the first yes part? so in lytic listhesis uh, the lytic listhesis uh, you know like in my take is uh, that when whenever the lytic listhesis happens the part structure is very close to the pedicle so the usual pedicle screw when we pass will compared to in a normal bone in a case of lytic listhesis this screw is going to have a less hold because the fracture is just around so uh, in these cases my threshold to go to the next level will be very very low because of two reasons number one suppose you have a l5 part fracture and l5 is moving too much so there kind there are two kind of scenario in one scenario l4 5 disc will be normal and the second kind of scenario where l4 5 disc is also involved so if the l4 5 disc is also involved then in these kind of situation especially with the high grade listhesis i would like to go to the l4 so i can reduce l5 on that l4 s1 bridge uh, of the uh, uh, rod secondly because um L4-5 disc is all already involved, then maybe uh, just passing, uh, uh, like just fusing the L5-S1 will lead to this adjacent segment of L4-5 very soon in the near future. And then I don't want patient to come back for another surgery in the, in the you know, like uh, in uh, very soon. But if the L4-5 disc is normal, then I'll have to be very, very careful because then unnecessarily I would not want to involve the L4-5 uh, fusion segment also. Then I'll try my best to pass the screw again if the if the inferior angulation is quite a bit then i'll not hesitate to take uh, intraoperatively shoot uh, of the correct direction of the pedicle screw at l5 also like which we mostly do for s1 only and so that you know like my that one shot you know like pedicle screws are you know like uh, one shot thing if you are if you are getting it correct in the first shot good because second shot you, all the bailout options uh, to pass the screw in a violated uh, pedicle is always, you know, like compromised. So here I would like to give that first uh, best one shot uh, by taking the CM shoot. So he's rightly said, I think you should take a L4 as an advantage if you have a L4, L5 discovery. Now, positive of time, Dr. Umang, uh, the question which was asked me was the whether you, what, what makes my, uh, me to do for S2 LR like in a high grade lumbar spondylitis. This is, is the amount of purchase that you are getting. If you have got a good tricortical purchase in the S1 pedicle, if your screw diameter is quite large, if your uh, length is uh, more than 40, then yes, you can still get away. But if you don't have a good working length, your screw length is less than 35, you, you don't have a good, because sacral pedicle is very capacious. So if you are doubtful, it's very easy to pass s like as you will practice more and more, you can get a very well good purchase. But the point which I discuss in my talk is that if you are doing a good thorough L5 S1 fusion, and if you are pass a large interbody spacer between the L5 S1, it protects your S1 screw as well. So that is how one should think and trade about that. There's a pause, uh, Dr. Amit. I want you to stay back uh, because we're going to have a further discussion. Last question to Amit, and then we're going to next talk. So, Tushar, uh, you know, in my practice, I have never passed S2 elix screw to be true. I am very comfortable with passing the elix screws. Now, you must have done both. So, do you feel that uh, passing the elix screw and as compared to that, passing the S2 elix screw? In terms of the hold of the screw which you get, like just because you are getting additional cortices while going from S2 to iliac, 
does it make a big difference in terms of the getting the hold um, you know because my reservation is that you know i am going into the iliac crest blindly just going to the s2 and then maybe trying to find out that iliac crest so i am little hesitant to do that but uh, i think really it's that a very valid point yeah so the what you are trying to say is that iliac screw is not only uh, it increases the safety because you are away from the vital structure and you are in the iliac wing and you are also saying the pull out strength is significant i agree with you but the advantage of s2 iliac screw is that the construct comes in a line uh, you are a expert surgeon so you can bend the rod or you can connect the rod which is become difficult especially when is beginning with the uh, particular this surgery whereas s2 iliac screw the whole foundation comes in a line and because you are going across the joint the number of cortical purchases you are having more, more in s2 iliac joint it increases the strength of your construct as compared to iliac screw but having said that as i told you i always keep the iliac screw stand by there's no problem with iliac screw they are more safer they can be passed easily and they can get a good length uh, but uh, having uh, you if you have good fluoroscopy you should always try to go for a s2 iliac screw at the uh, beginning okay thank you uh, i would bhushan uh, can, is the next talk uh, ready uh, uh, dr rupinder chahal uh, sir our own assi secretary uh, dr chahal sir uh, he's he's going to talk about the uh, microdiscectomy sir is a consultant at gangaram hospital uh, bhushan can you share his talk and uh, 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 prepare the video yes dr yes. vishal yes sir so before yes, we move sir. ahead on behalf of uh, asicon 2024 i'd like to take this opportunity to uh, to welcome all the faculty members our very own secretary of assi dr rupinder sir and all the other faculty members for sparing time for this wonderful workshop on this beautiful sunday morning i take this opportunity to welcome all the delegates and i really wish you all a wishful learning remember basic spine is the is the core key to the world of spine surgery and this is the this is your opportunity to go and learn everything about lumbar spine right from plain decompressions microdiscectomies to spinal fusions to the right way to put intraosseous pedicle screw placements in thoracic and lumbar spine and mind you km is the mecca of spine surgery where the who's who of spine dr bojraj dr vj lahiri dr engel alikar have all done their workshops so this is your opportunity to go and learn it where the the bosses have learned it from and you are the best of faculty during this cadaveric workshop these recorded talks will be sent to you and mind you this is only the beginning of basic spine there are 12 long hours of basic spine during the whole conference there are hands on sawbone workshops during the conference on lumbar spine pedicle screw instrumentation cervical spine lateral mass instrumentation there are hands on workshop on drills there are interactive case discussions about degenerative spine there are lectures on degen spine about degen lysthesis high grade lysthesis degen scoliosis and there is lots happening during the conference just go through the booklet and choose your to do list in the conference so that you can complement your knowledge during the conference before you really land up into the cadaveric workshop which is on the 21st i again welcome you all and wish you all a wishful learning through asicon 2024 welcome to the maxim city of mumbai thank you tushar thank you vishal uh, i i would like dr bhushan to present uh, dr yes, achar yes. stock sir is online thank you sir for agreeing uh, on a very uh, notice it, it is always pleasure to host you uh, uh, we going to have dr chal sir uh, sticking to the this thing for 15 minutes he has to go through the multiple uh, this thing but he has agreed so we'll going to have a questions for him after end of the talk as well thank you sir okay so starting sir's video uh good morning i will be now speaking on minimal incision fenestration discectomy one of the most common surgeries as a spine surgeon that we do uh let me take you through a representative case this is a 41 year old gentleman a teacher by profession has a right buttock and a leg pain for 3 months on examination is slr is 30 degree motor functions are normal there's a decreased s1 dermatomal sensation on the right side and a diminished ankle reflex bladder bubble is intact uh we position the patient prone on a bolster i usually like to have my bolsters in a vertical direction i don't want to recreate more lordosis because then the disc uh interlaminar space decreases and it becomes difficult and you have to cut more bone uh make sure your eyes and the nose and all are free and uh, your arms are not stretched and the bony prominences around the elbow the wrist the knees are well padded and uh, your knees are little flexed so your toes do not fold in that causes a little post operative pain in such patients and the genitalia are free 
all your wires, the quadri, the uh, Foley's catheter and all are fixed well. So, and the radial lucent part of the table is visible. So, at, so when you're marking the level, you have, you have a free movement of your C arm. Uh, that is very, very important. Uh, once preoperatively, you mark the level with a needle. Needle should not be long, should be in the paraspinal re region so that you don't go into the dura. Uh, we are just marking it uh, for the video's sake. It is important that you mark the midline. This is important in a very obese person where you can't feel the midline uh, spinous processes and you may tend to give incision little paraspinal and uh, in that case, to reach the level, you may have to extend the incision, which becomes an issue because micro is the one surgery you sell the patient as a minimum incision. So we go a little paraspinal. We don't give the incision paraspinal, but retract the skin literally on the lateral aspect, give around a two centimeter incision. And uh, once that incision is given, then you, with the cops uh, elevator, and leaving a small cuff of muscle along with the fascia on the medial aspect, uh, you go into the interlaminar space. Uh, once you are in the interlaminar space, uh, you do apply the Bushan. Uh, skin down. So good part is, unlike the conventional hemilaminectomy retractors, it doesn't have the medial prong which can fracture the spinous process. And if you are doing an over-the-top decompression, it does not hinder your vision on the medial aspect. And uh, once this retractor is in place, it is important that you check your levels again. Uh, because level is an important, wrong level is a big issue and uh, we're using a carries and projector levels. Once you are in the right interlaminar space, it is important that you take out all the soft tissues from that area before you reach the ligamentum flavum and mark your superior and inferior lamina uh, with the cautery. It is important because uh, it becomes easier to use a bar on an osteotome to do a laminot laminotomy but make sure you do not damage your facet joints with the cautery. So you have a superior lamina of L5 on the su superior, uh, superior uh, right aspect and uh, S1 on the down. Uh, using a carison, you remove all the soft tissue, fascia and the fat over the space. You can sh see a yellow shining ligamentum flavor. Uh, we are just uh, holding the cuff of that medial uh, muscle to have a good vision. Uh, people use normally uh, to detach the superior ligamentum flavum, you can use a sharp curate. You can do a partial laminotomy with a bar or with an osteotome. And in L5-S1, even you can make a space in the uh, uh, ligamentum flavum, a window and work from there because a wider space. Uh, to remove this ligamentum flavor, people tend to use a 90 degree carison because then the ligamentum doesn't slip. But uh, most of people don't prefer that using it's a large footprint and you have to go deep into the canal. Uh, other uh, tip to remove this ligamentum flavor is that you work at the edges. So you work it around the bone. Uh, so once you are taking a cuff of the bone uh, with the ligament, it becomes very, very easy to remove it like we're doing here from the inferior lamina. Uh, it is also important that you clear the lateral aspect because then it is very easy if you can identify the traversing route, then you know you are safe on one side and you can use the bigger instruments to remove the disc. Uh, so the, from the lateral gutter, we're removing all the ligament and flavor. Uh, it is good that you remove every free fragment of the ligamentum flavum because it can roll back and cause stenosis at a lateral, uh, later aspect. Uh, using a blunt dissector, you, uh, we are retracting the neural structures on the lateral aspect, uh, on the medial aspect, sorry, and uh, identifying the disc. Uh, using a cotinoid helps you uh, 
uh, clear the field. It gives you a tamponade effect. It pushes the uh, uh, neural structures uh, away from your operating uh, site. Uh, once you are over the disc, uh, you must identify the lower and the upper uh, end plates and give your incision uh, on the disc space. And uh, that is important because uh, uh, so once the disc space is identified and uh, using a cottonoid, you would attract the neural structures medially and clear the space. It is important that you identify the superior and the inferior end plate because then you can give your incision in the middle of the disc. It, it helps you in healing. Uh, otherwise, if there is a rent or an end plate fracture in most of the cases in the superior or inferior, then probably you have to give another incision and connect both of them to take do a complete job. And uh, healing may become an issue in those cases. And uh, nowadays we do not give a crusade incision. Uh, so here it is the analyst you see is already torn. This is just the PLL we have incised and the disc is popping out. At this point, you are tempted to just pull this out, but uh, ideally you should tease this whole fragment out. And uh, the best instrument to do is a blunt hook, not a sharp hook. The so sharp hook will cut through the disc, disc and you may even catch your root or the dura with it. So once you have a sufficiently free fragments clearly teased out, then depending upon your size of the fragment and these, you can use a number one, two or three uh, pituitary rongers to pull these fragments out. Uh, as I already told you, your suction is an important dissector. So make sure your suction is not sharp. It is not over the root, but it's just pushing the root away and uh, and under vision this is important step so whenever you're pulling make sure your root is far away from your instruments this is the major thing that happens is that people do catch up the root and uh, damage carotenoids are soak blood and swell up and need to be replaced few times during the surgery otherwise they impede your vision uh, so once uh, you have cleared all the space, it is important that if you take out these large fragments and then compare it with your MRI findings. Uh, another step we do is uh, we use a suction tip and uh, flush a lot of saline into the disc space to flush out the free uh, disc fragments. And once those are done, your limit disectomy is complete. Remove all the cottonoids, look for all bleeders, and uh, look for small fragments of uh, discs which may have gone under the root may cause irritation and uh, your soft tissue falls back and you close thin layers. Uh, just a technical note on uh, uh, and uh, large uh, posterior central uh, disc at L5S1 level and uh, we mark the level and uh, as in the previous case uh, intraoperatively level is confirmed and uh, this is uh, uh, we are now in the axilla between the S1 and the S2 roots. Uh, this is a very large piece. The issue with this is now you're working under between the two discs and you using large instruments. There's always a chance that you will catch up one of the roots or give attraction to the roots and uh, you have to be very, very, very careful. And in young patients, this sometimes these pieces are very, very sticky and uh, you have to just keep pulling it and they refuse to come out. So another trick is to convert this axillary disc into a shoulder disc. So you just retract the S1 root medially, identify the annulus, give an incision there, connecting it with the rent which is previously seen and uh, now you can use much bigger instruments because one side of your uh, approach is relatively safe and you have to only watch out for one of the roots. Uh, the other part is this uh, part of which is just coming out through the axilla refuses to go in. 
So you can do is take a cottonoid and uh, keep pushing this piece of uh, disc material back into the uh, disc space and uh, then go back into the shoulder approach again and uh, try taking out this piece. Uh, uh, this is important that uh, you just push it back in the disc space and uh, now coming back, uh, you just pull it, the cottonoid is out and uh, you have the S1, S2 and the thecal sac, but it's nothing on the lateral aspect. So you can freely use a large size instruments. And uh, it is important to just catch hold of the root and pull it and make sure that your root is free when you are just holding this disc fragment and this large piece has just come out. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for a, a, a detailed talk of doing a micro discotomy. And I think this video is going to be shared on a WhatsApp group so you can see the original quality video because this is a streaming video. So you can all see that. Sir, uh, 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 you you showed a techni uh, technique of lumbar discotomy uh, and we're going to have a T-leaf lecture by Dr. Ajay Shetty and thereafter we're going to have a combined questions to both of you uh, with respect to the lumbar. So I would request you to stay back for some time. Thank you. Dr. Bhushan, uh, uh, can you uh, uh, play Dr. Ajay Shetty sir's talk? Yes, sir. No. Dr. Ajay Shetty, so can we take another question? Uh, or... uh, yeah, okay. Uh, we can, we can uh, I think he's logged in. So what we'll do, we'll give our questions to Dr. Churl and then we'll uh, have a separate session with Dr. Ajay Shetty as well. So, sir, uh, 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 first question uh, from my side, Dr. Churl, sir. A lot of time uh, we see the inferior extrusion that is going quite down. So uh, what is your strategy when you are dealing with this kind of uh, uh, cases? Uh, any inferior or superior migration will always, if you see, will involve an end plate fracture. So the, and uh, it's important that in such cases you have your fresh MR. So you know the extent of the fragment and the size of the fragment. And uh, usually these fragments uh, are a single piece when, when they migrate superiorly or inferiorly. And uh, before, if you have a superior or inferior migration, my advice is don't go into the disc. Just look for this piece first. Take this out. But otherwise, uh, and the problem is that rent is in the, in the, in the end plate area. So it is very difficult to remove the loose fragments. So you should give an, another incision, which is in the middle of that, and then look out for these loose fragments. And your right. fragment size must match with your MRI findings. Right. Dr. Umang, you have a question? Uh, sir, um, I would like to know that there have been times in my own uh, uh, surgical experience that we have got, uh, we've seen a good big disc on the MRI. But on uh, exploring and uh, exploring the foramen, it's all calcified. At do we, these times, do you make an attempt to, you know, aggressively try to scoop out the disc? Or as described, you just do a nerve root decompression and uh, leave it accordingly? Uh, this is a very good question. So I think the large calcified discs, if you, mu you must have an x-ray for all of these. And these calcified discs can be easily picked up on an x-ray. And especially if it is a high lumbar disc, the chances of calcification are very, very high. So if you suspect that it's a dark black disc and all, probably get a CT scan done. That will help you. Then the calcification is two type. Either it's a uh, PLL calcification or, uh, or a total disc calcification. If it's a PLL disc calcification, it's a large like a speed breaker. and But it has a very soft component below it. So when the patient is loaded, this large uh, calcified thing compresses the root. But when the patient is lying down and you open up, you don't see much of the pressure. So most of the time, if it is very hard and not moving and the disc is totally degenerate, you just do a root decompression. You don't need to do a disc. But if this large PLS, you have seen it, you just try to put a hook up and down and try to move it if it moves. Probably do it, do an osteot, do use an osteotome and remove this fragment. And definitely you'll see very, very loose fragments in the disc space in such cases. But it, it will definitely extend in up to the other side also. 
So that should not be worried. Do it on only on the uh, symptomatic side. So a small osteotome, a number two carison, all will help you in taking out these bony fragments. Sir, you had a very uh, clean field a meticulous dis a dissection. Uh, so, so how do you deal? Because a lot of time when a beginner youngster try to take a disc, there's a lot of bleeding and then one has to retract. There's a lot of suction going on. So what are your tips to uh, prevent uh, excessive bleeding when you are doing a disc There are two issues. One is uh, whenever I am now, when I am into the canal, my bipolar coagulation goes down to 10. So if I see a large vein, I, I am not afraid to coagulate it. Secondly, I before I touch the disc, I put a cottonoid up and down. So it does two things. It prevents these veins from bleeding and has a tamponade effect. So it pushes the neural structures medially. It gives me a space and gives me a clean uh, area. And there is one, one vein which goes along the pedicle, along the root. So you have to just reverse your coagulation and just go a little angulate laterally side and coagulate that. And uh, if you still, at times when the veins are very, when the disc is large and has been there for a long time, you will have a large venous enlargement. So, so I have no issues in using a surgery cell. So when I put a cotinoid, I put a piece of surgery cell uh, below it. And uh, so I have seen even a disc bleeding up to nearly 500 ml. That is, that is happens with everyone. And at times it becomes so difficult that you end up, uh, you are afraid that how will you remove the disc and probably the issue gets very, very complicated if you have a dural tear with it. So you have a CSF, you have blood, you have everything. And another thing is when there's large veins, uh, the, you see when you're putting a surgery cell or a cottonoid and uh, you must wait for five minutes and that five minutes should always be by a watch. It should not be that uh, you because that that period looks too long and you just remove the cottonoid in one or two minutes and again bleeds again putting up so all right and and uh, don't keep the surgery cell in that is another big issue I had in one of my cases very very long time and uh, it swells up and uh, causes acute uh, compression and so much of pain and when you go in you won't find anything it is just it, that chemical thing is. So when you are when you have a bleeding and you have bleeding has stopped, and uh, there's a trick to remove this surgery cell also and the cottonoid. So you must flood your field because immediately if you pull this surgery cottonoid with surgery cell, the clot dislodges. So you fill the field with water and slowly, slowly dislodge your surgery cell and cottonoid. So the clot doesn't dislodge. And it at times it may take in a, it take you to do a disc for 15-20 minutes, but the control bleeding for an hour, half an hour. So you can pack it, put a lot of uh, gel foam, uh, a lot of uh, uh, so, uh, uh, packing and uh, wait for some time. So it's no harm. It takes time. It, some cases are meant to be like this. I think these are very important practical tips. No textbook will mention those tips which sir has highlighted. These are the practical problems that we face when you are doing a discectomy. And very wise word that you don't, uh, for the beginners, when they see the disc, they want to directly jump on doing discectomy. What sir said is important to pack first so that your epidural veins are kind of a, are under compression because you take out the disc, it starts immediately bleeding because of decompression. So it's very important that you have to have a patience. Again, as sir said, five minutes, you have to give a time for it to coagulate, not to have a, a impatience with this particular disc. And sir, another question, a lot of youngsters, we see a large massive disc herniation causing cauda equina. So, so would you uh, always do a discectomy or in this kind of cases you go for a fusion? No, I would not go for a fusion very because it's come for a different thing. In a cauda equina where it's a large disc, I would then now advise you to do a central fenestration. Right. Because, right. Uh, it, because if you are pulling this such a large fragment and from a narrow space, you may cause more damage and you will have dural tear or something like So if it is a cauda equina, your aim is to have a complete decompression. So probably if you are not uh, not uh, trained to do a over-the-top decompression, which we can do it, then probably do a central fenestration without damaging both the facets and uh, doing a 
partial medial uh, facetal undercutting on the side from where you want to remove the disc. So you must do that. Uh, never get tempted to see a disc. Disc is always there. Just so the two things which you will uh, will have is that when a large uh, central disc will push the dura up. So when you are removing the central part of the ligamentum flavum, that is where you will catch the dura. So your dural rent will be there and at the shoulder of the root. So these two are prone. So if you are beginner or even if you are not beginner, if in any case can happen, uh, push in a cottonoid and work over a cottonoid. Work over a cottonoid and never work in a blind field. If there is a bleeding and wait till it stops. Don't uh, don't. But do sir, it. you avoid a fusion because the patient has come for a deficit. Uh, uh, oh, I, uh, I think uh, his main complaint is this is neurology now. And sir, do you use macula retractor? Uh, and and a few words about your. Uh, do you ask anesthetic to keep a blood pressure or anything for? Because you already showed the surgical technique is more meticulous than the. I use a retractor called a Taylor's retractor. That's so I got this from Dr. Kim in Korea, then we developed it. So it, it is like a spatula which hangs up to the on the lateral aspect of the facet or the pars. So all my MIS I do through this retractor. So even the disectomy, even the T lift. So I don't use the hemilaminomectin retractors. So one is because the medial prong is not there. So the medial prong will definitely at times in old patients or something rupture the uh, spinous process and it will obscure my medial field right. if I have to do an over the top decompression. So with this tailless retractor, it just pushes the skin down. So if I tilt the table, I can easily go on the other side. It's a small, just a piece. I so I do everything with it. Are there any questions, Bhushan, for sir? Uh, okay. No, sir. No more questions. So, sir, sir, I would request you to stay back. Uh, after Ajay Shetty talk, sir, talk again, we're going to have some discussion. Oh. Uh, then lumbar session will be uh, over to Dr. Spine. So, uh, this one, can you play uh, Dr. Uh, thank you, sir. Can you play Dr. Ajay Shetty, sir, stop? Sir is a consultant at G uh, Ganga Hospital, Koyambutur. And uh, we he's going to uh, talk basically on the lumbar interbody fusion. Good morning. I'm Dr. Ajay Shetty, a spine consultant from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, and I'm going to speak on how to do a transfer on a lumbar interbody fusion. As we know that the inter lumbar interbody fusion techniques could be done either by a posterior approach or an anterior approach. It can be done either by an open or a MIS technique. What are the advantages of interbody fusion? It happens, the fusion occurs between the vertebral end plates. That is between the vertebral bodies. 80% of the compressive loads goes through the anterior column. As we know that the sagittal vertical axis in the lumbar spine, it just goes through the body and therefore the graft is in compression. There's a larger area for the fusion. It restores height and lordosis and it The transferonal lumbar interbody fusion technique was popular described by Professor Jubin Harms. As the name implies, it's a transforaminal window. That means it is an area between the, uh, between the pedicle above and the pedicle below, and it involves the excision of the superior and the inferior articular process, which gives an uh, approach to the disc space. By doing that, we get a triangular window. The window has got a medial border, which is the traversing nerve root and the thecal sac. We've got a superior border, which is the proximal nerve root, and the inferior border, that is the inferior part of the pedicle. And this is the safe zone through which we enter into the disc. The indications for any procedure on the lumbar spine, wherein we need to do a fusion, a TILF is a very good option. Why we have to do TILFs? Because it's allow pathology of all the columns to be addressed. It provides a circumferential fusion with the higher fusion rates. It addresses the disc as the pain generated, allows direct and also indirect decompression, and it can correct deformities. Preoperative planning is very, very essential because to look at the size of the pedicle, the height of the disc space, assess whether decompression can be done by direct means or whether it's necessary to be done by the indirect means. Look for the conjoint nerve root in the MRI. Look for the presence of osteoporosis. We have to be extremely cautious when you're doing an intrabody fusion. 
in the osteoporotic bone so that to prevent the collapse of the cage and severe kyphotic deformity may not be am amenable to correction only by a telephoto procedure. If, what are the steps? There are six important steps, but the first important step starts with positioning and exposure. The patient is positioned prone on a radiolucent table. The whole idea is to have the abdomen free so that the venous flexes are not compressed to reduce the epidural bleeding and also to maintain the lardosis. That's also very, very important. Resection, subperiosteal, extends up to the tip of the facet joint. And always take care to prevent damage to the upper facet. The capsule of the upper facet should be preserved. This is how the spine is exposed through a midline incision. Through the, the incision, this is what it is, should be exposed. You see the facet capsules there. Okay, that is the facet capsule. And it's also important that the upper facet is always preserved. Okay, then comes the insertion of the screw. I mean, it follows the same standard pattern of insertion of the screw. Okay, the upper screw while you are inserting, as we mentioned earlier, you should take utmost precaution to, to preserve the facet joint. Instrumentation is a standard pedicle screw instrumentation. You apply a contour draw on the side opposite to the plantilla, but always, as I mentioned earlier, the screw should not uh, sit on the tip of the facet joint, especially for the upper screws. In the, when you come to the lower screw uh, application, always remove the facet joint capsule, always identify the facet joint. Sometimes you can excise the inferior articular process so that it makes your entry point much, much easier. This is very, very important because it also makes your overall procedure becomes much easier. Therefore, when you are doing a TLF procedure, the upper screw, you have to be extremely careful not to damage the facet joint. The lower screw, when you are putting, excise the facet, nibble the base of the superior articular process, and you can make your entry point at that point. And that's very, very, makes the whole process very simpler and much faster. Next step is the disc space distraction. Is it always necessary to do it? It's not necessary, but makes your life much easier. There are many ways to do. Why we have to do a disc space distraction? It's basically to open the posterior portion of the disc space. The lumbar discs are basically lordotic. The anterior part is open, the posterior part is narrow. But when you distract, it opens up the posterior part of the disc space and neutralizes the alignment and helps you to ease the excess into the disc. There are many ways to do the disc space distraction. Rod distraction, maybe in a good quality bone when the screw purchase is good. Interspinous distraction. <laughs> and the simplest and the best technique is to use interbody distractor. And that's my favorite. You put an interbody distractor inside from 5 millimeter to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, depending upon the feel you get. And once you have achieved the distraction, and then you can gently distract on the rod on the other side to tighten it to make your work much faster. What about the decompression techniques? Indirect, yes, it's possible, especially in a lytic listesis. You don't have to go ahead and see the nerve root and try to decompress completely. You just, by putting the cage in, you are stabilizing them and by putting the cage in, and also you might be able to get a good compression. Whereas direct could be either unilateral or bilateral. The direct decompression in unilateral when the symptoms are unilateral, classical, recurrent disc prolapse. But as bilateral symptoms, you may have to do a wide decompression or a central decompression. And in high grade listesis, it's also important. See, this is the technique of decompression. This is a patient with a significant spinal canal stenosis, wherein we have done a uh, decompression which extends bilaterally on both the sides. Okay, this is a bilateral decompression. I mean, uh, you can use an osteotome, you can use a nibbler, you can use a kerosene. And nowadays, you can also use a misonic or ultrasonic bone cutter to do the process of decompression. Okay, that is uh, that is uh, important. I mean, especially in a very narrow canal, it's always better that you decompress bilaterally. Uh, you can preserve the midline you would like to, but in patients with moderate stenosis, Lytically, this is you don't need to do these type of uh, procedures per se. Next important question, which side should I go in from? 
If the patient has got a right radiculopathy, always go from the right side. If there's a bilateral symptoms, I would prefer to go from the left side because I'm a right-handed surgeon. It's always, I prefer to go from the right side. <coughs> but at the end of the day, it's the surgeon's choice. But on the symptomatic side, do not fail, but always go from the symptomatic side. As I mentioned earlier, the important step <coughs> is to excise first the inferior articular process. You make a transverse cut just below the parts and then the vertical cut to excise the inferior articular process. And once you excise that, excise the overhanging part of the superior articular process so that you get this triangular window between the exiting nerve root, the traversing nerve root, and the superior pedicle. <coughs> and this is the triangular window, what we should be able to get. And once you've got this triangular window, you have to retract the traversing nerve root and make a window in this space. You can use a knife, but nowadays what I would always do is to just use an osteotome to enter into the disc space. How to identify the disc space? This becomes very important, especially in a collapsed one. Always enter the disc from below. What does it mean? You identify the superior part of the pedicle below, go superiorly, retract all the soft tissues above, and then you can feel the soft structure, that is the disc space. There's a superior wall of the inferior pedicle is the key to reach the disc space. Never ever try to find it from top below because you might damage the nerve root here. And once you do that, you will never miss it. You always get the disc space. And even when, yeah, when the situation, when the, the disc space is totally collapsed, the nerve root may be the, the exiting nerve root may have just come down. The best important thing is to put the disc space shavers inside. You, Keep on dilating it so that the overall disc space widens up and then the nerve root, the exiting nerve root is also taken away. Next, you do the anulotomy and the discectomy. You have various disc space preparation instruments, the shavers, sizes, curates of different, different sizes. This is a very important step, disc space preparation. First, you use the shavers, go straight in, slightly take it out, angle it medially, you use different sizes of shaver, which loosens the disc, the, especially the inner degenerated disc. You take it out of the disc forceps, then use a curate. The first curate should be the straight curate, which goes straight ahead and prepares the disc and the end plate on your side. And then you use the angled one, which helps you to prepare the on the opposite side. Rarely you may have to excise the bone to make the, end, the entry uh, much more parallel. What I usually do if they find the entry is, na entry is narrower, I take kerosene and forceps and cut off the overhanging bone or use a 12 size, 13 size sizer only for the entry to make the entry bigger. This, this space preparation is very, very crucial. Always remember the straight one to prepare on your side, the curved one to prepare in the other half. You can prepare up to 70% of it. Do not damage the cartilages end plate and the bony end plate. The end point is a tactile feedback. You get a feel that is a grating sound. You can remove up to 70 to 80 percent of the bone. At the most, what described by Juggenhams in the beginning, if you want to damage the bony end plate, you can do it in the front, in the anterior one fifth, so that you can pack the bone graft. A bridging of bone happens, and this is advisable so that your fusion bed is very very good. But never try to do that in the posterior half because that has to support the cage. Otherwise, you can have a cage subsidence, very, very common in osteoporotic bone. Sometimes it's better to do it under image guidance so that you are not making an entry into the disc space. Pack it with adequate number of graft and then insert the cage. It could be a bullet cage or it could be a banana cage. Whatever cage, it doesn't matter. It's important that you make your appropriate entry it's important that you make your appropriate entry into the disc space, retract. You can see the disc space here. Then make the entry into the disc space. You can use a knife to make an entry. Then you insert different types or sizes of shavers. To complete the process of loosening then use curates to complete the overall process. Be very careful. You can breach the anterior annulus. If the cage can migrate into the retroperitoneal space, you can have bleeding. 
be careful not to inside the cage in an incorrect angle. Therefore, it's better to use the C-arm and do it. It can impinge the nerve root, the nerve root could be protected. Otherwise, you have post-operative radicular pain. Question always that comes to your mind, how much of bone graft is adequate? About 10 to 15 cc is what that is adequate. If you overpack it, you always find it can back out. Therefore, how do you know that you're not overpacked? My simple rule is that you pack it adequately in the front and into the sides. Take a sizer, maybe one or two millimeters less. Size. If you're using a 12 size gauge, take a 10 size sizer, put it into the disk space and see there is adequate space for you that you know it's quite adequate for you to put a cage, which is of the same length, but of a bigger diameter. What type of cage to use? You can use a bullet or a banana cage. Banana cage may be biomechanically better, but overall the results, there is no difference. What size of cage to use? Usually about 10 to 14 millimeters. Don't use a small or a bigger sizes cage. And the cage should be covering anterior two thirds of the vertebral body with a clear space behind. And in the coronal plane, it should be center. In the end, do a gentle compression I mean, uh, it should not be too hectic, uh, uh, just the gentle compression so that you can recreate the larosis. Closure is a standard method and the patient is mobilized on the same day with LS belt. Allow walking with the homeboard activities. Uh, depending on the patient, by two or four, uh, th three, two to four weeks, they can get back to work uh, depending on their activity. There are various complications that can happen, but I'm not going to elaborate on that. To conclude, good positioning and maintaining lordosis is adequate. For me, the most important step in chilif is a good screw placement. The transformal axis, the upper border of the lower pedicle is the key. A good end space, this space preparation is crucial. Do not damage the bony end plate. Pack adequate bone graft, not too much, around 10 cc. K should be long enough to cross the midline and should occupy greater than two thirds of the anteroposterior disc. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for a very detailed and meticulous uh, preparation of the end plates, which is, I think, the common uh, concern for the beginners. Uh, sir, you mentioned the first point is to uh, get a, ensure that there's a good lumbar lordosis. So, uh, how how is your positioning, sir? Do you use a, a bolster or a, any special? As product? I mentioned earlier, that I use a bolsters. See, there are many ways to do it. A retinal frame, you use it, or any of the frames, you use it to obliterate lumbar lordosis when you are doing a decompression procedure something like a discectomy or stenosis. But if you are doing a fusion procedure, it's always better to position, like the lumbar lordosis is recreated, the bolsters are better. Uh, I prefer to use horizontal bolsters. There are people who use vertical bolsters. It depends on whatever you are trained to, but basically that's how we recreate the lordosis. And sir, the lordosis, uh, I think the two level, we usually do it doesn't matter the rod contouring, but what happens after three levels? So how do you decide how much is the rod contouring, especially if you are doing a two or three level? Uh, yeah, basically, of... you need to take into sagittal balance into account. You have to look at the pelvic incidence and how much of uh, lumbar lordosis you need to recreate. And based on that, you need to give the bend. And also based on that, your interbody work also determines how much you are trying to aim. And nowadays, if you take a uh, X-ray radiograph and then you can use a sagittal meter, to get an idea about whether you have recreated the lordosis as to how much you have decided. Right. Sir, uh, is there any concern because you mentioned about the distraction? So I would like to also uh, take opinion of uh, yours and uh, Dr. Charles, sir. So do you always uh, do a distraction to get your cage from the posterior border in or, or it's only in a few cases that you like? Because there's a concern that if you distract, it may lose the screw uh, purchase or screw what, hold. So yeah, I would answer first before child comes in. But that's what I meant to say. It depends upon the case, uh, whether you need to distract or not. I would, what I do nowadays is to get into the disk space, loosen the disk space and use the biggest sizer that goes inside. And then I will tighten it a bit, tighten the rods on the opposite side a bit so that it's a stable construct when I am working and preparing the end plate. And then I'm not going to distract on the screws per se. I'm using the interbody distractor to achieve the distraction and then tighten it. It's not always necessary that you need to maintain the distraction because now if you see MIS surgeons, a lot of them put the cage <coughs> first and then they put the screw. They're not bothered about the mobility. But for me, I find that a stable structure gives me ease of working of preparation of it. Right. Sir. Dr. Charles, sir, uh, what is your strategy? When uh, you... uh, it's an important question because uh, I personally don't distract, but we had few cage, cage backouts in our unit. So the issue was I didn't have a cage back out. Dr. Shankar had a cage back out. Dr. Kalra didn't have a cage back out. So the problem is if you are distracting over the screws, 
everyone would uh, agree that you should put 4.5 mm screws or 5.5 and didn't distract, then change the screws if you're doing it over the screws because in osteoporosis maker. But then what Dr. Kala told me that the mistake we were making is that when we are putting our shavers, we are, we are keeping it little out and destroying the posterior margins. So both the end plates become so parallel, the cage can come out. So ideally what he does is he will put his shaver inside the disc, the, the upper part doesn't come out, so that those posterior edges he retains. So I don't know, I, <laughs> it's a hypothesis, but I would I would keep little cage, uh, the shaver out and destroy those uh, things. So my cage becomes very parallel. So he said that is a problem. You should not make it so parallel that it comes out. So then we started some other thing, just pushing it, making it lie down horizontally, all those things. And Charles, sir, uh, how much is the importance of this, uh, the shavers, which we go in and do? Do you think if, uh, if the local manufacturing, there are sharp kind of a shavers, which do cause the cage, uh, the end plates? Not you are very sharp. If you are destroying the end plates and you definitely, your uh, cages will definitely sink in. So it, it, it is really like uh, you have to really balance out how much you have to uh, cure it. Because we had this problem when we didn't have the shavers. We used to have very big curates. So we used to curate it and go into the uh, oh. bone. And that was the major cause of subsidence. And especially if you are not ham seeing a case when you are hammering that normally when you do, because you are so experienced that you think it will not go it. I have seen so many of times that the cage is just gone into the vertebral body. And only thing comes to it that you are you think you are fitting it snugly. And suddenly it goes into the vertebral body and then, then the field is full of blood then. Yes, I agree. Uh, Ajay sir, uh, uh, yes, you had raised the question. Yeah, no, but basically when you are putting the screw, when you look at the x-rays, when you are putting the screw, you get a feel of how the hold of the bone is. And that should make you aware that this is an osteoporotic bone. My preparation has to be very cautious. There is nothing wrong in looking under the sea arm and be sure that you are in the disc space when you are making your preparation. Because the bones are so soft, you can directly get into the vertebral body and you suddenly find the cage size is 13, 14. I mean, it's just going in because you are getting into the vertebral body. Therefore, you have to make a decision as you start putting your screws. You know that, okay, this is the osteoporotic bone. I have to be extremely cautious about my preparation so that I'm not going to be very aggressive about cure attach. Sir, I think you highlighted the important point, the intra-body penetration of the cage and a lot of beginners are very aggressive and we all... Yeah. aggressive at the initial part we want to take out the as much disc as possible in the process we do cause sometime case subsidence so so what is the bailout sir would you still go ahead with the cage a placement larger cage or would you just take out and put a graph how, how do you manage in case if you get a case subsidence i know it's a tricky I, I situation know, I, I agree to that that's a very valid point because i would say that to put in a i would still prefer to put a maximum size cage that possible but i would also rely on putting a lot of graphs in and around so that it fuses in the end See, fusion is not a major issue as such, but if you have a cage backout, cage backout happens one either because you have packed in so much of graft. Initially, you tend to pack in so much. That's why I mentioned the point that you use a sizer, which is one or two sizes less than what you have selected. If it's a 12 mm sizer you have selected, use a 10 mm sizer, put it inside. You know that there is an adequate length that the sizer goes in, adequate width that it is there. Therefore, you know that the cage will go in comfortably well. You, right. About 10 cc is fine. Sometimes when you do the whole laminectomy, you get 15 cc. You may tend to pack the whole lot. And the size of the disc space also varies. Right. Charles, sir. Uh, I think if you have put a cage in and it's gone into the vertebral body and it's very tight fit, don't take it out. Yeah. Because right. then you will not have... So pack it more bone where the space is there. Right. And uh, place your cages little more anteriorly because the discs are biconcave. So if, you, if it is a small size 20, 22 cage and it is just in between. It doesn't have a snug fit. So just push the cage a little. It becomes now, earlier cages were rectangular cages. So they had this shape was same. Now the problem is cages are little uh, funnel shaped. So the interior one doesn't have a very snugly fit. So that is little issue with this. So two they are very easy to put in. The triangular cage, rectangular cages which John manufactured at that time were very little difficult to put in. 
So now these are very easy to put in, but then they don't have a good hold anteriorly. Right. So That's two questions to both of you. I want you uh, and Dr. Ajoy uh, to answer this question regarding the common concern peak cage versus titanium cage and uh, specifically uh, the uh, the amount of uh, bone graft. Uh, so, uh, sir, first peak cage and uh, titanium and then we'll go on our next slide. So what is your take on a peak and titanium? I use both, but uh, I personally feel peak is better because it uh, invites less uh, discussion on a post-op x-ray. And, <laughs> and uh, the graft is, uh, and I mostly use now this is, I don't mm -hmm. use the typical banana cages. We I am only using the bullet cages. So what I do is I put in a lot of bone graft and with my pituitary rongerite and, uh, and the dissector, I keep pushing it to the other side. So that is the thing, and I am I tend to put in a lot of bone graft, and uh, so I can use anything. But at times, what weighs on the mind is the probably the cost of that. Ajay, sir. I'm okay with yeah. it, but if no, you I hammer use... a peak cage, it breaks. But if you think it is, you are putting a very tight cage and just hammering it, the the upper part just breaks. Of it has happened with me a few times. I usually use titanium cages. It's not that I am biased against it. It's just a habit that we have been using titanium cages. In the literature wise, I mean, there is no major difference. Initially, there was some paper saying that infection could be more with peak, but uh, it's just an evolution. Now you've got carbon fiber coated uh, cages. Industry wants to come out with something new. It keeps on coming it out. But basically what you are comfortable with. Regarding the insertion of the cage, if you're using a broader cage, only suggestion is that Go on the narrow part first and then rotate it so that it's easy for you to insert. Like we tend to use bullet cages more often. The commercially available are narrow in the front so that it goes in easily. But if you're using a broader cage, go the narrow first, first go in like this and then rotate it so that the lardosis is created. So the stress is lesser. So the stock is still, but I'm going to ask you, do you still do play uh, or always still if not? I still do PLIF uh, because, see, if you are looking at a high-grade listosis reduction, if you find that it is a grade 4 high-grade listosis, if you want to mobilize, mobilizing from one side may not be adequate. And uh, I may have to get into the other side to mobilize it well. It's like an osteotomy so that your reduction comes in well. I still do it because there's no major difference between a TELIF and a uh, PLIF. Basically, you're putting two cages in your preparation-wise. Everything is the same. It may it doesn't take much time. It just maybe adds five minutes to your overall procedure. Your preparation is much better. And other times, sometimes I do the cliff is whenever when I am doing a very bad infective scenario from behind. Therefore, when I am I want to clear the whole of the displace of the infected annulus, I still do a cliff. There's nothing wrong in doing a cliff. Basically, nowadays we do cliff like a telif. You go transferaminal, you put two cages in. It's not like the original cliff where you used to retain the facet, retract, and then put a cage in. And you talked about the very bad scenario like an infection, infective spondyl discitis. So what is your strategy when you're doing TILIF? Do you use a only bone graft in these cases or you still because their endplates are destroyed? Uh, how is your strategy when you're doing a fusion, lumbar interbody fusion in those cases? You have to be only thing when you're doing a lumbar interbody fusion from behind in an infective spondyl discitis. Be very careful. The ALL is very thin. You can breach the ALL, number one. When you are working, you take your disforceps, feel the ALL and work behind it, number one. Number two, it's always there is an infected part of the annulus. Be very careful, identify that and try to take it out. If you are retaining the infected annulus and then packing it with a bone graft or a cage, your problems are much, much higher. The infection okay. may not settle. Thirdly, what to use? I still use a lot of bone graft with the cage. I use titanium cage, but I would like to have a cage because it gives structural stability. With good antibiotic treatment, most of them do respond. Chal, sir, do you still use a, a PILIF appro in a, a, a approach or you, uh, you are a very proponent of TILIF only? No, no, I try to do a PILIF in everything where I, I try to cut little uh, minimum bone on the lateral aspects. If I get through with it, otherwise I cut it. So that is not an issue. Uh, and I personally, I am not aware to, uh, averse to it, but I always use bone graft in infection. And uh, so if I need a large bone graft, I always use the anterior iliac crust, take a bone graft first and then go about it. And uh, Ajay said a very important point, especially in this tuberculosis and all which where we do procedures like TLIP, where there is no anterior support and you are pushing the bone graft. 
really need, you should not be wasting putting the bone graft in the mediastinum or in the abdomen. So I personally put a big pieces of spongy stern anteriorly and over that I put a bone. So it just holds the bone there. Okay, sir. And how frequently do you do a contralateral uh, uh, decompression, sir? Con uh, the opposite side. If the left sided pain patient has come, we do a left sided tilif. At the same time, do you try to take out the opposite side facet? Try to go for that now route? No, or I don't. Don't do. Don't, side don't, side do. don't do. Ajay, sir. Sir, you are mute, sir. Ajay, sir, you are mute. If it is a stenosis, I would still, I might do that. If I am addressing a stenosis, even though symptom is on one side, I would might do that. But if it's a recurrent disc, if it's a lytic lysis, I wouldn't bother to do that. If I'm addressing a stenosis, I would prefer to decompress the whole lot. And sir, do you, uh, when you are passing a cage, how do you exactly, you give a very important point that you go just cephalate to the inferior pedicle and retract everything. A lot of time in allisthesis cases, though we, it's a basic course, uh, I would like you to tell what is your strategy to prevent that exiting root injury? Because it comes in a play, especially when you have a completely collapsed site. How do you tackle what I mean that? To say, if there is a collapsed site, as you keep putting in the sizes or the shavers, it tends to open up. The nerve root is gradually pushed away. It's very, very important. I mean, this technique is applicable even for MIS. See, in MIS, a lot of time when the disc space is collapsed, you are not able to see well. You identify the superior part of the pedicle, get into the disc space. As you put the sizes and open up, the nerve root is pushed away. But always make it a point that you just try to identify the lateral mud. Some Even with all the effort, sometimes you might feel the nerve root just along the lateral wall of the pedicle. I mean, going down very narrowly. You have to protect with the... Uh, I didn't mention that aspect because of want of time. Use a... Uh, you can pack with the patty. Use a McDonald on medially and a lateral route. And then you put the cage in. Right. Tushar, right. this is important. What I just said is in this collapsed discs, na, it's very difficult to put a shaver. I think it's coming up. Eh? So what Your is important, time. but what personally I do is I use a 2 mm uh, osteotome. Because if you put the shaver, you may just go in yeah. somewhere else. I, put, I just hammer a little bit of osteotome yeah. and then rotate it. It creates a space. So it, it's, it's, you have a better control with the osteotome on hammer than with the free hand. I, I always use now 5 mm osteotomes. Yeah. To get into the disk space for all yes, patients. Yes. I just use the osteotome, get into the disk space, open up. Yeah. Because the shaver starts from 6 mm. Okay. Therefore, this is my entry. Then shavers will come in. And sir, now a lot of companies are coming with so-called these expandable cage. Do you have any experience or do you, uh, do you think they really do uh, work what they're supposed to do? They do work. They do work. They're really useful in a very collapsed disk space, in anomalous route. When you find the space is very less. But comes with a cost. That's the, uh, I haven't used the Indian ones, but they're quite expensive, the foreign ones. Right. We use a lot of them, 80%. Oh, okay. So what is your experience? How, how, do you think they do give a good lot of... Yeah, the Indian two hmm. companies make in India. One is the TechnoShine, which is good, but it's costly. The other one is by Gion. So Gion has now improved, but we had problems with Gion. So... But we are still using it. It's very, very handy thing. Right. And sir, they, there's a lot of talk about the placing the cage in the anterior half of the body to get more lordosis or placing the cage in the posterior half of the body to get a good foraminal height. Does it matter? Yeah, or... I don't think these two things play a role, but I think fitting a, a well-fit cage is the main stay. Are manipulating uh, or getting the a amount of placing a cage, I think is little overreach. Right. But placing anteriorly does help to recreate lordosis, but uh, coming behind is very risky. It can back out. It should be at least the anterior two third, so that when you compress from behind, when you excess both the facet and compress from behind, you will recreate the lordosis. And the opening of the foramen, anyway, you are excess the foramen off. You don't have to think, you're not doing an okay procedure. You don't have to think of worrying about opening up the foramen. And nowadays, when you are using 10 to 12 mm cage, it really opens up quite adequately. And so the common problem that we encounter, contralateral radiculopathy after performing a procedure. So how do you deal with that in a post-operative period? Is it usually the transient? Uh, how frequently one has to go and give a transforminal block for that? How do you uh, How do you manage those cases? But honestly, I mean, uh, I rarely seen a contralateral problem uh, when I done a tilif. I mean, if you are choosing your indication right, if you are doing for a stenosis, 
you go only unilaterally, do not decompress the other nerve root, you can have a problem. But if you are doing it for a lytical stasis, if you are doing it for a recurrent disc or other scenarios, you usually rarely get a contralateral problem. In my opinion, if I had got a contralateral problem, it is because of screw malposition. Right. The, the screw which is irritating rather than your uh, technique. Right. So, Shar, where you get a contralateral, I, this is a different scenario, not in the same level, which I had faced once, that when you do a T leaf at L4-5, there is a decreased uh, disc space at L4-1 and uh, you have a anticipate a foraminal stenosis and the, you have a unilateral radical <laughs> you have done a TLF at L4-5 and then you tend to do a foraminotomy at L5-S1 also. So, because you don't know which, uh, maybe that root is also getting compressed. So, my patient when I did this, that L4-5 got fixed and lordotic. So, the movement was then only at L5-S1 and uh, so when he stood up after a few days, he developed a foot drop on the other side. So the movement now occurs only at, so the root on the other side was getting. So we gave him a root block, uh, the pain subsided, but he was getting weakness. So I, when I decompressed, the root was red and inflamed and he recovered. So now when I see and I'm doing a unilateral foraminotomy, I then do it on both the sides. If I at L5 one. Use any adjuvants intraoperatively like a kenacord or steroid or anesthetic around the inflamed red now roots, which you see intraoperatively. No. I use it in the disc. Uh, when I'm doing for a disc, we call it a cocktail where we have a morphine, gentamicin, and a dexona. Okay. I'm sure we even I, I'm sure Ajay says gonna sing there's no evidence for this, but yes, uh, the, I think it uh, a lot no, of people these, use it. These are people yeah, some are of them the are in acute pain people. and it gives them instant relief. So that post operative they are they feel happy that they have chosen the procedure. I, th I think Dr. Samir Dalvi is doing Dr. Samir Dalvi is there online. Uh, <laughs> so to take uh, his uh, view, uh, Dr. Samir Dalvi's view about the adjuvants like a steroid. I'm sitting on the chat. Yeah, hi, hi. Sorry, my view on what? Yeah, sir, uh, intraoperatively, when you see a very inflamed red now roots, you are done at leave. Yeah. Uh, people like to use steroid or anesthetic in that part. Do you uh, uh, do you do anything or you don't do anything about that? Yeah, you're right. But if there is a, like a red inflamed uh, nerve root, uh, then uh, I do sometimes feel that uh, we'd use a steroid or something. Ajay, sir, vehemently yeah. saying no. I know. Uh, you no, 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 vehemently lie. I did start. It's, it's, it's just, I'm, I'm not sure whether it makes a difference or not. I'm not sure whether it makes a difference. It's just I something you feel start, like doing something, you do it. I did start using following discectomy many, many years ago. And then we had a series of two or three infections. And then I even burned my fingers. I stopped using it. But with my, uh, I mean, basically, we have been doing endoscopy. I find that uh, basically, if you buzz off the posterior annulus, the postoperative pain becomes significantly lesser. I think nowadays, even when I do microscopic, I use the bipolar, just cauterize the annulus and the PLL around the area of the discectomy, and I find that the postoperative pain is lesser. Right. So I just want to say about the steroid. I do. I, I don't use local steroids anymore. I like an IV. I'll tell the anesthetist to give a shot. Local steroids is completely out. I don't use it because, in addition to everything else, it's also associated with uh, dural tests and CSF leaks. Right. In addition to it, so I don't do anything. I don't even put local anesthetic locally anymore. Nothing. Okay. If at all, I have the steroid and the anesthetist to give a shot. Yes, I think oh, there are different okay. views uh, about it. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ajay sir and Dr. Charles sir, uh, uh, for this talk. But Dr. Samir is going to be in a thoracic session. But I would also uh, like uh, his uh, view about the uh, the cage uh, subsidence. Uh, do you do anything different, uh, Samir sir? If you get a cage subsidence inside intraoperatively, do you take out the cage uh, completely and put a graft? What are your salvage strategy for a cage subsidence? No, actually, subsidence. How can you have a subsidence? Uh, subsidence is something which happens over a period of time, right? Yeah, so you need to say if a cage goes into the vertebral in, body. Intraoperatively, you break the end plate. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, I mean, a, a lot depends on how the surgery is going. But sometimes I'll just, if, suppose it is stuck and it's gone. Like sometimes you see, you hammer it and then it's suddenly stuck and it's neither going out nor coming in. Then you just leave it like that and pack it with bone graft. It, it does what it does. As long as it's not dangerous, you, you can just leave it over there. It shouldn't be, it should be loose and uh, it should not be able to migrate. That's all. You know, if you can easily revise it and put something better, it's fine. I think one of the big problems with TLFs and all the way we do it and the way I also do it is we use a lot of that puka, the distractor, and that very often damages the end plate. You know, we, 
but we do tend to use it to open the disk space and then sometimes it just goes in the end plate and you don't know what's happening yeah same thing but, uh, i think practically i have not faced like in terms of it's never really created an issue like even if the thing is inside you put um you pack it with bones off and that's fine eventually it just has to fuse that's all i think that was a consensus of most of the faculty when we had a discussion so again uh, thank you ajay sir and uh, dr chal sir thank for you, for the opportunity and uh, i i and i would uh, always like that you staying for the for, uh, whenever possible for the next uh, talks as well so we can take your insights as well and now uh, i would like to invite dr samit dalvi sir uh, the consultant uh, spine surgeon at hindujo hospital and he's going to talk a important topic how to pass a thoracic pedicle screws so uh, uh, bushan uh, can you play the dr samit dalvi talk surgery no. for lesions within the thoracic spine was generally performed either through a direct Bishan, posterior uh, approach is, uh, sorry, or wasn't it my talk first through an anterior know. trans sorry sir wasn't it my talk first just, just a minute yes sir i like just do it sir sorry and you are running it from the video right yeah yes yeah, we will be running the mp4 file sir yeah I mean, I can do it live also, but the thing is that it's easier that way. There's no kind of disconnection issue or something. If if Bhushan yes, doesn't, yes, do it, it was wrong. Good morning, everyone, yes, and welcome to this uh, basic spine course. My topic today is thoracic pedicle screws, and I'm going to try and tell you a few things about the same. So basically, it's important to know the history. and pedicle screws really for the first time came with paul harrington who actually used it with the harrington rod it's only roy camille who used these screws with a plate and he put them through round hole plates and needed to align them steffi had the idea of having a variable screw placement so he put the screws first and the plate on top of that and that became the gold standard for a long time but surprisingly it was in india dr lahiri who is my boss and my teacher who used it in 1985 with various ways without having access to the western literature plate based systems were used all this time till cotrell and puno etc started using it with the rod and then that made it a lot more versatile in 1991 the fda kind of banned pedicle screws because of a lot of fusion failures and that led to pedicle screws being in disrepute but over a period of time that has been solved and now pedicle screws are fda approved so why do we use a pedicle screw firstly is the force nucleus concept it's the it, it's where all the three things converge the transverse process the pedicle and the body and it's the strongest uh, part of the vertebra plus two screws on either side give a three column purchase bilaterally and gives a very very good grip on the vertebra now a screw has the core or the shaft diameter which is important for the strength and that we get in 4.5 5.5 6.5 etc and the other is the thread diameter or the outer <laughs> diameter and that is responsible for the purchase or the pull out strength and there are different sorts of threads each with their advantages and disadvantages they may be self tapping or non self tapping but the buttress threads are sort of the best to prevent cut out so the polyaxial screw was a completely new concept designed by yogan harms where the screws could then pivot around and allowed angled placement of the screw so this al allowed a little mal alignment of the rod and actually adjust the screw to the rod as you can see here you don't have to put the screws exactly perpendicular to the rod and therefore the utility of these screws greatly increased and you had this kind of circumferential mobility of the screw with the head and i think all of you have seen this now there was a time when they were only monoaxial screws so how do we actually put these screws it's simple firstly you need to position the patient well to know the direction of the pedicles in all the planes you need an excellent exposure because unless you expose the bone well you can do a hundred bone workshops but you'll never be able to put the screws and ideally the tips of the transverse processes should be exposed both for anatomy as well as for your retractor as well as for the soft tissues to then cover your screws properly you should be able to visualize all your landmarks well and you should also study the ct scans and the x rays to make sure that you are uh you know not missing any anomaly so essentially you have to determine the entry point the direction the length and the thickness that's all you have to determine how do we do it in short 
first you need to find the entry point and then decorticate it either with a nibbler but some people use a high speed burr which is a good idea as well to open the pedicle you then need to ream or drill the pedicle probe it with a fine probe to make sure that everything is correct and use a tap and finally put in the screw and these are the basic instruments which you can see the first one is a pedicle starter which is very sharp but has a collar so it can go only around 15 millimeters inside after that you have different si types of probes to probe the pedicle and you have these ball tip probes which are straight and angled to study the walls of the pedicle and finally you have the tap to cut in the threads and the screwdriver so the key to correct pedicle screw placement is identification of anatomic landmarks very very important you can use fluoro or navigation and there are certain rules which i'm going to talk about for the thoracic spine so to get the entry point you need to know the exact landmarks so you need to look at the transverse process you need to look at the facet joint and the medial lamina line so once you identify these you are on a good wicket and then your entry point is somewhere here which we'll talk about in a minute so again when you dissect the whole landmarks the lamina the transverse process and the facet joint has to be well demarcated this is a cadaveric specimen what you need to understand is what is around so medially are uh, is the csf and the dural sleeve but laterally more important in the thoracic spine are the visceral structures especially the vascular structures like the aorta and you must understand that these vertebrae are small and hard shaped so you have to converge properly Lenkek put a superior facet rule so what he said is that you have to be lateral to the superior articular facet of the midline at all levels you have to be lateral and that's the only safe window because if you're medial you are going to have a medial breach so this is very very important to avoid penetration into the canal the problem is the actual because the pedicles point differently at various levels the pedicle angle as it is called so you know for instance t12 t1 t2 and t3 are straight ahead so for that your entry point is at the midpoint of the transverse process but consequently t789 are very much pointing down and therefore the entry point is more superior so you need to a little know this it's it's not very important what you need to know is that t12 is straight ahead and that t789 are the worst they are the most angled so therefore there are these charts which show the starting point in relation to the midpoint of the transverse process and you can you know you can have this chart with you if you want to do it initially but over a period of time you learn how to do it so what you do is you get your entry point and you enter from the safe point and you make your entry point from there and what you do is you use a nibbler or a burr to decorticate that entry point so that opens the bleeding bone and having done that you use this which is the all to make the entry point and it has a guard so it goes only that much so you won't diverge it after this you tend to put k wires to take some kind of radiological imaging if you want or sometimes not Next, you look at the direction of the pedicle screw and the thoracic pedicle screw, there are two types. There is the so-called anatomical because the pedicle points downwards. So these go along the pedicle like this and point downwards. Or then there's the straight ahead or the straight forward, also known as the surgical, which is straight ahead. But as you can see, at one point, it is very close to the inferior border here. It's very close. But those roots in the thoracic spine are not that important. Of course, if you irritate it, you will get pain, but there is no neurological deficit. So the straight ahead or the surgical is a better one because it is a 39% increase in strength over the anatomical one because it goes into the end. Plane. The other issue is the convergence. So how do you really negotiate that? And for that, the lengthy probe is important. And we can see the lengthy probe over there. This is the shape. It is sharp. It has a square shaft, but it is angled. And what you do is, firstly, you point the tip laterally. So this prevents medial perforation. After the first 20 millimeters, you have passed the canal. You turn it around by 180 degrees and point it medially so that your thing goes medially. So that is the way to use this lengthy probe and we'll show it to you in the cadaveric workshop. So that's the lengthy probe. And initially you point it medially till you go around 20 millimeters. And after that, you turn it by 180 degrees inside. But here we're going to take it out and show you what we do. So that was medial and then you turn it laterally and the rest of the journey you continue laterally so that i'm sorry it's the other way around first it's medial and then it's lateral i'm really sorry about that first it's medial and then it is lateral 
after that you use the tap and you can tap it through at least most of the way you tap it through here is an interesting statistic so if you do an under tapping if you tap the same size as the screw uh, versus under tapping if you under tap it by one millimeter you get a 93 percent increase in strength so therefore use a smaller tap than the actual screw and you can do fluoroscopy but in scoliosis it becomes difficult to visualize and then you put the screw so this is another concept where you can put the pedicle screw the way the pedicle is supposed to be but there is another way which is in out in where you use the ribs so if, if the pedicle is deformed or exceedingly thin you use the rib cortices as well so you enter slightly laterally and you get multiple cortices purchase this is a little risky for a pneumothorax but it gives a very good hold and increases the strength by as much as 70 percent the pedicle width is also important to see and as you can see the pedicle is the narrowest at t4 so t4 t5 t6 are the narrowest pedicles and surprisingly at t1 t2 t3 again the pedicle width increases and at t12 11 t10 the pedicle width is pretty good the same thing with the pedicle angles they have there's a wide variety of change in the pedicle angles and t1 t2 t3 are quite convergent the next is your depth of penetration so if you have 80 percent penetration it gives you the best cutout it gives you a 32.5 percent better cutout than smaller screws and the reason is that there is something known as a neurocentral junction which you have to pass uh, because people tend to put shorter screws because they're scared of perforation but you have to pass this neurocentral junction to get a 75% more pullout strength. How do you verify this? Firstly, the probe and the field where you find the five walls of the vertebra. You put a K wire and do an X ray if at all it's possible, or an image intensifier. Electrophysiology, triggered EMGs, is another good way of finding out whether there's a pedicle breach because the impedance of your stimulus will change if there's a pedicle breach, and that gives you a good concept. And finally, if you do have image guidance or an O-arm, then there's nothing like it. What about salvage? The problem is these pedicle screws can fail. And if you put the same size screw again, your strength or torque decreases by 34%. But by increasing your screw diameter by even two millimeter, you can increase the torque. Increasing the length doesn't seem to have much of a role. But you can change the trajectory because, as you know, there is straightforward and anatomical. So you can just change the trajectory and put in another screw for failed pedicle. Alternatively, you can use other things. In fact, hooks are very good. Hooks give 60 to 74 percent more augmentation rather than screws. And we have been using wires, which is not studied here. Revision screws, same size, are 34 percent less. But if you use thicker sizes, it's 8.5 percent more. And if you put cement, there's a 300% increase, but I don't like using cement. That's another story altogether. Different trajectories, you can still get a stronger screw. What about complications? Perforation, like root injury or irritation, dural injury or CSF leak, and vessel injury, which could be fatal. Pull out, breakage, and prominence. Sometimes you can get prominence. So even this in a decent looking lateral x-ray, in AP, you can see all the screws are out and dangerous and actually have no hold whatsoever you can see how much damage these screws could cause the learning points today is that the thoracic pedicles have variable shapes and hence anatomy is the key the knowledge of anatomy most pedicles however point down and converge the body is heart shaped so don't diverge you'll damage something probing the pedicle is important and the use of the lengthy probe i will repeat this time since i made a mistake last time the first one is lateral because you don't want to go medially so you first point the tip laterally for the first 20 millimeters then you turn it around and turn it medially so it goes into the vertebral body so that's how the lengthy probe is used do a radiological verification and you will get a better hold if you use the surgical trajectory or the straightforward one if you use longer screws and if you under tap them by one millimeter thank you very much and of course if there are any questions i will be uh, Happy to answer them. Greetings from Dr. Samir Dalvi from Mumbai. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a detailed uh, talk about the thoracic pedicle insertion. Uh, so uh, anyway, we're going to... So I just want to, again, because I think, you know, I am really, I have got a very bad flu and my mind is not in place. So I'm just going to again say that, that the lengthy probe, right? The first 20 millimeter, you point it laterally. So that's the medial perforation. 
Can you turn it around by 180 degrees and medial? Right. Correct. And then medial after that. Right. So this is a gear shift what Dr. Samir Dalvi is describing. Sir, uh, do you use uh, the any particular lengthy probe for the all lumbar and thoracic or your pedicle, uh, the lengthy uh, 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 changes to the smaller size when you are doing a thoracic screw? Is it the same one uh, for the all the levels? Hello. Yeah, I think you, you are getting disconnected. Hello. Hello. Bushan? Uh, yes, sir, sir is there. He is connected and is even unmute. I think Gautam Maybe sir is there. Is there. Uh, I think we'll uh, give the question to... Uh, welcome, Gautam sir, for the... Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I think there was a disconnection. I'm going to try and log on. He's back. Phone He's back. You can ask me that question again. I think you can hear me. So, uh, is the lengthy probe that you described the the gear shift uh, is the same size for the both uh, thoracic screw and the lumbar screw, or uh, uh, or do you change? Yeah, it but it is smart? basically uh, designed for the thoracic uh, screw. Right, right, okay. And so, yeah. a lot of times, most of the cases there uh, commonly you see is the thoracic cox and. The entry wall is a lot of time destroyed, or there's already existing abscess. So, how do you go about deciding the uh, the the screw length? Because you describe very nicely anatomical and straight on trajectory. So, how do you decide when there's an anterior void in the bodies? Right, right. No, 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 I mean, you, you have to make sure that you don't get into an anterior void. And uh, I you know, ball, 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 one second. I think there's a mix up. Bushan, can you mute the? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 that's my problem. That's my problem. Just one second. There's a double voice coming up. Better? Better? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So, so, the thing is that uh, I, I use a ball tip probe first rather than use a sharp instrument. And very yeah. often that goes through the. It's uh, doubling the sound. Pedicle. Going the sound. Probably you have kept the speaker on or something like that. So, I have muted one of the account uh, can sir speak now okay now you're now you're gonna so it should work yeah yeah okay yes. tell me next question so question was the dorsal cox there's an anterior vertebral body destruction and uh the when we try to get the length the anterior cortex is kind of a destroyed in a tuberculosis of spine so how how does the length and how do you go about it so, so i, I use just a ball to throw Right. right. Rather After than use a sharp, and I go slowly but surely, making sure that there is no anterior. And the ball tip probe has markings. Right, right. But you don't get a good anterior wall feel because of destruction. So do you uh, use a smaller than the what anticipate uh, at the adjacent level? Because definitely, yeah, definitely. So like I see, uh, we the, the screw has to cross the pedicle this junction. So 35, 30, 35 is fine. I think what. Uh, Again, his voice getting probably he wants to say that yeah. major emphasis. Solve, solve the problem. So major emphasis the purchase is in the pedicle. Uh, if you uh, uh, the vertebral body purchase is important, but it's not as important as you have a good uh, purchase in the pedicle. So it's uh, uh, in a tuberculosis when there's an anterior wall destroyed, you should not go uh, too much anterior yeah, and the longer screw. Yeah, yeah, sir. Come on. It was a speaker actually. Yeah, sorry. So. Uh... So that it is a problem, but I think more important than the anterior wall is the lateral wall, which is important because you often forget that the uh, vertebra is heart shaped. And uh, as a result, you perforate the lateral wall and the lateral wall. I'm terrified of perforating the lateral wall and hitting a vessel because if it just bleeds in the pleura, you know, you can actually lose the patient or, you know, the, the, there's a slow bleed or something. So the lateral wall is very, very important. So most of the times, especially in disease conditions, although we have shown lengthy probe, we use that more for the solid bones. But otherwise, what I try nowadays to do is I use a ball tip probe and try to sort of probe my way through the, uh, sort of ream my way through the pedicle with that. And second point uh, is the 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 inside out, uh, I, I mean the in out in technique to the right. So, so uh, how frequently do you have to, uh, 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 if you get a breach, do you straight on go or you just skip? Yeah, so exactly. So it is not my, it is not my technique of choice. Uh, this is a lecture, so I have to teach everything. Uh, it's not my technique of choice. I will still try and put a normal pedicle screw. Very rarely I feel then you start slightly laterally and go through that. But I still worry about getting a pleural injury with that. If it has been well described, definitely described, and you can get many cortices, etc. 
but it is not my uh, it is not my fixation of choice i will not by choice say that let me put in in out it right it's just a description right and sir uh, do you prefer any time a bicortical purchase especially when you have a compromise hold just getting a intercortex purchase or you never you know, uh, you know i would not again i would not aim for it because you never know how far out it will be but if i if it's slightly long it's okay see the the other issue is that when you're using 2d imaging when you're using crms you cannot make out really because the screw which may seem adequately length is actually out laterally it's only if you do a ct post op that you land up with the problem so i think just passing the neurocentral junction and going and being somewhere in the anterior third or middle third of the vertebra i'm happy enough right i i would not aim for a bicortical hold in a, a thoracic vertebra sir so you already described the gear shift this is a basic course so lot of beginners they have a, 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 a anxiety with respect to the the trajectory of the screw so you describe the medial lateral how do you go about the cephalocaudal is there any reference landmark like opposite how do you go about when you are passing a thoracic screw in the proximal thoracic spine for a beginner so point? i think uh, see one of the things is that you should see the how the lamina lies you should see how the because you know there there cannot be a standard description because some patients are in more kyphosis some patients are hypokyphotic some have an acute kyphosis they may have like this sort of a kyphosis so you have to see how the lamina lies but what what i do is that even though uh, you know an ap x ray may sometimes be confusing a lateral x ray is often visualized so you what i do is i just take the starter first and then put in a k wire or something so in the lateral view i do get an idea of how the uh, pedicle lies so the cephalocaudoid uh, thing we can just look at the crm and then do right as well but you must also remember that if you are doing uh, you know if you are doing the so called anatomical screw then your screw has to point slightly downwards because the pedicle actually points a little down right there is a question from dr umang yes please go ahead with question uh, uh samir sir your techniques for t1 t2 screws like the the upper dorsal screws they are somehow i have always found them to be the most difficult ones so uh, what is your uh, take on like uh, any so actually t1 t2 is very easy actually t1 t2 is very easy because one thinks is difficult but actually t1 t2 is very easy because these are nearly uh, they are straight ahead but convergent pedicles and the i i actually use the although lengthy as said lateral but i use the midpoint of the facet joint so i look at the facet joint either the c7 t1 or the t1 t2 and just below the tip of that i get the entry point and like i told you what i normally do is i don't really use the lengthy probe i use the ball tip probe to try and find the way out and usually this t1 t2 very often we combine with the cervical i don't think it's part of the cervical spine the other instrument which i use is the one which we use to pass lateral mass screws which is a guarded drill so when that guarded drill you can just go on increasing the thing by 2 to 4 mm each time so that you know you are not perforating so i will first do 10 mm then i'll increase it then 20 mm then i'll again check then you know 25 mm so that that's how you make sure that you're not going out but t1 t2 don't be scared actually those pedicles are quite big t1 and t2 are quite big pedicles they are not in fact if, if you need to be worried about you need to worry about t4 that is the smallest pedicle t4 is the most difficult to get i think dr gautam sir is also there uh, welcome gautam sir uh, how how are your tips with respect to the thoracic uh, screw especially in the mid thoracic and proximal thoracic screw sir how do you decide the trajectories i think pretty much what samir said i don't think it's very different uh, in the upper thoracic spine the positioning of the patient is extremely difficult in the initial days i used to use the shoulder pull down i mean you know with the hands next to but then you can't see the t3 t4 very well so nowadays what i do is that i put the patient whenever i'm doing an upper thoracic spine then i put the patient's head on a horseshoe that gives me an ability to expose much better and i place the hand almost like this below so then i get exposure all the way up to t2 t3 on my lateral x ray i don't depend on the ap x ray anyway so it's not something which concerns me about the ap x ray it is the lateral x ray where, where i want to see what i am doing once i have exposed i always expose up to the uh, tip of the tra transverse processes there are two methods of putting screws in the medial lateral plane is option is what samir just described and that is that you take the midpoint of the facet joint and just go below that midpoint in which case your medial lateral angulation is far lesser and this becomes very useful when you are putting cervical lateral mass screws and then extending the fixation into the thoracic spine 
then the screws get beautifully aligned. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the second option is what Lenke suggested, which is what I more commonly use because most of the time the disease is in the upper to mid thoracic spine where <clears throat> you take a more lateral entry point at the base of the transverse process near the pars and then you have to angulate it far more medially. Mm -hmm. The medial angulation in the upper thoracic spine is almost, at T1, it's almost 30 degrees. And at T2, T3 is also 25, 30 degrees. The cephalocardal direction is essentially parallel to the, perpendicular to the lamina. So you go perpendicular to the lamina and that is the way you'll land up in the proper place. Because I'm positioning the patient so I can usually see T2, T3 quite well. So once T2, T3, I know the screw is going in a proper direction. The T1 is usually almost parallel or slightly one or two degrees uh, cephalocardal to that. So that's how I do at T2 and T2, T3. T4, T5, T6 are standard screws except for what Samir mentioned that T4 and T5 have a very narrow pedicle and you have to be actually more careful at T4, T5 than you have to be at T4, uh, T1, T2, T3. Uh, the only place where I differ from Samir, which probably is a little bit more dangerous, what I do, and that is pri primarily because nowadays we are getting more and more patients with severely osteoporotic spines, and is that I do take bicortical hold in the thoracic spine on occasions. So generally, when you are taking a bicortical hold in these osteoporotic spines, what you do is you, with your lengthy probe, you are going and feeling the anterior wall, whatever it is, and measuring the depth of your screw. And then you take the same size screw. I don't try to put a longer screw. But when I seat it, it gently goes and cuts across the anterior cortex. So that you you are, you are got a purchase in the anterior cortex, but it's hardly one or two millimeters beyond that. It's not much more beyond that. This can, as unless you use an OAM or something, this cannot be precise. And Samir is absolutely right. You may have broken through the lateral cord wall. You might injure the vessels. Having said that, uh, having put more than a few thousand screws in the thoracic spine, some of them have been, a lot of them have been bicortical recent times. We've not had this so far. I suppose it's only a matter of time that we'll have some problem. Right. And my questions to both of you, uh, diameter, uh, do you s are set with a specific diameter like 4.5 beyond T4, 5.5 or 6.5 uh, to both first Dr. Gautam and Dr. Samir thereafter? So all the way up to about T8, I'm happy putting in 6.5 screws. Then at T5, uh, from T8 to T4 is usually 5.5. At T1, T2, T3, it's around 4.5 to 5 mm screws is what I use. Samir. Yeah, I, I think the same answer as uh, Gautam. You can peacefully use six six point five millimeter screws below D eight, and uh, five point five is is good enough throughout. Five point five millimeter screws are good. Okay, sir. So I would like both of you to stay uh, stay back. I am gonna have a new talk by Dr. Gautam Zaveri. How to do a transpedicular decompression, and thereafter again we're gonna take questions on, on the same this both topics. So, okay. Dr. Bhushan, can you play Dr. Gautam sir's uh, talk? Yes. Surgery for lesions within the thoracic spine was generally performed either through a direct posterior approach or through an anterior transthoracic approach. The disadvantage of the direct posterior approach was that most thoracic pathology is anterior, that is within the vertebral body, whether it be tuberculosis, tumors, fractures, or degenerative conditions. And therefore, there is a need to decompress the spinal cord from anterior and to reconstruct the anterior column. And this was not possible through the direct la posterior laminectomy approach. It was in 2002, 2003 that I started using the posterior lateral approach.
in preparing the PPT. Step one in the posterior lateral approach is it involves a standard posterior midline exposure. The more lateral you want to go with your decompression, the more is the lateral exposure that is required. Once an adequate exposure has been achieved, then one in needs to insert the pedicle screws. Typically, I like, like to insert a minimum of two screws above and two screws below the diseased area. If the bone is osteoporotic, which is not uncommon in patients with chronic inflammatory diseases like tuberculosis, then I might use uh, screws up to about three or four levels above the diseased or and below the disease area too. Having inserted the screw, the next step is to assemble the rod on one side. The rod is assembled initially in order to prevent vertebral body translation. In patients who have significant vertebral destruction anteriorly, there is a loss of continuity of the anterior column cephalad and caudad to the lesion. And therefore, there is a risk that when you start doing your decompression, the vertebral body may, uh, in, of the cephalad column may translate anteriorly, resulting in spinal cord injury. The other advantage of assembling the rod is that it prevents excessive forces being transmitted to the spinal cord during the debridement and decompression procedures. However, just beware that you must try to contour this initial rod to the patient's kyphosis to prevent posterior translation because the two columns are not in continuity often. When you, if you hypokyphose the rod and then try to reduce the rod to the proximal screws, the entire posterior column tends to, uh, cephalad column tends to get pulled posterior. The next step is to decide the amount of decompression that is necessary. If the disease is localized to one side and the decompression only on one side is required, then a hemilaminectomy may be all that is required. However, if as in this case, there is extensive compression which is involving both sides of the spine, then a laminectomy may be needed in order to achieve an adequate decompression. Once you've done the central decompression, it is time to perform the posterolateral approach. There are three different corridors which are progressively lateral. The first corridor is the corridor of the transfacetal and transpedicular approach. The second corridor is the corridor of the costotransectomy approach. And the third corridor is one of the lateral extracavitary approach. Let me tell you about each of these approaches individually. The transfacetal approach is performed when the disease is primarily localized in the disc space or it involves just minimum paradiscal destruction of the vertebral body. Here, the facet joint on one side is excised and the cord is then circumvented and the anterior column is approached from the posterolateral direction. Here is an elegant video showing you the same. So you can see the exposure. Now the post superior, uh, inferior facet of the superior vertebra, which lies posteriorly, is excised. The next step is to drill and excise the superior facet of the inferior vertebra, which lies anterior to the uh, its corresponding facet. Having adequately thinned out the facet, a blunt hook is used to enter into the spinal canal and then the remaining bone as well as ligamentum flavum is excised. As you excise this tissue, you can see the spinal cord is now coming into the picture. Your decompression continues. And once the adequately you've removed all the tissue from the posterior and posterolateral portion, you can now approach the disc space and there you can see the pus coming out. And now debridement 
and excision of the infective granulation tissue, sequestrated disc, and any sequestrated bone. With this, you can achieve an adequate decompression anterior, lateral, and posterior to the cord at the level of the disc and maybe about half a centimeter above and below. So there you can see adequate decompression. The cord is absolutely free. The next approach to know is the transpedicular approach. When the disease involves a vertebral body and there is destruction of the vertebral body, one needs to reconstruct the anterior column. Then one needs to excise the disc above that vertebral body, the disc below that vertebral body, and the entire vertebral body itself. Here, the transpedicular approach is used. The lam excising the lamina either in totality or a partial laminectomy is done from the level of the pedicle above the uh, vertebral body which is pathological to the pedicle of the vertebral body below the entire lateral pillar of the thoracic spine is removed along with that the pedicle at the level of the pathology is amputated so that one can then enter anteriorly to decompress and debride the de de decompress and debride so here is a video which shows you how the whole thing is done. You can see over here that the, this is the pedicle above, this is the pedicle screw below. So the entire lateral pillar has been removed. This is the pedicle of the pathological level. This is the spinal cord, which has been decompressed adequately by using a hemilaminectomy approach. In a costotransversectomy approach, in addition to the excision of the lamina and the pedicle, one excises the rib, in fact, the medial third of the rib, including the rib head, in order to be able to achieve a better posterolateral approach to the anterior column of the spine. This approach is especially useful when approaching or performing surgery in the upper and mid thoracic spine where there are fixed ribs and where the vertebral bodies are triangular and, re and doing an anterior column reconstruction is far more difficult than in the lower thoracic spine. Once one has removed and uh, done or uh, excised the posterolateral pillar, now it is time to decide whether you require additional room to achieve the anterior column decompression. And here you have to decide whether you would like to just trace and release the nerve root or sacrifice the nerve root on one side. I generally prefer to sacrifice the nerve root. The nerve root is tied in the preganglionic area and excised, and then the nerve root is you retracted using a small mosquito which is on the opposite side so that the, we get adequate room in the posterolateral corner. Usually, I have no compunction in sacrificing up to three roots unilaterally because I have not seen any vascular injury because of this. Once you've de 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 sacrificed the root, time to do the anterior debridement and decompression through the posterolateral approach. So you can see now, there is hardly any, there is no retraction because you're going anterolateral or posterolateral to the cord and approaching the anterior column. Once the anterior debridement and decompression is done, the plan is to do an anterior column reconstruction if it is necessary. There are various different methods of doing it. When the lesion is predominantly peridiscal with neurological deficit, there is minimum deformity, minimum destruction, the spine has already collapsed into a stable position. All I do is I go in through a transfacetal or even a transpedicular approach, decompress the spinal cord, do minimal debridement so as not to destabilize the spine further, and then stabilize the spine inside tube. In some patients, 
where we've done a laminectomy, a bilateral facetectomy in order to achieve a circumferential decompression of the spinal cord. When there is more bone loss and more deformity, we can shorten the spinal columns so that the dis distance between the cephaloid column and the caudal column is reduced and the patient gets an adequate decompression, correction of deformity along with a good stabilization. However, you must remember that excessive shortening must be avoided because it can cause vascular compromise. Another method of anterior column reconstruction is by using cages. If the disease is confined only to the level of the disc, you can reconstruct using a T-lift cage. Or if the disease is far more extensive, debridement and decompression can be achieved using a more extensive, after extensive corpectomy, a mesh cage in order to stabilize the spine. So here is an example of a patient in whom we have used a mesh cage. You can see there is a, the cord has been completely decompressed and now bone graft is being placed in the posterolateral corner through the posterolateral approach into the intervertebral space. And now a mesh cage packed with bone graft is being slid in. You have to be careful to come from the posterolateral approach so that the cord is not retracted unnecessarily or injured. The cage is gently slid in and then it is stamped into its proper position. This is how it looks like at the end of the procedure. Once that has been done, the rod is assembled on the opposite side and compression is up applied between the two screws closest to the site of pathology in order to wedge the cage into position or to shorten the columns. Finally, you check your decompression because after compression, sometimes the lamina of the vertebra below can impinge on the spinal cord. When there is shortening, the spinal cord may bulge backwards, also causing a uh, iatrogenic compression. So at the very end of your procedure, make a check the decompression. If it's not adequate, you may have to remove a little bit more of the lamina. You can see a beautiful decompression there. And the last step in the procedure is to do a posterior fusion. So here we have removed the spinous processes. The dura is protected with a gel foam piece and then are using an osteotome. The, slab, the laminae are decorticated. Local material is used, to, is overlaid over the posterior mass in order to achieve a fusion. So finally, why a posterior approach? A posterolateral approach is useful because although most pathology is within the vertebral body anterior to the spinal cord, in the thoracic spine, it is extremely dangerous to retract the spinal cord. Patient would land up with neurologic deficits. The anterior approach, which is the transthoracic approach, has many limitations. In a patient with tuberculosis, there could be adherence between the pleura and the lung causing pleural lung tears. Patients may require ICU. There is a risk of vascular injury. The vertebral bodies anteriorly are far more osteoporotic. The hold is in cancellous bone rather than in the cortical bone of the pedicle. So there are multiple reasons why the posterior approach or the posterolateral approach is preferred over the anterior approach. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam, sir, for a very detailed talk. I think he has described in nutshell uh, about the transfacetal, transpedicular, and extra cavitary approach for doing this decompression. Uh, uh, sir, sir you, uh, though you already shown the uh, video on how to go selectively about it, but there's a lot of uh, concern and 
questions in a beginner that how much is the decompression one should do and when to do an anterior body reconstruction with a cage or a graft or this so what is your uh, 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 landmark that here i'm going to do an anterior body reconstruction because paradiscal lesion yes you should so beautifully the cage placement can be done but when there's a vertebral body destruction along with it significantly is it always necessary to put a cage inside so <clears throat> as far as you mentioned two things decompression and fusion so these are two different things the decompression is basically a procedure where you are removing the pressure on the cord so that in patients with neurologic deficit now decompression here will involve two aspects to it one is the posterior aspect and one is the anterior aspect the posterior aspect is can be a hemilaminectomy or a laminectomy i don't think that it makes a big deal as a newcomer i would always advise youngsters to do a proper laminectomy don't try to be fancy you are anyway putting screws above and below so you are not destabilizing more by doing a laminectomy so don't bother about doing fancy surgery do better do simple surgery which can pre produce good results in your hands the more difficult thing is the anterior decompression especially in tuberculosis there is a lot of granulation tissue etc which causes the posterior annulus to and uh, the posterior lung ligament to bulge and it is hard tissue so you have to gently after you finished your laminectomy after you've done the transfacetal or the transpedicular approach whichever you have chosen to perform then comes the time when you reach the posterior wall of the vertebral body the level of the posterior annulus and the pll here you gently dissect the dural sac from all the tissue behind that and then once you have dissected it then gradually using a scoop you push all that tissue anteriorly into the void which is there in the vertebral body and disc space and decompress that then remove it with a disc sponge so you have to make sure the most important compression to remove is the anterior compression people think that they've done a laminectomy that's enough that's not enough you have to do a proper anterior decompression in these patients so that is the first thing now then comes the question of reconstruction so as i mentioned <clears throat> in the good old days we were taught that you should do aggressive debridement and remove as much of disease tissue pus etc as possible because so that the disease load is reduced on the antibiotics today that theory has gone out of the window today we do a limited debridement only enough to decompress the spinal cord the more you debride the bigger the defect you create anteriorly and the bigger the defect you create anteriorly more the need for anterior column reconstruction so if you saw the first example i gave this patient already had a collapse where the vertebra above and vertebra below were the disease were localized to only the disc space and a little maybe a few millimeters on either side in the paradiscal space the vertebrae had collapsed and they were touching each other like this when the vertebrae were touching each other they are already stabilized my job here was not necessarily to do much as far as that part is concerned my job was to decompress so once i decompress the canal i just stabilized it in situ i did not try to distract or anything just left it alone giving a mild kyphosis about 7 to 8 degree like over the natural kyphosis in that area would have been okay so this patient did very well now the second type of patient is somewhere where you have done a 360 degree decompression so you have removed bilateral passage because there was severe compression on both sides so there is a proximal column there is a distal column now suppose there is a proximal and distal column the disc and the disease is restricted to again the disc space and maybe 4 5 mm above and 4 5 mm below the disc space then it's a total of 12 to 13 mm tomita in his studies has shown that up to 12 to 13 mm of vertebral shortening does not affect the blood flow to the spinal cord and therefore if the if you've done this kind of a procedure i prefer to shorten the vertebral column rather than trying to go for a reconstruction because if you trying to reconstruct then again it is the question of whether it will fuse or not whether the cage will stay into play place or not so all these problems are there so here i generally shorten the spinal column bring bone on to bone and leave it at the end of the shortening you must always make sure that the lamina is not digging into the spinal cord because that can cause a neurologic deficit later on because of the compression so that if it is digging in just do a little additional laminectomy 
I think now very important. Group of patients whom you have done only a unilateral approach. You have done a unilateral hemilaminectomy, unilateral facetectomy, or pedic transpedicular approach. Now, in these patients, if the disease is localized only to the level of the disc space, then all you have to do is reconstruct. You cannot do shortening because the opposite facet is intact. So here, if you cannot do shortening, you can use a T-lift cage. Usually, the T-lift cage, if there is an adjacent vertebral body, is slightly involved. The cage size I typically use is a 14 millimeter cage and then shorten over it a little bit, about two millimeters of shortening and that wedges the cage in. And the final thing is if the whole vertebral body is destroyed, you can see there is nothing anteriorly, then you use a mesh cage to reconstruct it. I think very, very wise word. Tuberculosis is a medical disease and, and Dr. Gautam just highlighted that you should not be very radically aggressive with respect to debridement because everything will come out in your hand. So one has to do a debridement, enter debridement, which is compressing on a cord. Dr. Samit Dalvi, uh, I, again, I would like to take his opinion. Uh, when do we, he do, does an enter a column reconstruction with a mesh cage and does he use a mesh cage or a tricortical graft? Any particular preference for that? So uh, the thing is that uh, for starters, there is one little uh, disagreement which I have with Gautam in, in his technique. So I very rarely do a laminectomy when I'm doing a transpedicular decompression. Yeah, unless there is posterior compression or there is posterior soft tissue, which was shown in his one MRI, which he showed, where there's a posterior epidural abscess, that's a different story. But if I'm doing a transpedicular, I would usually keep the lamina intact. And of course, you can't do it if you're doing shortening. But again, I don't do as much shortening as he does. Uh, the, I keep the lamina intact. I keep the midline intact. And I keep the opposite facet intact. And I go completely from one side. Because... A transpedicular decompression reconstruction is actually an anterior surgery. It is just done through a posterior approach, a posterior skin incision. So you go lateral and you remove uh, all of that and then go to the front. So all of that of mine will always be intact. So you will so always remove one. Sorry? So you will have to remove the rib because you are not going to do a laminectomy and you want to excel. Yeah, the, the costotransfer junction. Yes, costotransfer junction. So there's the pedicle. Uh, cost to transfer junction the whole thing. So I get a full sort of a, I, I go in like this, you know, like this. I get that full. Regarding the reconstruction, obviously, you see everything, you must remember at the end of the day, you have to know your biology, you have to know your mechanics, and you have to know your biomechanics. So it is not only mechanics, because there is biology involved, there's going to be a fusion. And it's not only biology, you have to give some mechanical stability. So you have to assess. So what he gave as a very long answer, which is also the correct answer. But I think other, over, overall, you have to assess what is your intrinsic stability. How long will that intrinsic stability hold and how long will it take for the fusion to take place? Now, suppose you, are, you have a situation where you are, you are showing an asymmetric destruction in the vertebra. Everything is only on the left. The right side full vertebra is intact, disc is intact, and your posterior elements are intact. And you just have a cavity which you take out. You can even just pack with bone graft if you want to, right? But if everything is removed to the other side, everything is unstable. If in your pre-op sitting x-ray, everything is collapsed. And then when you fix it, everything opens. It means that there's a gap anteriorly. And that gap needs support. Now that support has to be there till the fusion takes place. A tricortical bone graft is good. But a cage is a little better because you can tailor it. You can increase the size. You can decrease the size. The other thing, you can push it in. You can compress on it so that it uh, edges inside. And in fact, what I really like now are some of these expandable cages. So, you know, the problem is putting the cage. It's I, I, I see some of these people like even your, you know, Gautam and Gore Gaukar who put very big cages from the post lateral, but I am not being able to put such big cages. I get a little worried. Of course, you can uh, ligate the roots. So these expandable cages would be a very good idea where you put in smaller cage and then expand it inside because rather than put a loose cage, it is better to not put a cage. If you're putting a cage which is loose, it's a disaster because the whole thing will tilt, it will walk out and you have even worse problems. So if you put a cage, it should be well-fitting and it, it requires talent for that. If you have an expandable cage, nothing like it. But yes, anterior defects have to be reconstructed and you have to pack them with bone graft as well. Even the intra-body defects. Sometimes there's an intra-body defect, which you know you see in the X-ray, it has collapsed. But when you do, you open and you just put the middle. So the upper and lower discs are intact. I put a cage inside it, what, we, what, what we've been calling as cage plasty, and I think Agnivesh is going to write on it. We've done around 30, 30, 40 odd cases on that. Where we put in the cage inside just to keep the upper and the lower end plate uh, showed up and pack it with bone graft. So you get a full vertebral body formed around that cage again. So intra-body cage, you mean, right? Intra-body cage. So you need to balance the mechanics and the bio. So it is not only mechanical because it's going to fuse eventually. Right? Right. 
so I, 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 other thing is that the the when you do a reconstruction the the rod contouring is there any specific way or you just give a thoracic kyphosis and it's specific uh, tip on that particular thing so see i i think unless you're really doing some aggressive kind of correction i am usually happy with the correction which is achieved by the positioning and if that is so if that is so then your contouring should be how your screws lie because if you then do excess see a lot depends on the situation you have to you i can't give you one answer for everything for instance, suppose you put in screws and the patient is osteoporotic and you put in an under contoured rod. What will happen is when you're tightening everything, the screws will only pull out. So you don't want to do that. You want to support the system and get your fusion. So then you need to contour it to how much ever it is. If you're doing a kyphosis correction, then of course you correct it to the level which you want to do, provided your screw holds are good. Right? So that's the thing. But across the dorsal lumbar junction, it's usually a straight rod. You try to put in little kyphosis. And if you are going a long like from dorsal to lumbar, then you need to put in both. You need to put in a little lumbar lordosis and a little thoracic kyphosis. The point is, don't try to forcibly correct with the rod. Correct as much as possible with just the position. Gautam said you showed very nicely in the dorsal lumbar junction. Most of the pathologies are located. Suppose you get a fracture, where you have to do a decompression, and the detail is kind of kindly inferiorly angulated with a lot of kyphosis. So, are there any tricks to cover? Because a lot of these cases do present late. So. Do you always use a polyaxial screw or you would use a mono and get a correction and then align it? How do you get that angulation correct? You are talking about a post-traumatic kyphosis. Traumatic kyphosis. We delayed the acute During the acute stage or coronary? Delayed. Late delayed. After three or four weeks with a kyphosis in a D12L1 area, the patient is presenting with a disc uh, uh, injury with some uh, fracture dislocation component. Wow. So, if the patient comes to me early, I rarely ever try to distract. I always try to compress in order to reduce the dislo to decomp to do achieve my decompression as well as to achieve correction of kyphosis. And by compressing, what I find is that the end plates come closer to each other. So the chances of failure of the implant, even even if I use a short seg segment implant, is much lesser. When it comes in the subacute stage or a chronic stage, this thing, then you must understand that now the bone, this is the difference between a disc and a spinal stenosis now. In a disc, yes. you will deal with the disc and the decompression, do the discectomy. In a stenosis, you are doing an indirect decompression by doing a laminectomy. So if a patient comes to me, often my plan is to do a decompression there and then try to achieve a correction for the kyphotic deformity as and when I, whether it can be done directly because the bone is slightly mobile or if I may have to do osteotomy, that's a different matter altogether. On the other hand, so that is the plan. The plan is that, you know, you've done a laminectomy in this patient, the laminectomy, now that is, you are not bothered about the anterior compression per se because your laminectomy, this bone is now acting like a stenotic element. It's no longer like an acute disc. So you are do a laminectomy de for decompression. And for your correction, you can use a variety of different things. If it is a flexible kyphosis by positioning or by just putting in your screws, you may be able to get a reduction of the kyphotic deformity. Sometimes you may require an osteotomy depending on that. In If it's already a fused anteriorly, then you may, and it's, the deformity is not so bad, then you might want to uh, do a two-level uh, pontes like osteo two or three level. And just use that for correction of your kyphosis. You will get about 20 to 25 degrees if you do a three-level Pontes osteotomy. So I think that is uh, in post-traumatic kyphosis, I have rarely ever had to resort to major osteotomies like a PSO or anything in order to achieve kyphotic deformity correction. Other thing is a lot of pathologies at D10 level. And now people ask me, I have, I have a pathology at D10 level. I'm going to pass D2 level below the, that is D11 and D12. Shall I stop at D12 or I'll have to go and pass L1 screw? That is another so, common thing which a lot of big... Uh, so this issue, is is your take on this? this issue is mainly concerning when you do long segment fixations, where you are landing up at this issue. When you are doing a one level or two level above and screw below screw fixation, I don't think this is much of an area of concern. So I think happily do two level above and below and stop at D12 or L1 without any problems. I don't think you should be worried about that. And Dr. Samir mentioned about the expandable cage. Do you have concern for the amount of bone graft that you uh, can get into it or, uh, or the now root sacrifice or the other thing? So what is your take on that? So I don't like expandable cages. Expandable cages do not allow you to put adequate bone 
it above and below and when you expand then where does the bone go so most of the bone is outside the cage as it should be and that will help the fusion but the bone inside the cage is not there in an expandable cage so the expandable cage for vertebral body replacement means you have a cage which is this big and you have to fuse outside the cage this big you are worried that some of the graft may then uh you know uh, move backwards and cause compression of the cord so in my book i use expandable cages only in patients who are going to die like metastatic tumors where i am not worried about fusion where the cage is just supposed to hold that area until the patient dies that's where i use expandable cages in tuberculosis and infections i am not happy using expandable cages per se but samir is <clears throat> this thing about putting in a cage a mesh cage which is of a longer this thing is an uh, is a very very valid concern and for that that is the reason why i said that i sacrifice the nerve root very easily mm-hmm. once i have sacrificed the nerve root and i have tied it and put the mosquito on the opposite side the cord turns like this a little bit giving you a nice costolateral corner now if you are going to put a big cage you can also do a little bit of the costotransversectomy which he talked about that gives you even more room anterolaterally to go, go in and put your cage so this cage the if you saw the cage being inserted in the case that i showed that was not my case that is never how i will insert a cage because i do not touch the cord with my cage my the cord is here and my cage goes like this it never goes like this mm-hmm. and <clears throat> generally what you do is you size the cage a lot of people what they do is they put a much smaller cage then you are worried because if you don't get adequate shortening then the cage will not get wedged in what i do is i usually put the cage which is equivalent to the size of the defect and then jam it in with further shortening when you put the cage in usually you will find that the cage is beautiful on a lateral and ap view looking absolutely vertical once you compress it tilts a couple of degrees don't worry why does it tilt it tilts because the end plate superiorly and inferiorly are not uniformly symmetrically flat some places the tb may have destroyed a little bit so the cage has gone when you compress the cage has gone and fixed itself into a position of maximum stability so if the cage instead of being straight up is slightly like this don't worry that's ex- acceptable and that is part of the uh, how this whole procedure is done thank you and, and last question i also problem? just can you hear me yeah, yeah, yeah. i just want to add sorry i logged in through another device where the device was causing a problem so the uh, i i think uh, you know about the expandable cage also i was thought i thought the same thing and i don't use it very usually but i but honestly what one must understand is that the bone graft outside the cage is more important so before i put in the cage i put in a pack in a whole bone graft on the opposite side and anterior the cage i am not sure how much the bone graft fuses through the cage and all of that you know so so we are worried that when if it's a discectomy i understand that you put a tlf cage and graft and that it but in a vertebral body replacement when you are put in a expandable cage the height of the cage is about this much i know you're building a lot of graft anterior are you not hmm. worried the graft will may kind of come backwards that's why no, so no, the graft doesn't move because there is this old thing what dr dheer used to say that it's like putting peanuts in honey you can just put graft and then the, it gets stuck in the clot and that is a bit thing that these grafts will move these chota grafts will not move they get embraced in a clot and then they get caught over there so i don't think they'll move the other thing is that see there is a little difference because in our mind we look at everything at x rays and things there's a difference if you're doing an oblock spondylectomy and removing the entire vertebra and you are leaving only that cage there you are really depending only on the implant in the cage but most of the time what happens is even though we do it there's always a shell of bone which is left around the opposite side the front there is a shell of bone we're not removing the whole thing and that also has osteogenic potential so bone grows in from all the sides from the top and the bottom and it usually stabilizes like i have not really seen failures the things do tend to fuse it looks odd and i always feel that god this is not going to fuse but i have not had fusion failures coming back they do tend to fuse one way or the other like i said you have to respect biology and mechanics once you respect both you do you tend to get results thank you so much for both of you like even to answer your question about whether you want to end at uh, uh, t12 or t12. l1 if you are suppose so it all to... depends no it depends on how osteoporotic the bone is whether two levels are okay this is not a scoliosis where you have to decide to do two levels this that is, is not a scoliosis 
This is no. not a score. This is where you have to decide levels. You have to see how much hold is required for that. So yeah. if you are putting only two above two below, you have to understand that you are only putting two above two below, and you may need to brace or you need to look after. If you have the ability, you put more. Doctor Bhojraj's team uses uh, hard shields, and they do four above and four below. So they have this huge hard shield going from the top to the bottom. So that's that's not the issue. It also depends the setting. The same surgery you are doing in a twenty-five year old versus doing it in an eighty-five year old, right? In an eighty-five year old, it doesn't matter one level more, one level less. You don't want the implant to fail. In a twenty-year-old, yes, you want to save levels. So everything is a setting. There is no one answer to it. It all depends on the circumstance. Okay, point well taken. Thank you, thank you, both of you for a, a, a giving a wonderful demonstration. And I hope to see you both of you on a cadaver day, uh, where we're going to do actual uh, pedicle screw and technique insertion. Uh, I, I I would request you, if possible, to stay back because I know you have other workshop going on. Uh, I'm going to st uh, start the next session, the cervical spine session. Uh, Dr. Bhushan, uh, uh, can you uh, start the first uh, talk by Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Viti Anglalikar has uh, unfortunately has been traveling. So uh, I will start with the first talk, Dr. how to do a cervical corpectomy by Dr. Nandan Marandi. Yes, sir. In Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to ASICON 2024. I'm Dr. Nandan Bharati and today I'll be discussing in brief about anterior approaches to the cervical spine with a focus on cervical carpectomy. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Tushar Rakhod for this opportunity to present my talk. Just like any other surgical procedure, Positioning is of great importance in cervical corpectomy. It is not mandatory to use tongs. However, if you are dealing with a traumatic case or a grossly unstable spine, you can use tongs for stabilization. I like to use a Riles tube in all cases. Intraoperatively, it helps to define position of the esophagus. Postoperatively, it assists during the feeding process. So if you see in this picture, this is how we place our patient in a reverse Trendlenburg position. There are bolsters in between the scapula, bolsters below the knee and ankle. This prevents the patient from sliding off. A roll is placed below the neck so that you get a good lordosis and exposure of the neck. Preferably, the patient has to be positioned on a radiolucent table along with a lateral x-ray of the CM so that you can mark your level. When you are dealing with the subaxial spine, C6, C7 levels, the lower levels, you may have to retract the shoulders inferiorly. This is done with a white tape so that you can mark your level. In terms of the side of incision, I am a right-handed surgeon, so I prefer approaching from the right. Some surgeons do prefer a left-sided approach because the chances of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury are said to be lesser on the left side. Usually, we start off with a transverse skin incision because these transverse incisions are in line with the natural Langer's creases, Langer's lines on the skin. So, postoperatively, you have a more cosmetic result. Despite a transverse incision, the dissection that is carried on henceforth is more or less in a vertical fashion. Multi level fusions, wherein you want a wider exposure, you may have to take a longitudinal skin incision. Before taking the incision, I prefer to mark the level on the lateral x-ray of the C arm. Following that, I infiltrate the incision with a mixture of lignocaine adrenaline that helps in bleeding control and also helps in defining the planes easily. After the skin incision, you will encounter the platysma. So the platysma is to be transected in the line of skin. You will then have the deep cervical fascia. The deep cervical fascia is divided along the anteromedial border of the sternocleidomastoid. So like I said, though your skin incision is horizontal, the dissection further down is more or less in a vertical fashion. At this point, you can put in your index finger and feel the carotid pulse. Just medial to the carotid pulse, you will be directly lying onto the vertebral body. So the dissection henceforth is medial to the carotid sheath. 
the next layer that you encounter is the prevertebral fascia. So the prevertebral fascia is to be cut in a longitudinal fashion. With a peanut, you can then expose it in the vertical direction. So you can see the vertebra and the longus coli muscle. It is easy to identify the levels because with the longus coli, they will join together in the midline at the level of the C2 and therein you can start counting downwards. The longus coli is an important landmark. It also helps in assessing central placement of your anterior reconstruction devices. You then identify and confirm the level on a lateral X-ray. For doing that, I prefer using a spinal needle that is bent 90-90 and that is placed into the disc space. Some surgeons do not like using this method because it may damage the disc level inadvertently in case you are at the long level. After confirming the level, the longus coli muscle is mobilized on both the sides and self-retaining retractors are placed. So there are two self-retaining retractors. If you see in the diagram, they ideally should be hooking below the longus coli so that there is no direct pressure on the esophagus. At this point, we also like to deflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube that reduces the pressure on the esophagus further. The next step for a corpectomy is a discectomy. So you identify disc spaces within the corpectomy level. So cranial and caudal disc has to be identified. You take an 11 number or a 15 number knife on a long handle. Incision is to be made covering the area between the two oncovertebral joints. So the oncovertebral joints are your Lakshman Rekha beyond which there is a chance of injury to the vertebral artery. So the incision is to be made from joint to joint as close to the end plate as possible. You make a nick in the annulus and the nucleus. Discectomy procedure is then completed with a combination of curette, ronger and your disc forcep. Some surgeons like to do this step with a high speed burr. I am more comfortable using curette and disc forceps. You will then reach the end plate. You can run your curette along the end plate. Prepare the end plate nicely till you see the underlying cortical bone. So once you have the disc spaces out, you then proceed to the corpectomy part of it. I like to begin the corpectomy with a nibbler. So using a nibbler, you take in a nice chunk of the bone, which is then a source for your autograft. Once you have your autograft, we take a high speed drill. Remove the vertebral body to the extent that only a thin piece of bone along with the PLL remains behind. This step is crucial. You have to ensure that you stay symmetric to the midline and go wide enough so that there is adequate decompression of the cord. In Indian population, the approximate width of a corpectomy defect is around 18 millimeters. Like I said, the oncovertebral joints are the Lakshman Rekha. If you go beyond that, there is a chance of vascular injury. So bony removal, the ideal corpectomy defect, should be in an Erlenmeyer flask configuration. It is uniform, slightly wide at the posterior level. Two mistakes that are done are, under a microscope, you may have a tendency to tunnel the corpectomy defect or you can drill obliquely. So oblique fashion drilling will also result in inadequate decompression. You are now left with a thin mantle of bone along with the PLL. Take in a 1 mm kerosene punch to remove the PLL and the bone. Go around the margins of the bony decompression and then the entire mantle is removed as a single piece. We then have to start off with the last step that is anterior column reconstruction. You measure the defect of the corpectomy channel with a caliper. There are various options that are available, so you can fashion a bone graft to fit the defect. End plate preparation is crucial, so you can use a curette to make sure that your end plates are nice and clean. You can also put in these Casper pins for distracting the defect temporarily. I prefer leaving a small ledge of bone in the cranial and caudal direction, a 2-3 to mm bony ledge. That makes sure when you are punching in your graft or your cage, it doesn't hit the spinal cord and it nicely and snugly fits inside. You can use distractor pins in the adjacent vertebral bodies. They are slightly distracted to increase the height of exposure. 
Sometimes I ask my assistant to gently tuck on the chin when the graft is being put inside, release the pressure on the chin so that it becomes snugly fitting. My choice of implant is a mesh cage. So this mesh cage can be fashioned to exactly fit your corpectomy defect. It is filled in with auto graft, it takes a good amount of graft. So these are some of the implant options that are available for anterior column reconstructions. There are a wide variation of options available. There are some of my x-rays. The first one you can see it's auto graft from the iliac crest along with a plate and screw construct. The last one is the one which we use most frequently that is a mesh cage with a plate. You also have an interesting implant is an expandable uh, cage with plate construct. So it's a single uh, implant which goes inside. It's quite easy to use, cuts down on few of the steps. The downside is the mesh cage that is here doesn't accommodate any graft at all. So it is just like a metallic spacer device. Once uh, the graft or your mesh cage is in place, we then start off with the plating. For plating, you may have to burr the osteophyte. So there are typically some osteophytes at the cranial and caudal end. The plate is then contoured. A slight degree of lordosis is usually required so that you get an optimum fit of the plate to the spine. Make sure your plate is of the appropriate size. So it should not impinge on the end plate at the cranial or caudal level. Usually we like to put in unicortical screws. There are very few indications wherein you go buy corticals. Usually they are in a unicortical fashion within the bone. They should not violate the disc space either in the cranial or caudal direction. So the size should be appropriate. The trajectory should be proper. Once your implants are in place, do confirm the placement with an AP lateral shoot so that you see whether it's centrally placed and uh, it's appropriate not impinging on the end plates. We are still not done. A very important and crucial step is achieving good hemostasis. Particularly for the bony bleeders, I like to use a lot of bone wax for the corpectomy defect. You can also use gel foam soaked in thrombin. I put in a mini vac drain in all cases. For closure, it is in layers. So the uh, cervical fascia is closed with vicryl. Platysma is also closed with a vicryl. For the skin, I like to use a monocryl 3.0. The Ryle's tube that was initially placed during induction is not removed immediately. We usually retain it for the initial 24 hours. Helps with the feeding. Thank you everyone for the patient listening. I'll be uh, joining live during the discussion for questions if any. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nandan, uh, for a, a wonderful talk on uh, anterior cervical discectomy and corpectomy. Uh, we have also have a, a two brilliant spine surgeons from Chennai, uh, Dr. Uh, Sudhir, uh, who is uh, a osteo professor and senior consultant spine surgeon at Sri Ramchandra Institute uh, in Chennai. And we also have Dr. Murli Dharan, uh, Dr. Venkateshan with us. He is a senior consultant, a spine surgeon at Apollo Hospital, Chennai. And we all together are going to moderate on a cervical spine talk. So first question uh, to Dr. Nandan, uh, you, you talked about the uh, the positioning of the screw. So how much is the neck extension? Do you give it extra? How do you decide or do you do a pre-operative shootout before you give a positioning? Sir, we do a x-ray during the positioning itself. And uh, in patients with a long thin neck where there is good access to the neck, we don't have to give a lot of lordosis. In some of the patients with a really short neck or we are dealing with the subaxial level, we like to place bolsters below the scapula and uh, then let the head fall back. For positioning, we sometimes also use a head ring. So the head ring keeps the head in place for the uh, appropriate lordosis. Right, right. Dr. Sudhir, a lot of these patients uh, do complain of uh, dysphagia. So uh, how, how do you tackle intraoperatively? Do you do anything specific uh, for uh, managing uh, these patients with a dysphagia? Dr. Sudhir, uh, Dr. Murli Dharan, yeah. I think Bhushan just, uh, he is not able to unmute. Uh, Dr. Sudhir is sending a message. Bhushan, can you unmute him? I will try it from my side. In the meantime, can you, uh, can Nandan, can you take the same question? Sir, uh, I uh, like to deflate the endotracheal tube cuff, particularly for uh, multi-level uh, ACDF cases or a corpectomy. Uh, do you 
like to deflate the cough in all cases like what is your protocol sir so we usually uh, uh, try to ask them to reduce the pressure in the endotracheal cuff as much as possible a lot of uh, initially i to use a saline also because the constant retraction from one side and the cuff which is uh, exerting extra pressure uh, causes a kind of impingement and you have a high risk of uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury as well so that is something which uh, we try to do i ha we had a one uh, post graduate student doing a thesis on a retropharyngeal steroid uh, placement but yes these patients do have a, a lot of dysphagia when they go post operative uh, dr bushan can you unmute both of them uh, yes, sir. I'm Dr. trying. Uh, sir, is it unmute now? No, sir. You are not it. Just, just in a minute, sir. So I'll make a comment till then. Yeah, during yeah. during residency, uh, which was so, sir, we never used self retaining retractors for all his cases. It was always an assistant holding a right angled retractor. His thinking behind that is. Your assistant always gets tired at some point, so intermittently he is going to release the pressure. So he was not a big fan of uh, self-retaining retractors. I started using them only after uh, fellowship. Okay, so I think it's a very important point which he's trying to highlight is that you, uh, if you use a, a, a manual retraction, you tend to uh, get fatigue over a, a period of time and you lose the retraction, which is kind of a blessing in disguise that uh, you don't exert a severe uh, kind of a, a pressure on the uh, area. Uh, Bhushan, have you uh, been able to uh, admit or you take a help of uh, the admin? Yes, sir. I'm just contacting the admin guy and doing it. Okay. So uh, now the next question is, uh, Nandan, uh, what about the bending? Do you use the, uh, the bend which is already been given uh, by the manufacturer or you still use the uh, bend which is uh, you do extra bending on the the uh, the bend which is there incorporated uh, in the blade itself. In most cases, we have to do a slight amount of contouring. The bend that is there is usually inadequate. We, after fashioning the osteophytes, those are removed. We do a slight contouring for a lordosis. We tend to bend a little more, sir. Right. So, so the bending, uh, I think it's very important part that you need to give a good uh, lordosis uh, when you are doing this kind of a surgery. Uh, Dr. Vishal Peshetivar is also there. Uh, Dr. Vishal, if you can uh, uh, unmute, I think there's some uh, trouble. And uh, if if Bushan, Dr. Sudhir and Dr. Murlidhan are un unable to join, then can you ask them to again join back and again... Uh, let them in so that they can. Yes, sir. That, that's the option I'm uh, contacting, sir, uh, because it is not possible so from our end. So they have you to rejoin. The meeting and again join back so that if it's not getting it, we'll, uh, we can solve it. But he's uh, he has joined back again, but he's unable to do it. Ask the uh, Rishi to uh, sort the question. Yes, sir. On it, sir. So, in the meantime, because we were discussing uh, dysphagia. How is your uh, feeding protocol? Do you immediately start uh, feeding uh, patients? Like, what is the rule that you follow, sir? Yes, uh, in uh, usually we keep the RT for twenty four to forty eight hours, depending on the patient factor, and we do uh, uh, give a, a stim nebulization uh, initially, which does decrease the the congestion that happens. A uh, lot of time we retract everything. We ascribe it to the our retraction, but a lot of time it's a endotracheal tube which they pass that itself can cause a significant uh, injury to the uh, uh, oropharynx and the pharynx, which one should take into consideration. Dr. Umang has raised the hand. A question, Dr. Uh, sir, uh, what is your uh, opinion on those uh, new plates that have come out, those uh, ones? Uh, LCP kind of plates which uh, don't need uh, the final locking which mechanism which is there in the conventional ones. Do you think that is the way forward now? Like we should go ahead and just do those kind of uh, plates where you don't have, where you can probably alter the direction of the screws and the plate locks in the screw, uh, the screw locks in the plate itself, like the uh, LCP kind of uh, anterior cervical plates. Yes, Nandan, will you take the question? So I have not used one of those yet. The plates which I've used so far have always been uh, the locking ones so far. Okay, I think there are variable angle plates which... Uh, so the common problem is that in a, uh, a pathology like a tuberculosis, when you are operating on a cervical spine cox, you have a destruction and you tend to have a good uh, variable angle purchase. 
the conventional plate which allow what Umang is trying to tell. I, uh, the point is that when you pass the screw straight on, you may not be getting a purchase. And if you don't pass the screw straight on, you are unable to lock that screw into the plate. But nowadays they have a variable angle plate where you can pass the screw into the different directory and you can still lock the central mechanism. So, and, and the plate profile is also very important. I think uh, better to have a very thin profile plate whenever it is possible because that's going to increase the dysphagia and other issue. So the second thing regarding the discectomy, when you do a corpectomy, would you always uh, do a discectomy first and then corpectomy? How is your sequence and what is the, uh, uh, how do you go about it? Nandan. So in terms of sequence, always uh, discectomy first because uh, uh, then I know the exact extent of the bony work that I'm going to be doing. It also helps in assessing the depth of the uh, corpectomy defect that we will have to use. So with the discectomy, you can define your cranial caudal extent. For the corpectomy, we initially start off with a nibbler. We take a big chunk of the bone, use that as autograft and then bring the drill into the picture. This is usually the time when uh, we encounter a lot of bony bleeding. So uh, that is the period when uh, we have to be patient, burr a certain amount, uh, do a little bit of bone wax. And uh, ultimately, we leave a thin mantle of bone behind. So then we proceed with the uh, kerosene punch, take that oh, small so mantle. Uh... I am uh, audible now, uh, Dr. Tushar. Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Yeah, actually, I logged in through my phone as well. I'm able to unmute using my phone, but in my Mac, I'm not able to unmute. But however, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Tushar? Uh, sir, he, uh, I think he has lost connection. He'll be joining uh, soon, sir. Uh, he'll be joining back. Okay. Shall I share my screen and try? Hello? Shall Nandan, I share sir, can screen? you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. able to yes, hear you. Sir. Shall I share my screen? Yes, sir, please, uh, please do, sir. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes, we can uh, see. Yes, it. sir, we are able to see. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Dr. Sudhir, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, Dr. Tushar. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, warm, warm welcome to the this thing. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, before uh, you start your talk, uh, there are a few points which we would like to discuss and also know your uh, views about it. Uh, we just had a talk about the anterior cervical corpectomy. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I only use a RT in all the patients before you proceed for the surgery. And how do you prevent the dysphagia, which is there very common in this anterior cervical spine surgery? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tushar, for. Uh... Uh, making me a part of this uh, program. It's a wonderful program. And uh, so, yeah, I was uh, uh, going through and uh, first uh, for this page, I do not use the uh, Riles tube routinely for my patients. During my initial stage, maybe when I started about 10, 12 years back, I used to use and for corpectomy, I used to use. But uh, for the past uh, couple of years, I'm not using Riles tube at all. The uh, one of the few ways to prevent dysphagia after uh, SCDA for corpectomy is uh, releasing the retraction temporarily. So suppose if you are using a self return metronic kind of retractor, you have to release it when you are sizing it or when you are doing uh, uh, the bone grafting work and uh, preparation work. And when you are using your assistant to hold, again, ask them to relax on and off. So that is one way to prevent the post-operative dysphagia. So that is why they say that uh, persistent uh, self retaining retractors are uh, slightly uh, not better than the assistants holding the Langenbergs because the assistants tend to relax by themselves a couple of times during the surgery. So it, it is indirectly helpful to prevent dysphagia. Second thing is like uh, what Dr. Uh, Nandan commented uh, about the endotracheal tube. Okay, you ask the anesthetist to uh, reduce the ET tube pressure, cuff pressure. We actually did a study and we found that it has uh, reduced incidence of post-operative dysphagia in these patients as well. So you can try that as well to reduce uh, the incidence of post-operative dysphagia. Nandan, uh, I would like to also ask you, uh, what about the Casper? Uh, do you routinely use Casper for all the interbody work or you don't use a Casper? So uh, usually I use the metal suction tip in my left hand to intermittently distract the disc space and uh, do the discectomy. So if it's a single level uh, discectomy, it's a soft disc, we are not dealing with bony osteophytes, the retraction that I get with the metal uh, suction tip itself is good enough 
uh, and Casper pins are not put in. It's a very collapsed disc space. There are bony osteophytes and uh, we have to do some burring or take those osteophytes down. Those are the cases where we put the Casper pins in. Uh, so Dr. Sudhir, uh, what is your take on a Casper and what is the implant of choice for a uh, single level discectomy and fusion in a cervical spike? Yeah, uh, Casper pins, I do routinely use Casper pins for all my case because it uh, the visualization is definitely better with Casper pin, especially when you want to remove a fragment through the rent in the PLL. So the manipulation will be less. So you use the Casper pin, definitely. And implant of choice, uh, uh, off late I've been using standalone cages uh, for cervical spine as a part of one of the research projects what we have been doing. So I've been using uh, standalone as well as uh, anchored spacer cages, but I'm not using plate at all for many years for ACDF. So it's either anchored spacer or standalone cage. So standalone cage means you don't use screw, just a cage. No, right? no, 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 just, just a cage, screw. just a cage. We what are doing a, a study comparing the rate of subsidence uh, and uh, measuring the local kyphosis or a change in the sagittal plane angles comparing ankle spacer and uh, the cage. What about you, Nandan? What is the implant of choice for a single level discectomy and fusion? Sir, I like to use the cage with screws. So uh, I'm not very comfortable just uh, jamming a cage inside. So cage with two uh, screws on either end. Slightly tricky sometimes when we are putting the caudal screw because the chin comes to uh, tends to come in the way. So definitely one, uh, uh, if we have a good cranial screw, I may leave behind the caudal screw if I don't get a good trajectory, but try to go for two screws with a cage. I think Dr. Murli Dharan is, uh, is live now. So Dr. Murli Dharan, what is your implant of choice for a single level standalone fusion? Wow, welcome. Dr. Dr. Murli, can you hear me? Bhushan, can you unmute him? Uh, sir, sir, we are trying. I have also met sir co-host, but he has to log out again, I guess. I'm just trying to contact sir. Just a minute. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And uh, the bicortical, uh, Nandan, do you always use a unicortical screw or sometimes you use a bicortical screw Do you uh, when, you, when you use the screw in the cervical spine? Do you always take a unicortical purchase only? Most cases, unicortical only, sir. Uh, unicortical purchase good enough, yes, sir. And Dr. Sudhir, you said standalone cage. So use a local graft, use a allo graft, any particular preference for particular graft. And which cage do you use? Titanium peak, standalone cage when you're saying? No, I uh, use only local grafts. I don't use uh, uh, the allo grafts. I use the anterior lip, which I'm removing. So I use that graft in the cage and that is more than sufficient. I'm not using any artificial bone grafts or anything. Okay, and titanium versus peak, any particular preference? I use, uh, uh, see, it depends on the patient's affordability. Uh, in case of affordable patients, I use these peak cages, which uh, are the imported ones. But Indian ones, they have come with the hybrid titanium versus uh, peak. So on and off, I don't have particular preference about titanium or peak. But having said that, uh, it is better to use titanium uh, because uh, in cervical spine, because of the modulus of elasticity and the union rates. So we may have to do a comparative study comparing titanium and peak. Yes, Nandan, you raised the hand. Uh, Dr. Sudhir, you mentioned uh, using just a cage with graft from the anterior osteophyte. Sometimes when we are doing it, I do face a problem that when the graft is removed, these are all like tiny pieces of bone, making them stick together in that big hole of the standalone cage is slightly difficult. So when we are trying to put the cage in, I see that some of the graft just uh, falls off. Any technique like that you're using to keep the graft together when you're punching the cage inside? Uh, no, no. Uh, see, whenever I take these small pieces of bone itself, I tell uh, the assistant or the sisters that it is gold. So they will know the importance. So I'm taking gold, hold it, hold it. Because even the tiny bits of bone matters in ACDF because it's so uh, tiny. And when you try to pack it, yes, that is a problem. It tends to fall through the hole. But you try, if at all, if it is very... Uh, uh, little bit and if it is uh, falling down then you may take a small piece of surgery cell and just hold it on one side and then pack it inside right. because the surgery cell will get absorbed right so that's what i do tushar uh you have to unmute i think 
So thank you, Dr. Nandan, and I would request you to stay back so that again, we're going to have a discussion at the end. Uh, and I would uh, uh, again welcome Dr. Sudhir, uh, he's a senior consultant, spine surgeon, and a professor at Chennai and Ramchandra Institute. And I request him to uh, talk about the posterior cervical lamina foron, which is a motion preserving surgery. And it's something which a lot of people have concerns and uh, the technique is very important in this particular talk, uh, uh, surgical technique. So I would request him to uh, start his talk. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tushar. Once again, thanks uh, for having me in this uh, uh, workshop program. So uh, we'll see how to do posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy. So the indications for uh, posterior cervical laminotomy is a unilateral postrolateral soft disc. That is the ideal indication for posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy. And of course, with patients uh, with intractable uh, severe pain who did not get better with conservative treatment. So the contraindications are whenever there is a large or a huge central cervical disc, when there is significant cervical kyphosis, because by doing uh, laminoforaminotomy, you may aggravate kyphosis. When there is obvious cervical instability and myelopathic signs, and whenever there is a classical uncinate spur or with axial neck pain, then you tend to do the gold standard, which is the anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. Why are we very much uh, skeptical about doing a posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy compared to microdiscectomy in lumbar spine is because of the anatomical structures and the ease of getting access to the disc space and removing the disc because we are dealing at a cord level. So that is uh, that is why it is very important. Now, what are the perceived uh, advantages is that you directly target the disc which has come out just like in microdiscectomy of the lumbar spine and you decompress the involved nerve root unlike uh, ACDF where you tend to remove the entire disc uh, and inserting a cage and fusing a segment of the cervical spine. Basically, it is a motion preserving surgery and you do not disturb the disc space. You remove only the offending fragment and take that out and free the nerve root and you avoid, of course, you avoid fusion and any anterior approach related problems. The first and foremost thing in posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy is positioning. This is going to be the key to do your posterior cervical uh, for aminotomy. If you are not going to do a proper positioning, then it is very difficult to do a lamino for aminotomy. The patient has to be in prone position, preferably in a Mayfield clamp, because you will be able to achieve maximal neck flexion, which is the key in positioning in these patients. It's called as a chin tuck position. And you have to have a reverse Tendulkerberg position with abdomen being free, because the cervical venous condition will be less with reverse Tendulkerberg position. Again, and again, I'm uh, Stressing the point, maximal neck flexion, that is chin tuck position, that is very, very important in uh, while doing posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy. That's why when you are using just a horseshoe gel or a horseshoe clamp, you will not be able to achieve maximal neck flexion. So why do we want this maximal neck flexion? This is very, very important. So we have to reduce the shingling of the facets to expose the superior articular facets. So this is very, very important to understand. So uh, you can see here, the inferior articular process and the superior articular process. The IAP actually completely overlies the SAP in a normal neutral position. So whenever you do a maximal neck flexion, the superior articular process gets dislodged and it will become visible. Basically because the nerve root gets entrapped by the disc prolapse under the superior articular process. So you have to have the access to the nerve root or the disc space. You have to remove the superior articular process. So in order to do that, First, you have to knock the inferior portion of the inferior articular process. Unless you do maximal neck flexion, you will land up in removing more than half of the inferior articular process, resulting in post-operative instability of the neck. So the midline, there are two approaches by which you can do posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy. One is the classical midline approach, the other one is tubular one. I'm uh, I I prefer doing a tubular uh, dissectomy for the past few years. Uh, I do not do the classical open laminoforaminotomy. However, it's a posterior midline incision in case of open cases and uh, you have to open through the ligamentum luke, which is the avascular plane. Now, your right side is the lateral. You can see the spinous process here. Your left side is the medial. So this is for tubular uh, disectomy. So you make a paraspinal incision about 1.5 to 2 centimeters from the midline and then you insert your tubes using the serial dilators, just like what you do 
for your MI ST lift, except the diameter of the tube will be slightly lesser here. You can use 18 mm or 20 mm tube instead of a 24 mm tube that you use for uh, the uh, ULBDs or uh, MIS tubes in case of lumbar spine. You have to dock the tube at the B junction or preferably over the facet joint or the lateral mass because don't try to go medially sometimes because since you have achieved a maximal neck flexion, you may directly land up the trocar or the uh, smallest size tube directly into the canal through the ligamentum flame. So always keep the bony part Take the C-arm shoot, confirm the level, confirm the position of the tube and then insert the serial dilators. Make sure that you are in the bone. So this is the cranial one, caudal one, medial and lateral. This is from one of the articles. You can clearly see the facet joint, the cranial and caudal facet. And this is the facet joint where the tube has been docked. This is the medial portion. This is the V point. Then you start burring. Either you can use a burr if you are if you have no accessibility to the burr, then you can directly use a keratin punch or curate and then uh, burr the inferior aspect of the IAP of the superior vertebra. Let us assume this is to be a C5 C6 disc, disc prolapse. So you have to remove the inferior aspect of the IAP of C5 vertebra. So as I said, it is overhanging the SAP. And we have to understand that the compressive pathology is the SAP and uncovering or removing the superior articular process, upper third of the superior articular process is very, very important to access the disc. So the IAP of the level, uh, above level, it lies over the uh, dorsum of the SAP. So it has to be partially resected, but however, make sure that you are not resecting more than 50%. That is very, very important. Then you use 1 mm or 2 mm kerosene punch. Then you go near the lateral aspect of the lamina and you remove the lateral aspect of the cranial and the caudal lamina. So that is again very, very important. Don't try to go uh, infraligamentally immediately. You do the bony work first, maintain the ligamentum flavum and remove the cranial and caudal part of the uh, lamina. So this is how it is. This is the ligamentum flavum after removing the IAP and the SAP. And you can see this again, I use a nerve probe. So this is the IAP and SAP and the part of the cranial and caudal lamina being removed. Now, after this, you use a 1 mm or 2 mm right angle nerve probe and try to remove the ligament of flavum gently. I prefer not to use any blade here. I just use the sharp or micro uh, right angled probes to remove the ligament of flavum. Once you remove the ligament of flavum, there will be a uh, sudden gush of blood. That is the venous bleeding which accompanies the usually the nerve root at that uh, area. So you can stop that by just packing small small patties or you can uh, gel foam soaked in thromine. You can use that as well but uh, preferably uh, just a two minutes of packing with patties is more than sufficient and uh, make sure that you do not remove 50% of the joint. This is what I told you. Use the 1 mm probe and try to remove the Ligamentum flame gently always give upward pressure. Do not give a downward pressure near the cord because you may compromise the cord. Always give an upward pressure when you are removing the uh, ligamentum flavor. Now the disc will be exactly so based on whether it is a shoulder or axillary disc. Most of the times it will be in the axillary portion here. Since the nerve root is a horizontal course, you do not actually have the concept of a shoulder or axilla. It will be just impinging over the nerve root. If you want to remove the disc by manipulating the nerve, try to retract the disc cranially or cronally, depending upon, I mean, re retracting the root cranially or caudally, depending upon the position of the disc. Do not try to manipulate the cord or the root too much. Instead, you take your thin tipped probe and try to rotate it surrounding the disc material by a 360 degree direction and tend to hook it out. That is one of the best way to do that. So you can see the nerve root here coming laterally and this is the dura and you can see the disc fragment here in the inferior aspect. So then after you do that, you gently remove the disc material without too much of manipulation of the cord. Never ever tend to go medially. Now sometimes in case of an intraforaminal disc herniation, again the nerve root need to be manipulated. So that is very, very important. You try to manipulate it slightly cranially and don't try to manipulate caudally because cranial is relatively better and safe. And if the disc is somewhat more uh, inferior and if it is going into the foramen, what you can do is you, you can, for example, for a C5-C6 disc prolapse, you may try to burrow the 
C6 pedicle, the superior part of the medial aspect of the C6 pedicle, you may try to burr it out a little bit and create a little bit space and try to remove it. So this right angle probe is one of the most important instruments that you have to use, especially if it is going to be a, a thin one, a 1 mm or 2 mm, because it will help you to hook out. I use this regularly in all my micro discectomy cases in the lumbar spine as well. So that is very, very important. This circular motion is very important and don't try to go medial too much into inside the cord and try to poke the cord. So give a gentle rotatory motion and try to hook out and take out. A uh, few people use curet, but I do not uh, prefer to use curet in this region. If at all, again, if you are using curet, you can use just 1 mm curet. Try to take out. And the medial disc fragments, if you are going to have uh, to remove a huge disc fragment, always try to increase the space. Don't try to work in a constrained space. So go slightly medial, remove a bit of more of the cranial and caudal lamina. Again, slightly remove the lateral, uh, go laterally by removing the medial aspect of the facet joint. Always try to avoid retraction of the spine and the dura. So sometimes what will happen is, uh, uh, what are the causes of inadequate decompression is inability to appreciate the lateral extent of foramen. When you are doing a foraminotomy, especially in elderly patients, when you want to do a single level foraminotomy, make sure that you go all the way using a 1 mm or 2 mm up cutter and go all the way along the nerve root and release the foramen. So that is very, very important because when you just release the lateral aspect uh, uh, of the, uh, 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 just you, when you uh, remove only the medial most aspect of the foramen that is not going to help out, you have to go along the nerve root and you have to remove the foramen and make a proper foramen anatomy. That is very, very important. It has to be carried laterally and until you see the, until you are able to properly appreciate the caudal pedicle very clearly. Sometimes there will be a retained disc fragment. Again, you use your nerve probe and try to retract and uh, take it out gently. So this is a schematic uh, representation of how much of a, a, a laminoforaminotomy you can do. But practically speaking, you cannot preserve this much amount of facet. So you may have to remove at least the medial one third of the facet. But don't tend to remove more than half of the facet, these patients will develop cervical instability or cervical neck pain in the post-operative period. So whenever you are removing, don't be over-aggressive. Just remove the uh, medial third of the facet. Look your neural structures. And when you are not able to manipulate or remove the disc fragment and uh, free the nerve root, then you go along the nerve root. This is what I said. Go along the nerve root using 1 mm or 2 mm keratin and try to remove the SAP. You have to Understand the concept that the SAP is the culprit here. The IAP which we are removing is to get access to the SAP. So don't try to remove the cranial facet too much. That may result in instability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudhir, for a detailed and wonderful talk. You you described the anatomy, technical nuances in a so detail, and the, that is the purpose of this workshop. This is purely based on a surgical technique. So uh, now you describe uh, this technique. Uh, I would like to know what is the common indication when I, when you get a, a disc which is slightly going paracentral, you always prefer this one or you do also ACDF. How do you decide uh, whether to go from anterior or posterior or always you go for a front? Yeah, uh, we tend to use the term, the, uh, this juicy disc, no? Classical, unilateral, soft, juicy disc. I do uh, cervical foraminotomy. Otherwise, I tend to prefer ACDF. So if you feel that it is a hard disc, if you feel that there is a osteophyte, if you feel it is a very, very tight one. And second thing, whenever uh, there is a single level foraminal stenosis in elderly patients, then I prefer to do this. Otherwise, you can just go ahead with your ACD. Huge central disc, there is no role for laminoporam anatomy. You will not be able to remove the disc without manipulating the cord. I used to tell uh, uh, most of them that cord, always respect the cord. It is not like the dura. You cannot manipulate. So classical unilateral soft disc, go ahead with laminoporaminotomy, especially between C4 to C6 or C7, it is going to be a classical case for you. Right. And you also mentioned about the elderly patient with a single level foraminal stenosis. So uh, how does the technique differ? Because uh, these cases have a bleeding around and, and you tend to remove more. Uh, is it more forgiving in terms of extent of decompression in an elderly patient who are already osteophytes? How do you, uh, what are the technical tips? Exactly. Uh, exactly. Half of the answer is in your question as well. You mentioned that already there will be osteophytes, already there will be 
um, um, the see in elderly patients, uh, literature has shown that even multi levels, uh, multi level stenosis or myelopathy, you can just get away with laminectomy without the risk of post operative kyphosis. Okay, especially in elderly patients. So by doing a wide foraminotomy in these patients, it's not going to result in significant post operative kyphosis or instability. So definitely, you target. One thing is. Uh, in case of foraminal stenosis, I will not be bothered to remove more of the lamina. I will be tending to uh, go towards the facet and in the foramen region, as I've been mentioning earlier, I will use 1mm, 2mm cutter. I will do a judicial foraminotomy. I will use the probe, that 1mm right angle probe and probe into the foramen along the nerve root. And I will look at the nerve root, whether it is completely free or not. I will not tend to go in the axilla and middle around the vasculature in case of a classical prominent stenosis without a distal comb. Okay. And and uh, regarding the neuromonitoring, do you routinely use it or you don't use no, it? No. No neuromonitoring at all for cervical laminoform. Okay. And is it the most commonly that root displacement, if you want has to trace the root and manipulate the nerve root, which is one of the slides you mentioned when you can't do it, uh, you usually take, because they are horizontal, you tend to take, take them upward. How, how, how is the approach? How do you mobilize the nerve root? And second question is, when do you call that your decompression is enough? When you remove the disc enough? So how do you yeah. decide? Yeah, uh, number one is uh, in cervical uh, disc prolapse, usually it will be a fragment. Even when you are doing ACDF, it will be a small fragment which has come out, which is pressing the nerve root. It will be a classical one. So when you do a frag, it is most of the times it's a fragmentectomy. So when you remove the fragment, it will be a single whole end mass fragment. So that marks the end of your discectomy. You need not meddle around too much, go probe medially or tend to uh, incise, uh, we are not going to incise the disc space and do stuff like what we are doing in the lumbar spine. The next question is, since it's a horizontal course, as you said, the roots in the cervical spine, it exits just like a horizontal course. It is, uh, so you have to look at the position of the disc. Most of the times it will be below the nerve root whenever there is a compression. So you try to re uh, retract or mobilize your nerve root gently above and tend to try to try, uh, take the disc space. Very rarely you see a disc which is coming and lying on or above the uh, exiting nerve root. So that is quite a rare phenomenon. So it is better to cranially mobilize the nerve root because the nerve root excursion will be slightly more if you mobilize the nerve root cranially. So it's right. slightly better to prevent the traction injury to the nerve root or uh, injuring the dura. I mean, thought. Dr. Umang, you have a question. So I'm uh, I'm uh, going to sound a bit cynical, but uh, Dr. Sudhir, great talk. But uh, my only question is one: uh, How have your uh, like since that you've been doing this for uh, quite some time? I think uh, what has your recurrence rate been in these cases? Number one and secondly, uh, like why did our uh, why did laminoforaminotomy come about in the cervical spine? Considering that our ACDFs used to give us a ninety five to ninety six percent. Uh, you know, success rate, uh, then why should we as young surgeons think of adopting this procedure? Because I have seen one, I have seen only one in my uh, short career, which had to be abandoned because the bleeding could not be controlled. So, uh, like, what is uh, your take on the procedure? I mean, we, uh, over uh, preference of laminoforaminotomy in the ideal case over an ACDF. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. As you rightly pointed out, so ACDF is the gold standard as of now. Okay, again and again, I'm trying to reiterate this point that posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy, especially when we are starting or even now, what I practice is for a classical juicy unilateral disc prolapse. And uh, why we opted uh, for doing cervical laminoforaminotomy instead of ACDF? Because you are not going to fuse the segment. You are just going to do the same thing what you are going to do for a lumbar microdiscectomy. And why we are not seeing more laminoforaminotomies compared to ACDF? Exactly like what you told, we are afraid of the complications. But having said that, if you have been, if you have started using tubes and if you are using tubes regularly, this procedure is very, very, um, what is it? I would not term it as very, very easy. It is relatively safer than what we think as it is and the time uh, is less you are going you are not going to fuse the segment you are going to retain the motion the so-called presumed disadvantages that axial neck pain i have not seen in my patients recurrence 
almost nil in my patient group after cervical laminoprominent as i said in cervical spine the disc which is coming out it will be a fragment most of the times so even in acdf our aim is not to remove the entire disc material after you remove the entire disc you probe and search for the disc fragment which is going and compressing the nerve root just to access that particular disc fragment you are removing the 95% of the disc and you are fusing the segment so we are trying to save the 95% of the disc and we are going to try to remove the 5% of the offending disc fragment so that is the whole concept and yes initially when you are going to do definitely there will be uh, a bit of uh, uh, concern about the complication especially bleeding and manipulation so we have to take proper precautionary steps that's what exactly what i told us the two things which you have to be very careful one is the venous bleeding so immediately when you are looking at the nerve root and the dura don't try to put in the probe and medulla round definitely it will bleed so you try to gently dissect the root clearly from the dura use small very very small patties and pack it don't try to pack and retract the cord or the dura just pack it delineate your anatomy very clearly once you are able to see a small portion of the disc fragment use the smallest size disc punch i usually use something called as 1 mm pituitary forceps i use that and tend to take it a little bit so that the disc becomes slightly prominent and then based on the disc uh, position you try to retract the root and tend to remove in my experience tattooed i have not had a, a case of venous bleeding where i had to stop the procedure and come back definitely yes i have i've had uh, uh, venous bleeding where i've used surgical surgical is my magic tool in most of my cases so i use surgical place the surgical place the patty wait for 3 to 4 minutes till the clotting time is over and gently remove there won't be any problem yeah very important point uh, uh, fear of surgery should not be det detrimental for the particular approach and he is beautifully shown that uh, motion preserving surgery unilateral approach can work wonder because nowadays patient are also demanding for a non fusion surgery and uh, i would request dr sudhir to stay back and uh, coming to the motion preserving surgery we have dr murli dharan with us he is a senior uh, consultant spine surgeon at chennai and his talk is going to be on a cervical laminoplasty so dr murli dharan can you share your screen thank uh, you sir Yeah, Dr. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's uh, it's starting in a minute. Can you share the screen? Yes. Can you see, sir? Yes. we can see bushad now you can you can play and then he can run he can describe from there okay sir yes yeah you keep for him yes. to run the slide show okay good afternoon everyone uh, the last the last candidate the uh, sudhir so session there was a good question you know why should we do lamino foraminotomy when when you have a gold standard acdf which gives 98% you know uh, satisfactory outcome the quest the question comes you know in a 20 we see nowadays we see 20 and 30 year old with the uh, radiculopathy so what do we do do should, should we try to preserve the motion and to so that we avoid stress on the adjacent segment so that physiological loading of the cervical spine is maintained so a lot of things are there so that is why lamina foraminotomy is still some of us do that for a selective cases so the motion preservation is the principle over there and i think with with the endoscopy coming into play the the lateral disc which we used to do uh, lamina foraminotomy as you pointed out it's 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 you know there is a very high uh, venous fluxes bleeding area and with the uh, endoscope probably uh, it, it will make our life easier and uh, lamina foraminotomy is still is still is still a good option for a young patients with a radiculo radiculopathy uh, yes the acdf is the gold standard but motion preservation is the all about we are uh, you know uh worried about in in young patients coming to cervical laminoplasty basically it is it is a similar motion preserving non fusion posterior based decompressive technique next slide please just click on the slide vision just click on the yeah thank you see 
go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. I'll tell you when to click. Yeah, go back, go back, go back. Go back. We're going forward. No, go back, Bushan. Back side. You are going forward. Run from the first slide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you when to move. Thank you. Thank you. See, for any surgery, for any surgery to have a satisfactory outcome, three things are very important. You need to have a right indication and it has to be on a right patient and you need to have the right skill because the technique will never fail. It's a skill. So right patient, right indication and right skill is what needed for a, any surgical outcome to be optimal. So when it comes to laminoplastic, cervical laminoplasty, my indications are you have to have a multi-level cervical stenosis, like three or more level cervical stenosis due to degeneration, or you have to have an ossified posterior longitudinal ligament with you know three spanning three vertebral levels, like a diffuse type or a mixed pattern spanning more than three levels. And when they present as a symptomatic myelopathy, or a myeloradiculopathy. So it's a basically compressive cervical myelopathy or myeloradiculopathy due to multi-level cervical stenosis or a ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. This is the indication for a cervical laminoplasty, which is a decompressive procedure, posterior-based decompressive procedure. But when it comes to which patient do I do? Of, do I offer laminectomy and or I offer laminoplasty? The patient selection is very important. The patient selection means the patient has to have a maintain a low dosis. They should not have a kyphosis. And second thing is the K line. You all know K line positive and negative. So the K line has to be uh, positive. If it is negative, that means there is a heavy anterior mass, and you have to approach anterior. So a preserved low dosis and a K line positive is the indication for the uh, laminoplasty. But if the patient has got a lot of axial back pain, then it becomes, you know, uh, because this is not a solution for axial back pain. This is a solution for myelopathy or radiculopathy symptoms. So, and you need to have the uh, right skill and the techniques. And next slide, please. So, laminoplasty. Laminoplasty, when it comes to laminoplasty, you would have heard single door laminoplasty, you would have a double door laminoplasty. So it's basically there is two schools. Okay, one school uh, prefer open uh, single door laminoplasty. As schematically represented in this picture, you will see a, a opening trough on the left side and a hinge on the right side and the, the lamina and the spine the uh, spinous process is opened dorsally and laterally and held with the uh, suture uh, ethibone to the uh, other facet. So it is opened the door. So there is an inch on the other side and with one inch on the other side, you're opening the posterior elements. That is called a single door opening. And then that comes the double door opening, which is the French door opening. So you have an inch on either side and you're splitting the uh, spinous process in the middle, then lamina, and then you're opening it like a French door which slides on either side. So it's a double door. See, the basic, the basic difference is what the basic difference is both of them, both of them give expansion of the spinal canal. So you get enough uh, space. Uh, so you're directly decompressing any posterior compressive element. And also you are creating more space. So indirectly, the cord can drift back from any anterior compressive pathology. So the cord will drift back. So that will give the decompression. So you, the both will give the same thing. But the advantage of the uh, open door, uh, that is double door French, it gives us, they say it gives a symmetrical decompression, symmetrical expansion. But, but, the, the the literature says the both are the same, the outcome wise. I personally prefer single door, single open door laminoplasty because there is only two cuts and you can create a good expansion. With a French door, you have to have an inch on either side of the lamino uh, facet junction and then you have to have another third cut at the middle of the spinous process and the lamina. 
So that middle cut is always, always is you know worrisome to me because you are direct. The cord is directly under the compromised cord. So there is always a risk of you know high risk of neural injury compared to the single tooth. So so my choice is only single tooth. And there are a lot of modifications of these which has come over the years. But these are the two principal techniques. Either you open a single door or you open a double door, which is French door. So my favorite is a single door for the reasons I've told you, because there's only two cuts and less neural injury, and it gives the same uh, uh, canal expansion. Next slide, please. So intraop. See, the, the, everything is the same as like how you do a multi-level laminectomy, how you position and do everything. So First of all, the most important thing in a when we're dealing with the compressive pathology, uh, decompression surgeries, whether it's anterior or posterior, is anesthesia. So you have to avoid the extension, hyperextension of the neck because the extension can worsen the uh, myelopathy. So you need to get your anesthetists on board and they need to use less extension. And if needed, they have to use fiber optic uh, way to get the intubation without give, you know, uh, increasing the risk of cord compromise during anesthesia, uh, during positioning of the anesthesia. And then you have to avoid intraop, you have to avoid hypotension so that we maintain the perfusion. The map has to be maintained more than 80, especially most of these elderly patients are uh, hypertensive. So you have to know what is their baseline and you have to maintain little more than what you will maintain for a normal adult man. And intraoperative neuromotting is, is something is a very good adjunct and I use for all cases for the decompressive myelopathy. I know Dr. Sudhi said laminar anatomy, you don't need it. You're dealing with the root level. But when you're dealing with the compressive decompressions, whether it is a laminectomy or laminoplasty or anterior ACDF, ACCF, it is advisable to have the IOM because it helps to, it will alert you if there are any intraop. Uh, you know, perfusion in cells. You, immediately it will alert you and you can pick and act on it and correct. Thereby you can minimize the post-op uh, neurological worsening. So with regards to positioning, uh, click please. With regards to positioning, it's a standard positioning how you will do for a posterior uh, laminectomy and a fusion. Okay, I use the Mayfield because it gives a better head control and you can put the head in a little bit of flexion and reverse central and buck to help reduce venous congestion at the surgical site and shoulder stuck, shoulders away uh, if you have to do a level check for your CMs. And the knee, at the distal end of the uh, table, you can to give a little flexion so that the patient don't slide down. Uh, so this is the positioning, standard positioning. And approach is the standard midline posterior approach. So if you are doing a multi-level like C3 to C6, exposure to two, C2 to C7, midline incision, and then uh, with cautery, I will go direct down to the until spinous process, stay on the midline for raffe because that's the avascular, and then expose superiorly up to both sides still, lamina and lateral mass junction. So if you're going to use a plate for fixation, then expose the lateral mass on the side you're going to put the plate. Next slide, please. Once you've done the exposure, the steps are only four steps or that. The first is you have to make a opening trough. So the first schematic diagram you will see, you're making an opening trough on this final laminar junction on the one side. And then next you have to make a inch trough. Inch trough means you're only going to take the dorsal cortex so that the ventral cortex stays and that acts as an inch. So that will create a green stick fracture and act as an inch dome. So once you've done an opening trough, once you've done an uh, inch trough, you're going to check whether the inch is opening, whether the inch is working. It's called spring test. You can use a small uh, caspo or anything. If the spinous process is preserved, you can use that to see the spring test opening. And then you can apply a dorsally placed force, either with the hook or with the hook under the lamina. So once you create, expand a dorsally directed force, the, the posterior element will open and whatever the buccal lamina will, uh, flavor will become uh, unfolded and tightened. And if you want to release any further uh, lamina uh, flavectomy, you can do at that stage. So it's basically the four simple stress. So opening trough on the one side, 
an inch trough on the second side, use that, and then you'd see the sp string test whether you have done since so the inch started working. Because you don't want to take, you need to take enough bone, but you, need, you don't want to take full bone also. So you just check the string test and then apply the dorsally directed force with the, with the hooks, caspers, the, everything, and then open the door. So the work post elements will open and you have expanded the space. Next comes how we are going to hold the space. That will come to the next slide. Just go back, just go back to the previous slide. Previous slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Next one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Here the, the question, question I get asked sometimes is which side you will do the opening door? Opening uh trough and which side we should do the inch. Okay. See, basically general uh, teaching and general practice is whichever the more symptomatic side, like a minor radiculopathy is more on the right side, you will, the people will do a, a opening trough on the right side. So it also gives a bit more uh, foramen of TV as well. You can do a foramen if you want. So the opening, opening side is mostly on the symptomatic side. But for comfort, convenience, I'm a right-handed surgeon. So I prefer my opening trough on the left side. So I can play it and everything becomes easy for me. If you are a left-handed surgeon, you can do your opening trough on the uh, side you are standing itself. So it, you know it is it is it is based on the convenience. Next next slide, please. So the troughs troughs you can you can make the troughs with Harrison punch. Okay, on one side you can like like you do for a laminectomy, uh, you can use the kerosene punch to do the trough on the uh, opening side. But for the for the inside, side, you need the burr just to thin the dorsal cortex and then slowly thin it. Make sure the ventral cortex is intact, a flake of bone is intact. So the burr, three three to five mm, five mm burr is ideal. It gives a good trough so that when you open it also. The troughs don't collapse or they don't impinge on the neural structures. You get a very good, uh, very good uh, trough. So five mm bar, kerosene, mesonics. Mesonics blades are very fantastic. The blades, but the blades give a very thin cut. So probably they have a bar as well. You can use that. So that is more uh, uh, less uh, thermal injury and uh, less bleeding. So mesonics, these are the tools you can use. Burr and kerosene are the workhorse. So when it comes to segmental fixation, so okay, once you've expanded, how are we going to keep it up? So one click, please, next click. The traditionally, 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 the ethibones are used. So you, you could see the ethibone circled around the spinous process and it is connected to the, uh, taken a switch through the facet on the inch side. So you can do a suture, uh, sutures can uh, hold the uh, opened up space, but only downside of the sutures is they can sometimes prematurely collapse. So the premature collapse and loss of the space you obtain is a concern. Okay. If you're going to use suture, then you don't have a fancy plate, then I suggest you take an introsious suture and circle it around. Uh, and the next is the bone graft. Next click, please. You have bone graft. The, you, you can nibble the spinous process, use this as a tricortical wedge for the opened up space. You can use a lot of bone graft substitute also is there to use. The third is the plate and screw system. Third is the plate and screw system. So you have a plate, it's a 2 mm thick plate, 2.3 system. Uh, Medronic has got a good plate and you also have a other local companies with the plates, cervical laminar class plates now. The plate system gives immediate stability and it also maintains the uh, the uh, space you have created. But the other tools can have some failure because even with the graft, the graft can dislodge and compress on the neural structure. The the plate is the at the as of now is the most preferred uh, fixation technique of the laminar class. Let's see, let's see, let's see an animated video. And then uh, how it looks in drop. So you can see, you can see the display. You can see the troughs being made on the opening trough and the inch and it's open. You see how much is the, the space, how it opens. 
So both of them allow more space. Now you can see the real time video. So you see where the trough is being made at the spinal laminar junction. So and you use you use suction generously uh, and irrigation. So you make the trough how many levels you want on the one side. And then you have to go for the inch on the other side. And then you make the inch on the other side. So three levels, four levels, you make the inch. And then you use, you clear the interspinals and ligamentous attachment at the proximal and distal end of your laminar plastic. Use the hooks to see the spring test and use the bipolar because the vertebra has got a very great venous plexus. So, so you can use the bipolar generously and you can slowly, slowly, gently, sequentially lift the, uh, la the lamina and then use the plate and screws. So the question is how much you need to open? So we just need around 10 to 12 to 14 millimeters is what we need. So that that's a rough uh, expansion you needed. And the 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 plates give you the immediate stability. See, the question is when you're making trough, the two things you have to be cautious. You should not make very medial trough. Medial trough means it is inch will not be very good and it will not work and there is a risk of neural injury. You should not be very lateral also. If you go very lateral into the facet, you are creating instability in that area. Or if you if you don't have the feedback and if you plunge in anterior, you know, when you're doing the trough, then again, it's a it's a mess of a neural and a vertebral vessel. So you have to have a very good control when you're making trough. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Murli, uh, for a detailed talk on a cervical laminoplasty. I think this uh, is a technique which he already highlighted is a motion preserving surgery. It does canal expansion. Uh, the important point which he highlighted probably is the facet arthritis. You should not have a much of actual neck pain. Otherwise, main advantage is the movement. So how do you follow the post-operative this patient, Dr. Murli? Do you press them? Do you immediately start mobilization exercises? Post, see, see, this is more post, post op. Normally, I give them a soft collar and ask them to uh, move whatever they, they can. Use the neck movements, head movements, whatever they can. After six feet, I give a neck and shoulder rehabilitation for trapezius, rhomboids, and everything. See, in the exposure, very important thing I forgot to mention, I want to highlight the C2 and C7. You should try to preserve the muscle attachments, C2 and C7 as much as. So most of the time, we only need to undercut the C2. We don't have to take the entire spinous process of C2 or anything. See, C2 and C7 attachment, the extensor muscle attachment will reduce some of the neck pain and will maintain the uh, will help to maintain the uh, stability as well. Uh, spine, see, the spinous process, we can preserve the spinous process. There's no thing. Same time, you can sacrifice the spinous process also if you want, uh, you know, it, it all depends on the individual preference and the experience. Uh, but collar, after six weeks, neck uh, uh, strengthening exercises and shoulder rehabilitation, neck and shoulder rehabilitation is what I do. I think it's a very important point that you try to preserve the C2, C7 semispinalis services muscle attachment. And I think there are a lot of papers which have showed a technical modification that you can still do a C3 laminectomy and still you can do a laminoplasty so that to preserve muscle because it becomes difficult to cover the do a laminoplasty mm -hmm. with the muscle intact. Uh, Dr. Sude, uh, uh, Dr. Murli, my question uh, is that uh, when you uh, do this uh, cervical laminoplasty, uh, do you uh, routinely do a prophylactical C5 foraminotomy or you don't do uh, what is your no. take? So, no. No. No, see, see, the C5, C5, C5 palsy is a, is a big, big subject as such to debate. Okay. Whether you are doing it an anterior approach or a posterior approach, the, the, the incidents are just similar. Whether you are doing a laminoplasty or a laminectomy, the incidents are similar. See, prophylactic, uh, I don't do, but as per literature, it is, uh, it is, it is, it happens uh, either way. It is, it is that the, the prophylactic uh, uh, laminoforum laminotomy, I don't think it is, it is done uh, reduced as well. 
Dr. Sudhir and Dr. Nandan, prophylactical C5 foraminotomy following a posterior extensive laminectomy or a laminoplasty? Sir, I usually add a prophylactic foraminotomy at C5, particularly when we are going uh, really wide. So, or uh, if it's like a kyphotic spine and we are putting in lordotic rods to achieve a correction, we add a foraminotomy. Okay. Is Dr. Sudhir there? Yes. Yes, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Tushar. Yeah, almost always I do cervical foraminotomy, C5 foraminotomy to prevent that. Both right. sets bilaterally, wide foraminotomy and visualize. Yes, I think there's a lot of uh, people who prefer a cervical foraminotomy. I, I think I also belong to the same class, but at the same time, as Dr. Murli says, there's a lot of people who think that it's the incidence is same from the anterior posterior. It's the burying. There are a lot of queries, including the phylogenetically short uh, nerve root, uh, which could cause this uh, particular uh, thing. So, uh, and Dr. Murli, would you like to tell, because we don't really do a depth gauge in this, so what kind of screw dimensions that you use uh, for the the screw in the facet and the screw in the lamina. So, what are the yeah. length that? See, see, we, see, basically, it's very not big like uh, other things. It is uh, 2.3 mm uh, screws, mostly 4 mm, 6 mm. Facet 6 mm, lamina 4 mm, not, not the shorter screws. I think that's an important thing that uh, you should use a shorter screw because they are just to hold it. Uh, he also expressed, uh, showed you a suture laminoplasty technique as well. But I think these plates with a proper angle blend, uh, he's beautifully shown those things. Uh, uh, if, are there any questions? If otherwise, we'll uh, proceed for the next talk. Uh, Dr. Bhushan, can you uh, uh, upload the next talk by Dr. Umang uh, on a cervical laminectomy? Thank, yes. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Hello, is my presentation visible, sir? Your voice is audible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. visible. Yeah, visible. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so after the great talk by Dr. Murli, sir, uh, I'll be talking on a relatively basic procedure, which is cervical laminectomy. Uh, what, when, why, and how? I'm Dr. Umang Shet. I'm a spine fellow at uh, St. J.S. Medical College and KM Hospital. Uh, so uh, I'll just start off with a case. Uh, this is a 70-year-old male who came in the OPD with complaints of weakness of bilateral hand grip with gait instability while walking. Uh, on examination, he had a positive Hoffman sign, weak hand grip on the right side, inward supinator was positive, upgoing plantar re planters, exaggerated knee and ankle jerk reflexes. Uh, this was his MRI, which is showing multi-level uh, compression at C3, at two-level compression actually, C3, C4, and uh, C5, C6 level, C3, C4 being the main uh, level of compression. And these are the axials for the same. So whenever, uh, so uh, when usually, uh, when do we do a laminectomy? When, I mean, when do you do a posterior procedure in the cervical spine or for that matter, any part of the spine? Uh, for cervical spine, it's multi-level cervical spondylotic myelopathy ossified posterior longitudinal ligaments, traumatic cervical spine injuries. So if you can see the figure which I've introduced, so posterior surgeries work by two ways. One is you either remove the direct posterior offending agent or the second one is you, you rely on the cord fall, uh, floating back from the anterior offending structures. So what, so as I said, uh, the success of cervical laminectomy alone depends on two things. One is uh, if you're doing lamin cervical laminectomy alone. So like either you can do a cervical laminectomy with fusion or you can do cervical laminectomy without fusion. So if you're doing only cervical laminectomy, two things need to be, you, sh you should make sure is one is cervical lordosis of minimum 10 degrees. There's the CT to C7 angulation should be minimum of 10 degrees for ensuring an adequate uh, cord fallback and there should not be any instability on uh, radiographs. Uh, if you pay attention, this figure is from uh, an article by Ed Benzel on, uh, uh, on basically it's an article on techniques of uh, techniques in uh, neurosurgery. Um, and he has uh, basically mentioned his, uh, like what does he uh, use to decide on whether it's an anterior procedure for him or a posterior procedure. 
so laminectomy is as uh, the figure says is most effective in config uh, in the configuration a where the spine is in cervical lordosis with all elements of the vertebral bodies ventral to the stipple zone like it's a good lordotic spine this uh in the c part which you can see uh in the b part sorry in the b part uh the point b the spine is in effective cervical kyphosis with elements of vertebral body dorsal to the stipple zone so laminectomy he says is contraindicated in this configuration and in a straightened cervical posture which is the image c it can be effective so uh, uh let's after our midline exposure uh, after ensuring proper positioning so for positioning i want to uh, mention very uh, like vehement i mean a uh, stress on uh, for all the delegates is that always ensure that once your positioning is done you check the eyes because uh, you we as orthopedics uh, so we are using uh, the horseshoe while uh, doing the procedure so when if your eyes are uh, because it's called a headrest syndrome where you patients have landed up with blindness because of the excess intraocular pressure during the spine surgery so when uh, after your uh, stand, standard subperiosteal dissection of the paraspinal muscles is done uh, so in bold i've written do not disturb the c2 and its muscular attachment so uh, we need to understand that c2 and c7 are like uh, the two pillars of if you if you know a suspension bridge like either the golden gate bridge or the bandravalli ceiling if, if you uh, just for understanding purposes so it's these two points where all your cervical posterior cervical musculature is attached and if you are disturbing one of them your entire your uh, the chances of developing kyphosis are going to be much higher so as far as possible try to avoid detaching the muscles from the c2 uh, c2 spinous process and c7 process however there are going to be times when you are going to uh, will have to remove the c2 spinous process if you have an extensive right from c2 to you know c5 c6 uh, you know severe compression there is going to be no chance but to save the thing it's better to remove it but however in most cases you are going to uh, when the more major levels are c5 c6 c4 c5 you should preserve ideally speaking you should preserve the c2 spinous process a uh, mean arterial pressure during the decompression uh, part of our surgery should be at 90 and not 80 to 90 not less than that because uh, in a uh, it is going to affect the spinal cord perfusion and uh, when you are doing the decompression that's when you want the spinal cord to be maximally well perfused high speed burr uh, is a must for these cases uh, and you should follow a no touch technique of decompression avoid inserting instruments in the synotic canal to prevent uh, cord injury so nowadays uh, have we used uh, the midas rex uh, from uh, medtronics we are lucky to have that in our ot uh, people do use the mesonic ultrasonic bone scalpel uh, but i have personally no experience uh, using it avoid ag over aggressive resection of facet joints so this this point means is for true for any laminectomy in the spine where uh, the main stabilizing structures of our cervical spine are the uh, facet joints and if you are planning to do only a laminectomy alone then it's better you should a uh, resection of the facets should be kept as minimal as possible once your uh, laminectomy uh, your uh, bilateral uh, thinning of the troughs are uh, created with a 1 mm ronger you try uh, you complete the lamin uh, complete the laminotomies and uh, with the help of two towel clips uh, one at the cranial end and one at the caudal end you apply a, a gentle dorsal traction to just pull away the lamina from the underlying cord but however this should be done extremely carefully because sometimes what happens is in our over in our attempt to overzealously remove the lamina undue pressure is applied and uh, that can also lead to uh, post operative neurological uh, worsening and also if you have an adhesion it can lead to a dural tear uh, so regarding the discussion on foramenotomies uh, in these patients uh, so there's a very uh, there's a very simple test which i think dr daniel ru had recommended that he asks his patient to extend his neck for 5 minutes and if the patient has uh, radicular uh, radiculitis in his uh, upper limbs then he does foramenotomies in these cases um, however it's uh, still con uh, like it's still debatable some people 
do as sir said does uh, some people do prophylactically some people don't uh, uh, so the jury is still out on that uh, topic uh, the point to remember where do you use your burr is it's at the spinal laminar junction the same place where you're going to create your troughs as uh, dr murli sir said in the in his previous talk it's at the spinal laminar junction where your burr is going to make its uh, cut so what are the problems associated with cervical laminectomy post laminectomy kyphosis uh it was is supposedly uh, the major reason why uh, posterior uh, procedures have fallen into disrepute and uh, that to posterior alone laminectomies have fallen into disrepute but however what is uh, important is that is it clinically significant it's still a matter of debate uh, c5 uh, the c5 root palsy has been a, a, a complication uh, which is associated with these procedures due to the dorsal float back of the cord and this is as sir said a phylogenetically a short route with a relatively straight course and uh, i have uh, seen two cases myself but over a period of time they have recovered but yes it does cause a problem to the patient who's not having a c5 palsy pre op because explaining him uh, the problems uh, which have uh, you may have done a fantastic surgery but if he has got a c5 palsy he is still going to you know hold you accountable for it dural injuries are the dural injuries hematoma and infection are the other common uh, problems um so the question should you fuse or laminectomy alone is enough uh, this table uh, kind of gives you a rough idea of what to do this is from jeffrey wang's paper um it's so he uh, the variables he considers is cervical lordosis instability axial neck pain age comorbidities and post operative radiation so if cervical lordosis 10 degrees of cervical lordosis is there you can go for a cervical laminectomy alone preserving c2 and c7 a less than 10 degrees of cervical lordosis or a straight spine where you still have to go in posteriorly it is preferred that you instrument these cases instability demonstrable on x rays yes you should fuse them axial neck pain uh, is an indication for uh, doing a fusion so elderly age group uh, more than 70 years you want a quick procedure for them because they have multiple comorbidities so you want something which is done quickly and uh, if you if in cases of tumors where you are planning to give a post operative radiation it is advisable to fuse uh, post uh, recommendations are for cervical laminectomy with lateral mass fusion so with insertion of lateral mass you are going to increase the rates of uh, fusion to almost 95% so uh, the debate is whether you put the screws first or you do your laminectomy first uh, my choice if you ask me would be uh, i drill my tracks for the lateral mass first do my laminectomy and pass the screws once the laminectomy is done uh, i would like to know what the uh, rest of the faculty uh, prefers and uh, for this patient which i showed you we did a c3 to c6 laminectomy uh, undercutting of this uh, a c2 dome uh, osteotomy and the c7 undercutting as well with lateral mass screws however as you can see one of our screws is uh, uh, intraoperatively we had difficulty in passing and had fractured the lateral mass screw so this patient did have post operative uh, radiculitis which resolved over a period of 6 uh, to 7 weeks uh, his gait improved post uh, post operatively over a period of 6 weeks but yes the radiculitis was uh, troublesome uh, so thank you so much thank you mong uh, for a good talk uh, this is a cervical laminectomy is a day to day uh, procedure uh, which uh, is for a spine surgeon but nowadays uh, with a uh, extent of instrumentation the cervical laminectomy indications are becoming narrower especially in a elderly spine so we have panel doc, uh, dr murli uh, do you uh, how how frequently do you have to do a just a cervical laminectomy stand alone uh, cervical laminectomy See, cervical laminectomy uh, i do uh, stand alone uh, for uh, uh, spondylotic myelopathy multi level degen spondylotic myelopathies and uh, some of the extensive uh, degenerative myelopathies all those things if the lordosis is preserved or just as it is then i do laminectomy but i do so you don't have to be worried about instrument you can do a non instrumented fusion is always your uh, thing how many how many post laminectomy kyphosis we have seen 
So you, you think of your one year OP, how many you have seen? In five years OP, two years OP, how many you, you, you have seen? So it is not that, whether it's not only yours or somebody else also don't come to us. So post-traumatic, post-laminative kyphosis is not like that what we see. Yes, if you're seeing in a young patients doing traumatic uh, laminectomies you're doing or uh, you're doing a cervical uh, tumor, I want to decompress, you're extensively, you're taking, that is the case you need. The degenerative traumatic uh, post-laminative kyphosis we hardly see. So I, I normally so. do a decompression and I just burr the facets. I just burr the facets, that's all. That will fuse. And whatever bone you have taken, if you want, you can put it on the postural lateral and put a gel foam to protect the dural structure. That all will do. That's all. Uh, Non-instrumented fusion is our, uh, you know, it's handy all the time. So that is, and I do supplement only uh, if it is OPLL. So OPLL, OPLL, you need supplemental fixation because the concept now is weight of stability uh, allows to the OPLL to regress. So right. ongoing <laughs> ongoing motion will allow it to progress. So for OPLL, I have stopped laminoplasties and all other things. I only do laminectomy and in, and a supplemental fixation. C3, C5, C7, that's all. No, no I, need to put it everywhere. I think message is very clear. In a young patients, you tend to avoid cervical laminectomy. Post-laminectomy carpus is a long-standing phenomenon. These young patients, or usually the time period described is 10 to 15 years. So you don't want to do a cervical laminectomy in a basic course for a, that uh, you are landing in a post-laminectomy carpus after 10, 15 years. Usually elderly spondylitic spine are stable. So uh, you can just do a uh, laminectomy and do a fusion uninstrumented. So it's very important. Uh, Dr. Umang, uh, coming back to your uh, X-ray uh, again, as Dr. Murli and we do, we don't do a lateral mass screw at all levels. So we usually all levels. Yes. Uh, what is the advantage that you get a better fusion surface area? Yeah. Ha, ha, uh, so, uh, sir, I wanted to ask uh, you regarding the same that um, I think you were. Uh, I mean, this I didn't. Uh, we used to. Uh, I came about to know about this after I uh, started working with you that instrumenting uh, at alternate levels gives you a better surface area and I think I agree with that. Uh, however, I also want to put the point forward to you is that uh, even if you instrument all levels, you have your posterolateral uh, surfaces. So do you, in your experience, have you had, like were you instrumenting earlier on all levels and then move to instrumenting alternate levels or so like what has your practice been like? got your point so initial part we think that we should be able to pass the screw at the all level but as we said the loading it's a biomechanical concept the cervical spine inherently has a very high tendency of fusion second thing unless you are removed very extensively the cervical lateral mass uh, people can get a without even an uninstrumented fusion and if you prepare your passage joints properly it does uh, get into a good fusion area so uh, by reducing the uh, uh, number of screws, not only you get a better fusion surface, but the operative time, the risk of injury, the blood loss, everything comes into the uh, play. So that is the something which you need to get. What is Dr. Sudhir? Uh, is Dr. Sudhir there? Dr. Nandan? Yes, how Dr. Your, Tushar. Yeah. How, 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 how do you go about the lateral mass screw with respect to cervical laminectomy? Your preference is uninstrumented fusion or instrumented with a limited screw? Uh, how do you go about it? So elderly patients with cervical myelopathy, multilevel stenosis, above 60, 65 years, I do only cervical laminectomy. And patients with anterior bridging osteophytes, only cervical laminectomy. OPLL, young patients, uh, laminectomy with instrumentation. However, for, for the past 5-6 years, I have stopped using lateral mass screw. I have been using only cervical pedicle screws. Uh, so... Uh, cervical pedicle screws, I tend to use two in the top and two in the bottom and I stagger one on one side, like four one side, five one side. The advantage of uh, which I felt of uh, C5 pedicle screw versus lateral mass is uh, the stability, of course, we all know. And the amount of decompression that you can do with the pedicle screw is slightly relatively more. Having said that, with lateral mass screw, again, uh, if you are going to put lateral mass screw at multiple levels, then uh, the amount of decompression that you're going to do and the fusion area will be definitely less. So you can put two at the top and two at the bottom and you can stagger in between. That's my thought process. Instead of putting, because it doesn't make much difference. Putting eight screws uh, doesn't make uh, much difference compared to five or six screws. 
two at the top means dr sudhir you tend to go on a c2 pedicle screw or you tend to go c3 how because once no, you... no no if the if the c2 c3 is normal i never touch c2 spinous process at all even while exposing because that is one of the key things that you have to understand that is the main stabilizer of the neck so always try to stop at c3 so it is from c3 to c6 or c3 to c7 and i do undercutting of the c2 lamina and c7 lamina so c2 and c7 spinous process most of the times i tend to preserve and not to even dissect Even so that is how you try to preserve it pardon even if you are planning to do a laminectomy in future do you give a importance to the no CD? no if you if, if i am planning for a laminectomy in future i just remove and then i instrument it right right dr nandan sir i uh, sort of echo what uh, dr sudhir and dr murli said that uh, when there are bridging anterior osteophytes elderly cases those are the good candidates for a laminectomy only procedure for opll because of the concept again put in lateral mass screws usually i put lateral mass screws in c3 4 5 and we tend to skip the 6 and go to the 7 pedicle so that helps in lining up the rod so your c5 lateral mass to the c7 pedicle uh, we also uh, stagger the screws Uh, C3, uh, both the lateral mass screws, and then uh, in the levels in between, we skip a few levels, and uh, again, careful preparation of the facets, either with a burr or with a curette, putting in bone graft there for your non-instrumented fusion. Thank you. So now coming to the lateral mass, I would like to uh, invite the next speaker, Dr. Bushan Adoli, uh -huh. uh, assistant professor, uh, for his uh, talk on a cervical. Tushar, Tushar, Tusha, can I just add one point while the presentation is loading up? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, Dr. Umang was asking uh, to uh, that you know about uh, you will do the drill hole and then do the uh, laminectomy decompression, then use the screws. So he was asking about uh, how we would do. Is correct, Dr. Umang? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Tushar, sir. Uh, laminectomy first, screws first. Yeah. yeah. Let, yeah, tell. yeah. See, initially I used to do the same. I used to drill, uh, and then wax it, and then do the decompression, and then put the screws under. But but over the years I've seen because whenever I'm with my I'm do, uh, helping my neurosurgeon, I I just do the screws, rod, everything. I'll come out. Then he will he will do his decompression with for, and then. And then you're still happy. You would get the same amount of decompression. Then I started doing the same, so it saves a lot of time. And also with the cord exposed, even a slightest, slightest nanometer error is not a uh, you know going to fuck you. So we can do. We all obsess that we may not be able to get it, but we can do a very good 14 to 60 millimeter wide uh, decompression with the uh, once the uh, lateral mass screws and the rod has been placed. Okay, point well taken. Uh, techniques of lateral mass screw by Dr. Bhushan Adole, who is a senior assistant professor at KM Hospital. Uh, yes, Dr. Bhushan, can you please? Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. I also thank the entire uh, organizing uh, team of Hasifan for giving us this opportunity. So I'll be speaking on technique of the lateral mass screw fixation. In the pre previous presentations, we have very well discussed about the non uh, non fusion techniques, uh, that the motion preserving technique. And uh, approaching to the last presentation today, we'll be dealing on the fusion technique. So starting my presentation with the historic importance, this technique was uh, first uh, lateral mass was introduced by Roy Camel. in the 1980s before that there there used to be just a uh, non instrumented fusion which had a higher failure rates so starting with the surgical anatomy of lateral mass it consists uh, it runs uh, it includes the uh, inferior margin of the upper and the lower facet so it starts from the lower margin of the superior facet and includes the lower margin of the inferior facet the medial aspect is at the spinal lamellar level and the lateral aspect is at the lateral uh, part of the uh, facet so uh in uh, when uh, talking about instrumentation of the cervical spine it is very well to uh, important to know the uh, course of the vertebral artery so the vertebral artery enters the uh, transverse foramen at the level of c6 in most cases but it might uh, very well enter at the level of c7 or c5 in some abnormal cases it is important to note that uh, at the level of c1 uh, it runs above the arch in the normal case but at times it might Uh, be very well in front of the lateral mass where it might become difficult to instru uh, do instrumentation in these cases where we may, might have to skip the uh, level 
so we have very well talked about the surgical uh, indications of lateral uh, posterior instrumentation in the previous presentations of dr omang dr muridhar sir dr sudhir sir so i will just go uh, in short about the surgical instrumentation very well, uh, like uh, in case of trauma unstable fracture where we have to do a posterior band reconstruction for posterior tension band reconstruction in case of tumor osteomyelitis or in that case rheumatoid arthritis uh, degenerative conditions myelopathy uh, and with uh, axial neck pain and uh, in case of uh, atlanta axial uh, instability in pediatric spine with congenital malformation so we uh, uh, there are many techniques described in the literature for uh, lateral mass fixation like the roy campbell technique the nazarian and louis technique magrel technique anderson and atal and rieu technique we'll be discussing three major techniques the roy campbell the magrel and the rieu technique so the uh, in short i'll just discuss about the basic four or five steps we have to follow while uh, putting a lateral mass screw we'll first delineate the lateral mass as i described earlier we'll start uh, we'll delineate the superior margin at the inferior part of the superior facet the inferior margin at the inferior part of the inferior facet the medial border and the lateral border will divide the lateral mass into four quadrant so the uh, neural uh, structure the nerve is uh, anterior uh, the nerve and uh, nerve is uh, lateral and uh, the artery is anterior to the lateral mass so we'll try to put uh, take a entry in the inferior medial quadrant so that when we direct our lateral mass in the superior lateral quadrant we will not uh, anyway injure the neurovascular structure so the other point after we have delineated the lateral mass and fixed our entry point is to make opening of the cortex so it can very well be done with the owl but nowadays with the uh, with the uh, high high speed burbing at our advent it is uh, a very useful tool where we can use a small uh, matchstick burr uh, to make entry into the uh, lateral mass then deciding on the medial lateral angulation we can uh, it is uh, described in literature as 25 degree but uh, eyeballing is difficult for 25 degree so another technique that we can do is we can touch the inferior spinous process uh, you know, that will give us a enough lateral angulation sometimes the spinous process might uh, hinder in our uh, angulation so at that uh, point we might have to remove the uh, spinous process then uh, deciding on the craniocaudal angulation a uh, very a uh, simple technique of deciding for the craniocaudal angulation is we open up the uh, facet joint that is to be included in the fusion with a small uh, periosteum elevator and then we we can see under vision we can see the uh, angulation of the uh, that is the direction of the facet joint and then decide for the craniocaudal angulation we can very well uh, curate the cartilage at this point and uh, put in bone graft for fusion because later when we put in the lateral mass the tulip hinders our view and also decreases our surface for Uh, fusion so now coming to the first technique that is the roy camel technique so here we have uh, uh, divided the uh, lateral mass into four quadrants and the entry point is just at the midpoint of the lateral mass here we angulate for 10 degrees laterally and uh, in the craniocaudal angulation we go directly perpendicular to the surface of the lateral mass another technique is the magrel technique where we uh, again divide it into four quadrants and we go 1 mm medial and cranial to the midpoint of the lateral mass as we go medial and cranial we have to increase our lateral angulation in the sagittal plane so we will get a 20 to 30 degree of sagittal lateral angulation and here we go parallel to the adjacent facet uh, facet joints the last technique that we'll be discussing is the rib technique where we uh, go in the 1 meter millimeter uh, caudal and Uh, lat, uh, medial to the uh, center of the lateral mass again we'll be direct uh, and here what we are doing is we'll be directing towards the uh, upper and outer corner of the lateral mass so that we get the superolateral trajectory of our lateral mass screw even in the craniocaudal and lateral angulation so what are the advantages of this uh, techniques uh, disadvantages of this techniques that have been uh, that i have discussed so in the roy can be technique where the uh, lateral mass entry point is at the center Uh, and we give just a 10 degree of lateral angulation and go perpendicular to the uh, uh, lateral mass so here uh, there is a lesser uh, the uh, risk is that uh, the uh, as compared to the magrel technique there is a less risk of uh, uh, the uh, nerve uh, irritation but then we uh, we get a high facet joint violation as uh, as we uh, tend to go perpendicular to the um, permeable with the joints uh, uh, the uh, lateral mass surface in the magrel technique uh, we go 20 to 30 degree lateral and parallel to the facet joint so we get a longer screw but that but uh, with this longer screw there is always a risk uh, risk of uh, nerve uh, violation and uh, 
as they have mentioned about 20 to 30 degree of lateral angulation it is very difficult interoperatively to eyeball for 25 to 30 degrees so that's the disadvantage with the uh, lateral angulation and as we uh, as here we go parallel to the uh, joint uh, facet uh, facet line so we are very, there is a very less risk of facet joint violation as compared to the Roy Camille technique. Also, we can get a longer lens too with better stability. Then the rib technique, uh, here we just go at the uh, superolateral corner. So uh, the eyeballing uh, is be uh, better. But in the lower level, the C7 and C6 spinous process might get away in the uh, lateral angulation, which can very well be dealt by removing the spinous process. And it is easy to follow direction without having the guess at the angles. Uh, so there are some peculiarities about the C7 lateral mass extension, though the uh, C7 has a big body and a big spinous process, but it's a transitional vertebra with a facet morphology similar to the thoracic spine. So in the, and it has a very thin lateral mass. So here we can use a modified Roy Campbell technique where we use a higher entry point so that we don't end up putting the uh, screw in the P1 facet uh, joint. Lastly, I would like to discuss about the C1 lateral mass. This was... Uh, first described by our very own Dr. Goel sir and Dr. Larry sir. Uh, we have to keep in mind about the V3 segment trajectory of the vertebral RT, which just forces behind the lateral mass. And there is always an accompanying uh, dense venous plexus uh, at the entry point, which we have to uh, meticulously dissect so as to avoid uh, uh, bleeding, uh, which is a, a, a very uh, uh, com commonly encountered complications while putting a C1 lateral mass. And the uh, entry point is just uh, at the midpoint of the lateral mass is the 15 degree medial ang angulation. I would like to end my uh, presentation with this. Thank you. Thank you, Mushan, uh, for your lateral mass talk. Uh, so uh, uh, it's basically the uh, another armamentarium in the surgeon's hand. Uh, Dr. Murli, uh, what is the screw diameter that you choose for this lateral mass? Uh, C1, uh, the uh, cervical, uh, there are always two screw diameter which are there in the set. One is rescue. See, that, that, that depends on the system you use. You need to know because they always have a 3.5 mm or 4 mm. Or they have a 3 mm and 3.5 mm. So you need to know which system your uh, what size you want they have. Larger screw first, or yeah. you go with the smaller screw and then you. I I, I will always uh, the principle is same. Always go small. You can make it bigger. If you go bigger, you cannot make it smaller. So go for a small 3.5 or a 3 mm. If that fails and you need a bailout, you you will be using the 4 mm. Or a 3.5, depending on the system you use. That's what. And I use I use mostly 14 or 16 length. Right. That's a, a standard of it. No need to measure or anything. But with regards to all these uh, techniques, see, three things important. Starting point. Start for a starting point. The the technique says three millimeter, two millimeter up lip lip. But he is clearly shown four quadrants. I prefer four quadrants. I start inframedial quadrant inframedial quadrant. So that is my starting point. Then for uh, medial lateral angulation, so inframedial to suprolateral. So I target suprolateral angulation. So inframedial to suprolateral direction. That will give you the lateral direction. For craniocaudal, as he said, you just have to angle down to the spinous process below. If I'm putting C4 screw, C, I will lean on the C5 spinous process. That will give you the adequate angulation, craniocardial angulation you need. So these are the three things important. As we come down, it is going to be trickier because uh, the spinous process muscles will be itching. So you may have to nibble some of the uh, interspinous and spinous process to lean down. But make your incision a little longer so that for C5, C6, C7, you can angle it enough. Otherwise, uh, you will uh, struggle. Dr. Bhushan, what about the C6 and C7 lateral mass? Uh, I think you want to say that the both C6 and C7 lateral mass together makes it difficult and too much crowding to pass. Is that right, Dr. Bhushan? Yes, sir, that is yes, yes, sir, that is what I wanted to point out. That putting two uh, uh, consecutive levels of lateral mass and that with the dorsal uh, kyphosis, it makes it difficult to put these two. So we can either uh, go for a C7 and skip C6 and go to the uh, C5 lat lateral mass when you are planning. Uh, for a uh, long le long level fixation. Right. Dr. Nandan, I, what is your technique when you are going under the extent and down? Do you prefer uh, directly? Because C7 lateral mass is very smaller. So uh, do you do just C6 lateral mass and extend and do a C7 laminectomy? How do you go about it? Dome laminectomy or C7 lateral mass? 
and uh, go for a pedicle screw at C7. That's what we are usually doing. Sometimes I have used a Roy Camel technique, which uh, Bhushan showed, where we go slightly vertical with a short screw. Uh, one more thing I want to add is when. Uh, Dr. Nandan, you are not audible. Dr. Sudhir, uh, you showed us the uh, the pedicle screw. Uh, so, is it always the that uh, what is the choice? C six, C seven. Where do you stop? And how do you decide about it? Nandan, you are you are back till the Sudhir answers. Can you? Yeah. Uh, one more modification I want to say. Uh, when we are putting in these screws. I have the posterior midline intact. So we tend to uh, take a towel clip and gently pull on the spinous process for a little bit of counter traction. These lateral masses are very uh, fragile structures. So we give a little, uh, a slight traction for the assistant while we put the screws in. Uh, one more thing which uh, Dr. Srivastava and even you have told me during residency is these movements should not happen at the elbow. You should be doing like finger tapping, gentle finger tapping with a 2 mm tap and uh, then go for a 3.5 screw with the bigger screw being your bailout option. Okay, I think uh, we already exceeded the time significantly. So I thank all the speakers and all the delegates for patiently uh, listening and, uh, till the, uh, and staying till the end. Thanks, Dr. Nandan. Thanks, Dr. Umang, Bhushan, and Murlita, Dr. Sudhir. So I would like to conclude this session. These talks are all recorded uh, by the SSI team as well as Dr. Bhushan. And he is going to share and these talks will be there for the delegates to come and uh, revisit again. So at the day when we are going to a uh, cadaveric uh, hands-on workshop, uh, you should have already be thorough with this technique. So it will become an easier for us to save the time and you'll understand the technical nuances better. So we will be focusing more on the hands-on things in a cadaver workshop and not the didactic lecture, so which we have covered today. Thank you again uh, for the uh, efforts taken by Dr. Bhushan and Dr. Shiva here. Uh, is Dr. Shiva there online, Bhushan? Uh, yes, sir. I'm here online. Yes, sir. Shiva is there, sir. Describe the outline. How is it going to be there on a cadaver day? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll share my screen right now. So, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes, Shiva. It is visible. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to th thank uh, Dr. Tushar sir for giving me this opportunity to go over the outline of the basic spine surgery cadaveric workshop. So we'll this will be a post-conference uh, workshop uh, on 21st January 2024. We'll be conducting uh, we'll be conducting this session at uh, the state of the art cadaveric lab. That is the anatomy dissection hall at CHGS Medical College and. Uh, KM Hospital. So this is basically divided into two sessions. One is a morning session and another one will be the noon session. So and again we have the posterior procedures that we, we would be starting earlier and then as we move into the noon, noon session we'll be doing the uh, anterior procedures. Similarly we'll be starting with the more easier lumbar procedures and then move on to the cervical procedures. So there are about 20 delegates and uh, 10 cadavers in our session. So that's a lot of vertebrae and that will be a lot of hands up. And the faculties will initially be demonstrating the procedures and then delegates will get a good hands on opportunity to perform. And there's ample amount of time after each lecture or session after the faculties have taught them, you can get uh, go to your cadavers and um, start practicing. The faculties will be around, you can ask them doubts. So again, uh, some. Uh, it, in the morning session, uh, we'll start with the breakfast earlier. So I request all the delegates to come in early, have good breakfast. It will be just uh, provided just uh, beside the venue. And uh, from 8.50 to 9 a.m., for over 10 minutes, we'll have a brief presentation about the hands-on workshop that we'll be conducting on that day again. And from 9 to 9.30, there'll be demonstration of uh, microdiscectomy, pedicle screw insertion, and uh, till lift procedures. From 10.30 to 11 a.m. for one and a half hours, the delegates will get the opportunity to perform all these procedures that have been taught to them by the faculties. And then at 11.30, we break for tea. And then again, at 12, we'll all gather for the noon session. So from 12 to 12.30, then there'll be demonstration of the thoracic pedicle screw insertion and transpedicular decompression. 
and from 12:30 to 12:45 we'll have demonstration of lateral mass insertion and from 12:45 to 2 pm so for 1 hour 15 minutes the delegates will again get the opportunity to perform the hands on training on the kettlebells that they are allotted so at 2 we again break for lunch we'll have lunch for half an hour after 2:30 we'll again assemble back from 2:30 to 3 pm we'll have demonstration of the anterior procedures that is the anterior discectomy and corpectomy and then we have another hour for the delegates to be to get their hands on on the cadavers from 3 o'clock to 4 p.m. And at 4, we wind up the basic spine cadaveric workshop. And that's okay. it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Shri Prasad, for delineating. So this is the plan which we are going to stick. Uh, so uh, with this note, I thank and I conclude the today's uh, uh, first half of the basic cadaver workshop. And I hope you will enjoy it as we go on a cadaver day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.